Preface of the Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638 to 1870. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638 to 1870 by W.E.B. Du Bois. Preface. This monograph was begun during my residence as Rogers Memorial Fellow at Harvard University, and is based mainly upon a study of the sources, i.e. national, state, and colonial statutes, congressional documents, reports of societies, personal narratives, etc. The collection of laws available for this research was, I think, nearly complete. On the other hand, facts and statistics bearing on the economic side of the study have been difficult to find, and my conclusions are consequently liable to modification from this source. The question of the suppression of the slave trade is so intimately connected with the questions as to its rise, the system of American slavery, and the whole colonial policy of the 18th century that it is difficult to isolate it and at the same time to avoid superficiality on the one hand and unscientific narrowness of view on the other. While I could not hope entirely to overcome such difficulty, I nevertheless trust that I have succeeded in rendering this monograph a small contribution to the scientific study of slavery and the American Negro. I desire to express my obligation to Dr. Albert Bushnell Hart of Harvard University, at whose suggestion I began this work and by whose kind aid and encouragement I have brought it to a close. Also, I have to thank the trustees of the John F. Slater Fund, whose appointment made it possible to test the conclusions of the study by the general principles laid down in German universities. W. E. Burkhard Du Bois, Wilberforce University, March 1896. End of preface. Chapter 1 of the suppression of the African slave trade to the United States of America, 1638 to 1870. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The suppression of the African slave trade to the United States of America, 1638 to 1870 by W. E. B. Du Bois. Chapter 1. Introductory. Plan of the Monograph. This monograph proposes to set forth the efforts made in the United States of America from early colonial times until the present to limit and suppress the trade in slaves between Africa and these shores. The study begins with the colonial period, setting forth in brief the attitude of England and, more in detail, the attitude of the planting, farming, and trading groups of colonies toward the slave trade. It deals next with the first concerted effort against the trade and with the further action of the individual states. The important work of the Constitutional Convention follows, together with the history of the trade in that critical period which preceded the Act of 1807. The attempt to suppress the trade from 1807 to 1830 is next recounted. A chapter then deals with the slave trade as an international problem. Finally, the development of the crises up to the Civil War is studied, together with the steps leading to the final suppression, and a concluding chapter seeks to sum up the results of the investigation. Throughout the monograph, the institution of slavery and the interstate slave trade are considered only incidentally. The Rise of the English Slave Trade Any attempt to consider the attitude of the English colonies toward the African slave trade must be prefaced by a word as to the attitude of England herself and the development of the trade in her hands. Sir John Hawkins' celebrated voyage took place in 1562, but probably not until 1631 did a regular chartered company undertake to carry on the trade. This company was unsuccessful and was eventually succeeded by the Company of Royal Adventurers Trading to Africa, chartered by Charles II in 1662 
and including the Queen Dowager and the Duke of York. The company contracted to supply the West Indies with 3,000 slaves annually, but contraband trade, misconduct, and war so reduced it that in 1672 it surrendered its charter to another company for 34,000 pounds. This new corporation, chartered by Charles II as the Royal African Company, proved more successful than its predecessors and carried on a growing trade for a quarter of a century. In 1698, parliamentary interference with the trade began. By the Statute 9 and 10, William and Mary, Chapter 26, private traders, on payment of a duty of 10% on English goods exported to Africa, were allowed to participate in the trade. This was brought about by the clamor of the merchants, especially the American merchants who, in their petition suggest, that it would be a great benefit to the kingdom to secure the trade by maintaining forts and castles there, with an equal duty upon all goods exported. This plan, being a compromise between maintaining the monopoly intact and entirely abolishing it, was adopted, and the statute declared the trade highly beneficial and advantageous to this kingdom and to the plantations and colonies thereunto belonging. Having thus gained practically free admittance to the field, English merchants sought to exclude other nations by securing a monopoly of the lucrative Spanish colonial slave trade. Their object was finally accomplished by the signing of the Asiento in 1713. The Asiento was a treaty between England and Spain by which the latter granted the former a monopoly of the Spanish colonial slave trade for 30 years, and England engaged to supply the colonies, within that time, with at least 144,000 slaves, at the rate of 4,800 per year. England was also to advance Spain 200,000 crowns, and to pay a duty of 33.5 crowns for each slave imported. The kings of Spain and England were each to receive one-fourth of the profits of the trade, and the Royal African Company were authorized to import as many slaves as they wished above the specified number in the first 25 years, and to sell them except in three ports at any price they could get. It is stated that, in the 20 years from 1713 to 1733, 15,000 slaves were annually imported into America by the English, of whom from one-third to one-half went to the Spanish colonies. To the company itself, the venture proved a financial failure, for during the years 1729 to 1750, Parliament assisted the royal company by annual grants which amounted to 90,000 pounds, and by 1739, Spain was a creditor to the extent of £68,000 and threatened to suspend the treaty. The war interrupted the carrying out of the contract, but the peace of Aix-la-Chapelle extended the limit by four years. Finally, October 5, 1750, this privilege was waived for a money consideration paid to England, the asiento was ended, and the royal company was bankrupt. By the Statute 23, George II, Chapter 31, the old company was dissolved and a new company of merchants trading to Africa erected in its stead. Any merchant so desiring was allowed to engage in the trade on payment of certain small duties, and such merchants formed a company headed by nine directors. This marked the total abolition of monopoly in the slave trade and was the form under which the trade was carried on until the American Revolution. That the slave trade was the very life of the colonies had, by 1700, become an almost unquestioned axiom in British practical economics. The colonists themselves declared slaves the strength and sinews of this Western world, and the lack of them the grand obstruction here as the settlements cannot subsist without supplies of them. Thus, with merchants clamoring at home and planters abroad, it easily became the settled policy of England to encourage the slave trade. Then, too, she readily argued 
that what was an economic necessity in Jamaica and the Barbados could scarcely be disadvantageous to Carolina, Virginia, or even New York. Consequently, the colonial governors were generally instructed to give all due encouragement and invitation to merchants and others, and in particular to the Royal African Company of England. Duties laid on the importer and all acts in any way restricting the trade were frowned upon and very often disallowed, whereas, ran Governor Dobbs instructions, acts have been passed in some of our plantations in America for laying duties on the importation and exportation of Negroes to the great discouragement of the merchants trading thither from the coast of Africa. It is our will and pleasure that you do not give your assent to or pass any law imposing duties upon Negroes imported into our province of North Carolina. The exact proportions of the slave trade to America can be but approximately determined. From 1680 to 1688, the African Company sent 249 ships to Africa, shipped there 6,783 Negro slaves, and after losing 14,387 on the Middle Passage, delivered 46,396 in America. The trade increased early in the 18th century, 104 ships clearing for Africa in 1701, it then dwindled until the signing of the Asiento, standing at 74 clearances in 1724. The final dissolution of the monopoly in 1750 led, excepting in the years 1754 to 57, when the closing of the Spanish marts sensibly affected the trade to an extraordinary development, 192 clearances being made in 1771. The Revolutionary War nearly stopped the traffic, but by 1786, the clearances had risen again to 146. To these figures must be added the unregistered trade of Americans and foreigners. It is probable that about 25,000 slaves were brought to America each year between 1698 and 1707. The importation then dwindled, but rose after the asiento to perhaps 30,000. The proportion to of these slaves carried to the continent now began to increase. Of about 20,000 whom the English annually imported from 1733 to 1766, South Carolina alone received some 3,000. Before the revolution, the total exportation to America is variously estimated as between 40,000 and 100,000 each year. Bancroft places the total slave population of the continental colonies at 59,000 in 1714, 78,000 in 1727, and 293,000 in 1754. The census of 1790 showed 697,897 slaves in the United States. In colonies like those in the West Indies and in South Carolina and Georgia, the rapid importation into America of a multitude of savages gave rise to a system of slavery far different from that which the late Civil War abolished. The strikingly harsh and even inhumane slave codes in these colonies show this. Crucifixion, burning, and starvation were legal modes of punishment. The rough and brutal character of the time and place was partly responsible for this, but a more decisive reason lay in the fierce and turbulent character of the imported Negroes. The docility to which long years of bondage and strict discipline gave rise was absent, and insurrections and acts of violence were of frequent occurrence. Again and again, the danger of planters being cut off by their own Negroes is mentioned both in the islands and on the continent. This condition of vague dread and unrest not only increased the severity of laws and strengthened the police system, but was the prime motive back of all the earlier efforts to check the further importation of slaves. On the other hand, in New England and New York, the Negroes were merely house servants or farmhands and were treated neither better 
nor worse than servants in general in those days. Between these two extremes, the system of slavery varied from a mild serfdom in Pennsylvania and New Jersey to an aristocratic caste system in Maryland and Virginia. End of chapter 1「Chapter 2 of the Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638 to 1870, by W. E. B. Du Bois. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Plantain Colonies Character of these colonies The Plantain Colonies are those southern settlements whose climate and character destined them to be the chief theater of North American slavery. The early attitude of these communities toward the slave trade is therefore of peculiar interest, for their action was of necessity largely decisive for the future of the trade and for the institution in North America. Theirs was the only soil, climate, and society suited to slavery. In the other colonies, with few exceptions, the institution was, by these same factors, doomed from the beginning. Hence, only strong moral and political motives could in the planting colonies overthrow or check a traffic so favored by the mother country. Restrictions in Georgia In Georgia, we have an example of a community whose philanthropic founders sought to impose upon it a code of morals higher than the colonists wished. The settlers of Georgia were of even worse moral fiber than their slave-trading and whiskey-using neighbors in Carolina and Virginia. Yet Oglethorpe and the London proprietors prohibited from the beginning both the rum and the slave traffic, refusing to suffer slavery, which is against the gospel as well as the fundamental law of England, to be authorized under our authority. The trustees sought to win the colonists over to their belief by telling them that money could be better expended in transporting white men than Negroes, that slaves would be a source of weakness to the colony, and that the produces designed to be raised in the colony would not require such labor as to make Negroes necessary for carrying them on. This policy greatly displeased the colonists, who, from 1735, the date of the first law, to 1749, did not cease to clamor for the repeal of the restrictions. As their English agent said, they insisted that, in spite of all endeavors to disguise this point, it is as clear as light itself that Negroes are as essentially necessary to the cultivation of Georgia as axes, hoes, or any other utensil of agriculture. Meantime, evasions and infractions of the laws became frequent and notorious. Negroes were brought across from Carolina and hired for life. Finally, purchases were openly made in Savannah from African traders. Some seizures were made by those who opposed the principle, but as a majority of the magistrates were favorable to the introduction of slaves into the province, legal decisions were suspended from time to time, and a strong disposition evidenced by the courts to evade the operation of the law. At last, in 1749, the colonists prevailed on the trustees and the government, and the trade was thrown open under careful restrictions which limited importation, required a registry, and quarantine on all slaves brought in and laid a duty. It is probable, however, that these restrictions were never enforced, and that the trade thus established continued unchecked until the Revolution. Restrictions in South Carolina South Carolina had the largest and most widely developed slave trade of any of the continental colonies. This was owing to the character of her settlers, her nearness to the West Indian slave marts, and the early development of certain staple crops, such as rice, which were adapted to slave labor. Moreover, this colony suffered much less interference from the home government than many other colonies. Thus, it is possible here to trace the untrammeled development of slave trade restrictions 
in a typical planting community. As early as 1698, the slave trade to South Carolina had reached such proportions that it was thought that the great number of Negroes, which of late have been imported into this colony, may endanger the safety thereof. The immigration of white servants was therefore encouraged by a special law. Increase of immigration reduced this disproportion, but Negroes continued to be imported in such numbers as to afford considerable revenue from a moderate duty on them. About the time when the asiento was signed, the slave trade so increased that, scarcely a year after the consummation of that momentous agreement, two heavy-duty acts were passed. Because the number of Negroes do extremely increase in this province, and through the afflicting providence of God, the white persons do not proportionally multiply, by reason whereof the safety of the said province is greatly endangered. The trade, however, by reason of the encouragement abroad and of increased business activity in exporting naval stores at home, suffered scarcely any check, although repeated acts, reciting the danger incident to a great importation of Negroes, were passed laying high duties. Finally, in 1717, an additional duty of 40 pounds, although in depreciated currency, succeeded so nearly in stopping the trade that, two years later, all existing duties were repealed and one of 10 pounds substituted. This continued during the time of resistance to the proprietary government, but by 1734, the importation had reached large proportions. We must therefore beg leave, the colonists write in that year, to inform your majesty that amidst our other perilous circumstances, we are subject to many intestine dangers from the great number of Negroes that are now among us, who amount at least to 22,000 persons and are three to one of all of your majesty's white subjects in this province. Insurrections against us have been often attempted. In 1740, an insurrection under a slave, Cato, at Stono, caused such widespread alarm that a prohibitory duty of a hundred pounds was immediately laid. Importation was again checked, but in 1751, the colony sought to devise a plan whereby the slightly restricted immigration of Negroes should provide a fund to encourage the importation of white servants, to prevent the mischiefs that may be attended by the great importation of Negroes into this province. Many white servants were thus encouraged to settle in the colony, but so much larger was the influx of black slaves that the colony in 1760, totally prohibited the slave trade. This act was promptly disallowed by the Privy Council and the governor reprimanded. But the colony declared that an importation of Negroes, equal in number to what have been imported of late years, may prove of the most dangerous consequence in many respects to this province. And the best way to obviate such danger will be by imposing such an additional duty upon them as may totally prevent the evils. A prohibitive duty of a hundred pounds was accordingly imposed in 1764. This duty probably continued until the revolution. The war made a great change in the situation. It has been computed by good judges that, between the years 1775 and 1783, the state of South Carolina lost 25,000 Negroes by actual hostilities, plunder of the British, runaways, etc. After the war, the trade quickly revived, and considerable revenue was raised from duty acts until 1787, when by act and ordinance the slave trade was totally prohibited. This prohibition, by renewals from time to time, lasted until 1803. Restrictions in North Carolina In early times, there were few slaves in North Carolina. This fact, together with the troubled and turbulent state of affairs 
during the early colonial period did not necessitate the adoption of any settled policy towards slavery or the slave trade. Later, the slave trade to the colony increased, but there is no evidence of any effort to restrict or in any way regulate it before 1786, when it was declared that the importation of slaves into the state is productive of evil consequences and highly impolitic, and a prohibitive duty was laid on them. Restrictions in Virginia Next to South Carolina, Virginia had probably the largest slave trade. Her situation, however, differed considerably from that of her southern neighbor. The climate, the staple tobacco crop, and the society of Virginia were favorable to a system of domestic slavery, but one which tended to develop into a patriarchal serfdom rather than into a slave-consuming industrial hierarchy. The labor required by the tobacco crop was less unhealthy than that connected with the rice crop, and the Virginians were, perhaps, on a somewhat higher moral plane than the Carolinians. There was consequently no such insatiable demand for slaves in the larger colony. On the other hand, the power of the Virginia executive was peculiarly strong, and it was not possible here to thwart the slave trade policy of the home government as easily as elsewhere. Considering all these circumstances, it is somewhat difficult to determine just what was the attitude of the early Virginians toward the slave trade. There is evidence, however, to show that although they desired the slave trade, the rate at which the Negroes were brought in soon alarmed them. In 1710, a duty of five pounds was laid on Negroes, but Governor Spotswood soon perceived that the laying so high a duty on Negroes was intended to discourage the importation and vetoed the measure. No further restrictive legislation was attempted for some years, but whether on account of the attitude of the governor or the desire of the inhabitants is not clear. With 1723 begins a series of acts extending down to the Revolution, which, so far as their contents can be ascertained, seem to have been designed effectually to check the slave trade. Some of these acts, like those of 1723 and 1727, were almost immediately disallowed. The Act of 1732 laid a duty of 5%, which was continued until 1769, and all other duties were in addition to this, so that by such cumulative duties, the rate of slaves reached 25% in 1755 and 35% at the time of Braddock's expedition. These acts were found very burdensome, introductive of many frauds, and very inconvenient, and were so far repealed by 1761, the duty was only 15%, and now the Burgesses became more powerful, two or more bills proposing restrictive duties were passed, but disallowed. By 1772, the anti-slave trade feeling had become considerably developed, and the Burgesses petitioned the king, declaring that the importation of slaves into the colonies from the coast of Africa had been long considered as a trade of great inhumanity, and under its present encouragement, we have too much reason to fear will endanger the very existence of your majesty's american dominions deeply impressed with these sentiments we most humbly beseech your majesty to remove all those restraints on your majesty's governors of this colony which inhibit their assenting to such laws as might check so very pernicious a commerce nothing further appears to have been done before the war when, in 1776, the delegates adopted a frame of government, it was charged in this document that the king had perverted his high office into a detestable and insupportable tyranny by prompting our Negroes to rise in arms among us. Those very Negroes whom, by an inhuman use of his negative, he hath refused us permission to exclude by law. Two years later, in 1778, an act to prevent the further importation of slaves stopped definitively 
the legal slave trade to Virginia. Restrictions in Maryland Not until the impulse of the asiento had been felt in America did Maryland make any attempt to restrain a trade from which she had long enjoyed a comfortable revenue. The Act of 1717, laying a duty of 40 shillings, may have been a mild restrictive measure. The duties were slowly increased to 50 shillings in 1754 and 4 pounds in 1763. In 1771, a prohibitive duty of 9 pounds was laid, and in 1783, after the war, all importation by sea was stopped and illegally imported Negroes were freed. Compared with the trade to Virginia and the Carolinas, the slave trade to Maryland was small and seems at no time to have reached proportions which alarmed the inhabitants. It was regulated to the economic demand by a slowly increasing tariff and finally, after 1769, had nearly ceased of its own accord before the restrictive legislation of revolutionary times. Probably the proximity of Maryland to Virginia made an independent slave trade less necessary to her. General character of these restrictions. We find in the planting colonies all degrees of advocacy of the trade, from the passiveness of Maryland to the clamor of Georgia. Opposition to the trade did not appear in Georgia was based almost solely on political fear of insurrection Carolina and sprang largely from the same motive in Virginia, mingled with some moral repugnance. As a whole, it may be said that whatever opposition to the slave trade there was in the planting colonies was based principally on the political fear of insurrection. End of chapter 2《Chapter 3 of the Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638-1870, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Kennedy. — The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638-1870 by W. E. B. Du Bois Chapter 3 The Farming Colonies Character of these colonies The colonies of this group, occupying the central portion of the English possessions, comprise those communities where, on account of climate, physical characteristics, and circumstances of settlement, Slavery as an institution found but a narrow field for development. The climate was generally rather cool for the newly imported slaves. The soil was best suited to crops to which slave labor was poorly adapted, and the training and habits of the great body of settlers offered little chance for the growth of a slave system. These conditions varied, of course, in different colonies, but the general statement applies to all. These communities of small farmers and traders derived whatever opposition they had to the slave trade from three sorts of motives, economic, political, and moral. First, the importation of slaves did not pay, except to supply a moderate demand for household servants. Secondly, these colonies, as well as those in the South, had a wholesome political fear of a large servile population. Thirdly, the settlers of many of these colonies were of sterner moral fiber than the southern cavaliers and adventurers, and in the absence of great counteracting motives, were more easily led to oppose the institution and the trade. Finally, it must be noted that these colonies did not so generally regard themselves as temporary commercial investments, as did Virginia and Carolina, intending to found permanent states. These settlers from the first more carefully studied the ultimate interests of those states. The Dutch Slave Trade The Dutch seemed to have commenced the slave trade to the American continent. 
the middle colonies and some of the southern receiving supplies from them. John Rolfe relates that the last of August, 1619, there came to Virginia a Dutchman of war that sold us twenty niggars. This was probably one of the ships of the numerous private Dutch trading companies which early entered into and developed the lucrative African slave trade. Ships sailed from Holland to Africa, got slaves in exchange for their goods, carried the slaves to the West Indies or Brazil, and returned home laden with sugar. Through the enterprise of one of these trading companies, the settlement of New Amsterdam was begun in 1614. In 1621, the private companies trading in the West were all merged into the Dutch West India Company and given a monopoly of American trade. The company was very active, sending in four years 15,430 Negroes to Brazil, carrying on war with Spain, supplying even the English plantations, and gradually becoming the great slave carrier of the day. The commercial supremacy of the Dutch early excited the envy and emulation of the English. The navigation ordinance of 1651 was aimed at them, and two wars were necessary to wrest the slave trade from them and place it in the hands of the English. The final terms of peace, among other things, surrendered New Netherland to England and opened the way for England to become henceforth the world's greatest slave trader. Although the Dutch had thus commenced the continental slave trade, they had not actually furnished a very large number of slaves to the English colonies outside the West Indies. A small trade had, by 1698, brought a few thousand to New York and still fewer to New Jersey. It was left to the English, with their strong policy in its favor, to develop this trade. Restrictions in New York The early ordinances of the Dutch, laying duties generally of 10% on slaves, probably proved burdensome to the trade, although this was not intentional. The biblical prohibition of slavery and the slave trade, copied from New England codes into the Duke of York's laws, had no practical application, and the trade continued to be encouraged in the governor's instructions. In 1709, a duty of three pounds was laid on Negroes from elsewhere than Africa. This was aimed at West India slaves and was prohibitive. By 1716, the duty on all slaves was one pound, twelve and a half shillings, which was probably a mere revenue figure. In 1728, a duty of 40 shillings was laid to be continued until 1737. It proved restrictive, however, and on the humble petition of the merchants and traders of the city of Bristol, was disallowed in 1735, as greatly prejudicial to the trade and navigation of this kingdom. Governor Cosby was also reminded that no duties on slaves payable by the importer were to be laid. Later, in 1753, the 40 shillings duty was restored but under the increased trade of those days was not felt. No further restrictions seem to have been attempted until 1785, when the sale of slaves in the state was forbidden. The chief element of restriction in this colony appears to have been the shrewd business sense of the traders, who never flooded the slave market, but kept a supply sufficient for the slowly growing demand. Between 1701 and 1726, only about 2,375 slaves were imported, and in 1774 the total slave population amounted to 21,149. No restriction was ever put by New York on participation in the trade outside the colony, and in spite of national laws, New York merchants continued to be engaged in this traffic even down to the Civil War. Vermont, who withdrew from New York in 1777, in her first constitution declared slavery illegal, and in 1786 stopped by law the sale and transportation of slaves within her boundaries. 
restrictions in Pennsylvania and Delaware. One of the first American protests against the slave trade came from certain German friends in 1688 at a weekly meeting held in Germantown, Pennsylvania. These are the reasons, wrote Garrett Hendrick, Derek Updegreif, Francis Daniel Pastorus, and Abraham Updengraf. Why we are against the traffic of man body as follow it. Is there any that would be done or handled at this manner? Now, though they are black, we cannot conceive there is more liberty to have them slaves as it is to have other white ones. There is a saying that we shall do to all men like as we will be done ourselves, making no difference of what generation, descent, or color they are. And those who steal or rob men, and those who buy or purchase them, are they not all alike? This little leaven helped slowly to work a revolution in the attitude of this great sect towards slavery and the slave trade. The yearly meeting at first postponed the matter, it having so general a relation to many other parts. Eventually, however, in 1696, the yearly meeting advised that friends be careful not to encourage the bringing in of any more Negroes. This advice was repeated in stronger terms for a quarter century, and by that time Sandiford, Benezet, Lay, and Woolman had begun their crusade. In 1754, the friends took a step farther and made the purchase of slaves a matter of discipline. Four years later, the yearly meeting expressed itself clearly as against every branch of this practice and declared that if any professing with us should persist to vindicate it and be concerned in importing, selling, or purchasing slaves, the respective monthly meetings to which they belong should manifest their disunion with such persons. Further manumission was recommended and in 1776 made compulsory. The effect of this attitude of the friends was early manifested in the legislation of all the colonies where the sect was influential and particularly in Pennsylvania. One of the first duty act, 1710, laid a restrictive duty of 40 shillings on slaves and was eventually disallowed. In 1712, William Sotheby petitioned the assembly totally to abolish slavery. This the assembly naturally refused to attempt, but the same year in response to another petition signed by many hands, they passed an act to prevent the importation of Negroes and Indians, the first enactment of its kind in America. This act was inspired largely by the general fear of insurrection which succeeded the Negro plot of 1712 in New York. It declared, Whereas divers plots and insurrections have frequently happened, not only in the islands, but on the mainland of America, by Negroes, which have been carried on so far that several of the inhabitants have been barbarously murdered, an instance whereof we have lately had in our neighboring colony of New York, etc. It then proceeded to lay a prohibitive duty of twenty pounds on all slaves imported. These acts were quickly disposed of in England. Three duty acts affecting Negroes, including the Prohibitory Act, were in 1713 disallowed, and it was directed that the Deputy Governor Council and Assembly of Pennsylvania be, and they are hereby strictly enjoined and required not to permit the said laws, to be from henceforward put in execution. The Assembly repealed these laws, but in 1715 passed another lane of duty of five pounds, which was also eventually disallowed. Other acts, the provisions of which are not clear, were passed in 1720 and 1722, and in 1725 to 1726 the duty on Negroes was raised to the restrictive figure of ten pounds. This duty, for some reason not apparent, 
was lowered to two pounds in 1729, but restored again in 1761. A struggle occurred over this last measure, the friends petitioning for it and the Philadelphia merchants against it, declaring that, we, the subscribers, ever desirous to extend the trade of this province, have seen, for some time past, that many inconveniences the inhabitants have suffered for want of laborers and artificers, have for some time encouraged the importation of Negroes. They prayed, therefore, at least for a delay in passing the measure. The law, nevertheless, after much debate, and altercation with the governor finally passed. These repeated acts nearly stopped the trade, and the manumission or sale of Negroes by the friends decreased the number of slaves in the province. The rising spirit of independence enabled the colony in 1773 to restore the prohibitive duty of 20 pounds and make it perpetual. After the revolution unpaid duties on slaves were collected and the slaves registered, and in 1780 an Act for the Gradual Abolition of Slavery was passed. As there were probably at no time before the war more than 11,000 slaves in Pennsylvania, the task thus accomplished was not so formidable as in many other states. As it was, participation in the slave trade outside the colony was not prohibited until 1788. It seems probable that in the original Swedish settlements along the Delaware, slavery was prohibited. This measure had, however, little practical effect, for as soon as the Dutch got control, the slave trade was opened, although, as it appears, to no large extent. After the fall of the Dutch, Delaware came into English hands, not until 1775 do we find any legislation on the slave trade. In that year, the colony attempted to prohibit the importation of slaves, but the governor vetoed the bill. Finally, in 1776, by the Constitution, and in 1787, by law, importation and exportation were prohibited. Restrictions in New Jersey Although the freeholders of West New Jersey declared in 1676 that all and every person and persons inhabiting the said province shall, as far as in us lies, be free from oppression and slavery, yet Negro slaves are early found in the colony. The first restrictive measure was passed after considerable friction between the Council and the House in 1713. It laid a duty of 10 pounds currency. Governor Hunter explained to the Board of Trade that the bill was calculated to encourage the importation of white servants for the better people in that country. How long this act continued does not appear, probably not long. No further legislation was enacted until 1762 or 1763 when a prohibitive duty was laid on account of the inconvenience the province is exposed to in line open to the free importation of Negroes, when the provinces on each side have laid duties on them. The Board of Trade declared that while they did not object to the policy of imposing a reasonable duty, they could not assent to this, and the act was disallowed. The Act of 1769 evaded the technical objection of the Board of Trade and laid a duty of 15 pounds on the first purchasers of Negroes, because, as the Act declared, duties on the importation of Negroes in several of the neighboring colonies hath, on experience, been found beneficial in the introduction of sober, industrious foreigners. In 1774, a bill which, according to the report of the Council to Governor Morris, plainly intended an entire prohibition of all slaves being imported from foreign parts, was thrown out by the council. Importation was finally prohibited in 1786. General character of these restrictions. The main difference in motive between the restrictions which the planting and the farming colonies put on the African slave trade 
lay in the fact that the former limited mainly from fear of insurrection, the latter mainly because it did not pay. Naturally, the latter motive worked itself out with much less legislation than the former. For this reason, and because they held a smaller number of slaves, most of these colonies have fewer actual statutes than the southern colonies. In Pennsylvania alone did this general economic revolt against the trade acquire a distinct moral tinge. Although even here the institution was naturally doomed, yet the clear moral insight of the Quakers checked the trade much earlier than would otherwise have happened. We may say, then, that the farming colonies checked the slave trade primarily for economic motives. End of chapter 3Chapter 4 of the Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638 to 1870, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Kennedy. The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America. 1638 to 1870 by W. E. B. Du Bois. Chapter 4 The Trading Colonies. Character of these colonies. The rigorous climate of New England, the character of her settlers, and their pronounced political view gave slavery an even slighter basis here than in the middle colonies. The significance of New England in the African slave trade does not therefore lie in the fact that she early discountenanced the system of slavery and stopped importation, but rather in the fact that her citizens, being the traders of the New World, early took part in the carrying slave trade and furnished slaves to the other colonies. An inquiry, therefore, into the efforts of the New England colonies to suppress the slave trade would fall naturally into two parts. First, and chiefly, an investigation of the efforts to stop the participation of citizens in the carrying slave trade, secondly, an examination of the effort made to banish the slave trade from New England soil. New England and the Slave Trade Vessels from Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and to a less extent from New Hampshire were early and largely engaged in the carrying slave trade. We know, said Thomas Pemberton in 1795, that a large trade to Guinea was carried on for many years by the citizens of Massachusetts Colony, who were the proprietors of the vessels and their cargoes, out and home. Some of the slaves purchased in Guinea, and I suppose the greatest part of them, were sold in the West Indies. Dr. John Elliott asserted that, it made a considerable branch of our commerce. It declined very little till the revolution. Yet the trade of this colony was said not to equal that of Rhode Island. Newport was the mark for slaves offered for sale in the north and a point of reshipment for all slaves. It was principally this trade that raised Newport to her commercial importance in the 18th century. Connecticut, too, was an important slave trader, sending large numbers of horses and other commodities to the West Indies in exchange for slaves, and selling the slaves in other colonies. This trade formed a perfect circle. Owners of slavers carried slaves to South Carolina and brought home naval stores for their shipbuilding, or to the West Indies and brought home molasses, or to other colonies and brought home hogsheads. The molasses was made into the highly prized New England rum and shipped in these hogsheads to Africa for more slaves. Thus the rum distilling industry indicates to some extent the activity of New England in the slave trade. In May 1752, one Captain Freeman found so many slavers fitting out that, in spite of the large importation of molasses, he could get no rum for his vessel. 
In Newport alone, 22 stills were at one time running continuously, and Massachusetts annually distilled 15,000 hogsheads of molasses into this chief manufacture. Turning now to restrictive measures, we must first note the measures of the slave-consuming colonies, which tended to limit the trade. These measures, however, come comparatively late, were enforced with varying degrees of efficiency, and did not seriously affect the slave trade before the Revolution. The moral sentiment of New England put some check upon the trade. Although in earlier times the most respectable people took ventures in slave trading voyages, yet there gradually arose a moral sentiment which tended to make the business somewhat disreputable. In the line, however, of definite legal enactments to stop New England citizens from carrying slaves from Africa to any place in the world, there were, before the Revolution, none. Indeed, not until the years 1787 to 1788 was slave trading in itself an indictable offense in any New England state. The particular situation in each colony and the effort to restrict the small importing slave trade of New England can best be studied in a separate view of each community. Restrictions in New Hampshire The statistics of slavery in New Hampshire show how weak an institution it always was in that colony. Consequently, when the usual instructions were sent to Governor Wentworth as to the encouragement he must give to the slave trade, the House replied, We have considered His Majesty's instruction relating to an import on Negroes and felons, to which this House answers, that there never was any duties laid on either by this government, and so few brought in that it would not be worth the public notice, so as to make an act concerning them. This remained true for the whole history of the colony. Importation was never stopped by actual enactment, but was eventually declared contrary to the Constitution of 1784. The participation of citizens in the trade appears never to have been forbidden. Restrictions in Massachusetts The early biblical codes of Massachusetts confined slavery to lawful captives taken in just wares and such strangers as willingly sell themselves or are sold to us. The stern Puritanism of early days endeavored to carry this out literally, and consequently when a certain Captain Smith, about 1640, attacked an African village and brought some of the unoffending natives home, he was promptly arrested. Eventually, the general court ordered the Negroes sent home at the colony's expense, conceiving themselves bound by ye first opportunity to bear witness against ye heinous and crying sin of man-stealing, as also to prescribe such timely redress for what is past, and such a law for ye future, as may sufficiently deter all others belonging to us to have to do in such vile and most odious courses, justly aboard of all good and just men. The temptation of trade slowly forced the colony from this high moral ground. New England ships were early found in the West Indian slave trade, and the more the carrion trade developed, the more did the profits of this branch of it attract Puritan captains. By the beginning of the 18th century, the slave trade was openly recognized as legitimate commerce. Cargoes came regularly to Boston, and the merchants of Boston quoted Negroes like any other merchandise demanded by their correspondents. At the same time, the Puritan conscience began to rebel against the growth of actual slavery on New England soil. It was a much less violent wrenching of moral ideas of right and wrong to allow Massachusetts men to carry slaves to South Carolina than to allow cargoes to come into Boston and become slaves in Massachusetts. 
Early in the 18th century, therefore, opposition arose to the further importation of Negroes, and in 1705, an act for the better preventing of the spurious and mixed issue laid a restrictive duty of four pounds on all slaves imported. One provision of this act plainly illustrates the attitude of Massachusetts. Like the acts of many of the New England colonies, it allowed a rebate of the whole duty on re-exportation. The harbors of New England were thus offered as a free exchange mart for slavers. All the duty acts of the southern and middle colonies allowed a rebate of one-half or three-fourths of the duty in the re-exportation of the slave, thus laying a small tax on even temporary importation. The Act of 1705 was evaded, but it was not amended until 1728, when the penalty for evasion was raised to 100 pounds. The Act remained in force, except possibly for one period of four years, until 1749. Meantime, the movement against importation grew. A bill for preventing the importation of slaves into this province was introduced in the legislature in 1767, but after strong opposition and disagreement between House and Council, it was dropped. In 1771, the struggle was renewed. A similar bill passed, but was vetoed by Governor Hutchinson. The imminent war and the discussions incident to it had now more and more aroused public opinion, and there were repeated attempts to gain executive consent to a prohibitory law. In 1774, such a bill was twice passed, but never received assent. The new revolutionary government first met the subject in the case of two Negroes captured on the high seas, who were advertised for sale at Salem. A resolution was introduced into the legislature, directing the release of the Negroes and declaring that the selling and enslaving the human species is a direct violation of the natural rights alike vested in all men by their Creator, and utterly inconsistent with the avowed principle on which this and the other United States have carried their struggle for liberty even to the last appeal. To this the Council would not consent, and the resolution as finally passed merely forbade the sale or ill-treatment of the Negroes. Committees on the slavery questions were appointed in 1776 and 1777, and although a letter to Congress on the matter and a bill for the abolition of slavery were reported, no decisive action was taken. All such efforts were finally discontinued, as the system was already practically extinct in Massachusetts and the custom of importation had nearly ceased. Slavery was eventually declared by judicial decision to have been abolished. The first step toward stopping the participation of Massachusetts citizens in the slave trade outside the state was taken in 1785, when a committee of inquiry was appointed by the legislature. No act was, however, passed until 1788 when participation in the trade was prohibited, on pain of fifty pounds forfeit for every slave and two hundred pounds for every ship engaged. Restrictions in Rhode Island In 1652, Rhode Island passed a law designed to prohibit life slavery in the colony. It declared that, whereas there is a common course practice amongst Englishmen to buy niggers, to that end, they may have them for service or slaves forever. For the preventage of such practices, among us let it be ordered that no black mankind or white being forced by covenant bond or otherwise to serve any man or is assignees longer than ten years, or until they come to be twenty-four years of age, if they be taken in under fourteen from the time of their coming within the liberties of this colony, and at the end of term of ten years to set them free, as the manner in with the English servants. 
and that man that will not let them go free or shall sell them away elsewhere to that end that they may be enslaved to others for a long time he or they shall forfeit to the colonies forty pounds this law was for a time enforced but by the beginning of the eighteenth century it had either been repealed or become a dead letter for the act of seventeen o eight recognized perpetual slavery and laid an impost of three pounds on negroes imported this duty was really a tax on the transport trade and produced a steady income for twenty years from the year seventeen hundred on the citizens of this state engaged more and more in the carrion trade until rhode island became the greatest slave trader in america although she did not import many slaves for her own use she became the clearing-house for the trade of other colonies governor cranston as early as seventeen o eight reported that between sixteen ninety eight and seventeen o eight one hundred and three vessels were built in the state all of which were trading to the west indies and the southern colonies they took out lumber and brought back molasses in most cases making a slave voyage in between from this the trade grew samuel hopkins about seventeen seventy was shocked at the state of the trade more than thirty distilleries were running in the colony and one hundred and fifty vessels were in the slave trade rhode island said he has been more deeply interested in the slave trade and has enslaved more africans than any other colony in new england later in seventeen eighty seven he wrote the inhabitants of rhode island especially those of newport have had by far the greater share in this traffic of all these united states this trade in human species has been the first wheel of commerce in newport on which every other movement in business has chiefly depended that town has been built up and flourished in times past at the expense of the blood the liberty and happiness of the poor africans and the inhabitants have lived on this and by it have gotten most of their wealth and riches the act of seventeen o eight was poorly enforced the good intentions of its framers were wholly frustrated by the clandestine hiding and conveying said negroes out of the town newport into the country where they lie concealed the act was accordingly strengthened by the acts of seventeen twelve and seventeen fifteen and made to apply to importations by land as well as by sea the act of seventeen fifteen however favored the trade by admitting african negroes free of duty the chaotic state of rhode island did not allow england often to review her legislation but as soon as the act of seventeen twelve came to notice it was disallowed and accordingly repealed in seventeen thirty two whether the act of seventeen fifteen remained or whether any other duty act was passed is not clear while the foreign trade was flourishing the influence of the friends and of other causes eventually led to a movement against slavery as a local institution abolition societies multiplied and in 1770 an abolition bill was ordered by the assembly but it was never passed four years later the city of providence resolved that as personal liberty is an essential part of the natural rights of mankind the importation of slaves and the system of slavery should cease in the colony this movement finally resulted in 1774 in an act prohibiting the importation of negroes into this colony a law which curiously illustrated the attitude of rhode island toward the slave trade the preamble of the act declared whereas the inhabitants of america are generally engaged in the preservation of their own rights and liberties among which that of personal freedom must be considered as the greatest as those who are desirous of enjoying all the advantages of liberty themselves 
should be willing to extend personal liberty to others. Therefore, etc. The statute then proceeds to enact that for the future no Negro or mulatto slave shall be brought into this colony, and in case any slave shall hereafter be brought in, he or she shall be and are hereby rendered immediately free. The logical ending of such an act would have been a clause prohibiting the participation of Rhode Island citizens in the slave trade. Not only was such a clause omitted, but the following was inserted instead, provided also that nothing in this act shall extend or be deemed to extend to any Negro or mulatto slave brought from the coast of Africa into the West Indies on board any vessel belonging to this colony, and which Negro or mulatto slave could not be disposed of in the West Indies, but shall be brought into this colony, provided that the owner of such Negro or mulatto slave give bond that such Negro or mulatto slave shall be exported out of the colony within one year from the date of such bond. If such Negro or mulatto be alive, and in a condition to be removed. In 1779, an act to prevent the sale of slaves out of the state was passed, and in 1784, an act gradually to abolish slavery. Not until 1787 did an act pass to forbid participation in the slave trade. This law laid a penalty of 100 pound for every slave transported, and one thousand pounds for every vessel so engaged. Restrictions in Connecticut Connecticut, in common with the other colonies of this section, had a trade for many years with the West Indian slave markets, and though this trade was much smaller than that of the neighboring colonies, yet many of her citizens were engaged in it. A map of Middletown at the time of the revolution gives among one hundred families three slave captains and three notables designated as slave dealers. The actual importation was small and almost entirely unrestricted before the revolution, save by a few light general duty acts. In 1774, the further importation of slaves was prohibited because the increase of slaves in this colony is injurious to the poor and inconvenient. The law prohibited importation under any pretext by a penalty of 100 pounds per slave. This was reenacted in 1784 and provisions were made for the abolition of slavery. In 1788 participation in the trade was forbidden and the penalty placed at 50 pounds for each slave and 500 pounds for each ship engaged. General character of these restrictions. Enough has already been said to show, in the main, the character of the opposition to the slave trade in New England. The system of slavery had, on this soil and amid these surroundings, no economic justification, and the small number of Negroes here furnished no political arguments against them. The opposition to the importation was therefore from the first based solely on moral grounds, with some social arguments. As to the carrion trade, however, the case was different. Here too, a feeble moral opposition was early aroused, but it was swept away by the immense economic advantages of the slave traffic to a thrifty seafaring community of traders. This trade, no moral suasion, not even the strong liberty cry of the revolution was able wholly to suppress until the closing of the west indian and southern markets cut off the demand for slaves end of chapter four chapter five of the suppression of the african slave trade to the united states of america sixteen thirty eight to eighteen seventy Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Andrew Kennedy The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638-1870, by W. E. B. Du Bois Chapter 5 The Period of the Revolution, 1774-1787 the situation in 1774 in the individual efforts of the various colonies to suppress the african slave trade there may be traced certain general movements first from 1638 to 1664 there was a tendency to take a high moral stand against the traffic this is illustrated in the laws of new england in the plans for the settlement of delaware and later that of georgia and in the protest of the German friends. The second period, from about 1664 to 1760, has no general unity, but is marked by statutes laying duties varying in design from encouragement to absolute prohibition, by some cases of moral opposition, and by the slow but steady growth of a spirit unfavorable to the long continuance of the trade. The last colonial period, from about 1760 to 1787, is one of pronounced effort to regulate, limit, or totally prohibit the traffic. Beside these general movements, there are many waves of legislation, easily distinguishable, which rolled over several or all of the colonies at various times, such as the series of high duties following the asiento, and the acts inspired by various Negro plots. Notwithstanding this, the laws of the colonies before 1774 had no national unity, the peculiar circumstances of each colony determining its legislation. With the outbreak of the Revolution came unison in action with regard to the slave trade, as with regard to other matters, which may justly be called national. It was, of course, a critical period, a period when, in the rapid upheaval of a few years, the complicated and diverse forces of decades meet, combine, act, and react, until the resultant seems almost the work of chance. In the settlement of the fate of slavery and the slave trade, however, the real crisis came in the calm that succeeded the storm, in that day when, in the opinion of most men, the question seemed already settled and indeed it needed an exceptionally clear and discerning mind in seventeen eighty seven to deny that slavery and the slave trade in the united states of america were doomed to early annihilation it seemed certainly a legitimate deduction from the history of the preceding century to conclude that as the system had risen flourished and fallen in massachusetts new york and pennsylvania and as South Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland were apparently following in the same legislative path, the next generation would in all probability witness the last rows of the system on our soil. To be sure, the problem had its uncertain quantities. The motives of the lawmakers in South Carolina and Pennsylvania were dangerously different. The century of industrial expansion was slowly dawning, and awaken in the vast economic revolution in which American slavery was to play so prominent and fatal a role. And finally, there were already in the South faint signs of a change in moral attitude toward slavery, which would no longer regard the system as a temporary makeshift, but rather as a permanent, though perhaps unfortunate, necessity. With regard to the slave trade, however, there appeared to be substantial unity of opinion, and there were, in 1787, few things to indicate that a cargo of 500 African slaves would openly be landed in Georgia in 1860. The Condition of the Slave Trade In 1760, England, the chief slave-trading nation, was sending on an average to Africa 160 ships annually, with a tonnage of 18,000 tons carrying exports to the value of one hundred and sixty three thousand eight hundred and eighteen pounds only about twenty of these ships regularly returned to england most of them carried slaves to the west indies 
and returned laden with sugar and other products. Thus may be formed some idea of the size and importance of the slave trade at that time, although for a complete view we must add to this the trade under the French, Portuguese, Dutch, and Americans. The trade fell off somewhat towards 1770, but was flourishing again when the revolution brought a sharp and serious check upon it, bringing down the number of English slavers clearing from 167 in 1774 to 28 in 1779, and the tonnage from 17,218 to 3,475 tons. After the war, the trade gradually recovered, and by 1786 had reached nearly its former extent. In 1783, the British West Indies received 16,208 Negroes from Africa, and by 1787, the importation had increased to 21,023. In this latter year, it was estimated that the British were taken annually from Africa 38,000 slaves, the French 20,000, the Portuguese 10,000, the Dutch and Danes 6,000, a total of 74,000. Manchester alone sent 180,000 pounds annually in goods to Africa in exchange for Negroes. The Slave Trade and the Association At the outbreak of the revolution, six main reasons some of which were old and of slow growth, others peculiar to the abnormal situation of that time, led to concerted action against the slave trade. The first reason was the economic failure of slavery in the Middle and Eastern colonies. This gave rise to the presumption that like failure awaited the institution in the South. Secondly, the new philosophy of freedom and the rights of man which formed the cornerstone of the revolution, made the dullest realize that, at the very least, the slave trade and a struggle for liberty were not consistent. Thirdly, the old fears of slave insurrections, which had long played so prominent a part in legislation, now gained new power from the imminence of war and from the well-founded fear that the British might incite servile uprisings. Fourthly, nearly all the American slave markets were, in 1774 to 1775, overstocked with slaves, and consequently many of the strongest partisans of the system were bulls on the market, and desired to raise the value of their slave by at least a temporary stoppage of the trade. Fifthly, since the vested interests of the slave trade and merchants were liable to be swept away by the opening of hostilities, and since the price of slaves was low, there was from this quarter little active opposition to a cessation of the trade for a season. Finally, it was long a favorite belief of the supporters of the revolution that, as English exploitation of colonial resources had caused the quarrel, the best weapon to bring England to terms was the economic expedient of stopping all commercial intercourse with her. Since then, the slave trade had ever formed an important part of her colonial traffic. It was one of the first branches of commerce which occurred to the colonists as especially suited to their ends. Such were the complicated moral, political, and economic motives which underlay the first national action against the slave trade. This action was taken by the Association, a union of the colonies entered into to enforce the policy of stopping commercial intercourse with England. The movement was not a great moral protest against an iniquitous traffic, although it had undoubtedly a strong moral backing, it was primarily a temporary war measure. The Action of the Colonies The earlier and largely abortive attempts to form non-intercourse associations generally did not mention slaves specifically. Although the Virginia House of Burgesses, May 11, 1769, recommended 
to merchants and traders, among other things, to agree that they will not import any slaves or purchase any imported after the first day of November next until the said acts are repealed. Later in 1774, when a Faneuil Hall meeting started the first successful national attempt at non-intercourse, the slave trade, being at the time especially flourishing, received more attention. Even then, slaves were specifically mentioned in the resolution of but three states. Rhode Island recommended a stoppage of all trade with Great Britain, Ireland, Africa, and the West Indies. North Carolina, in August 1774, resolved in convention that we will not import any slave or slaves or purchase any slave or slaves imported or brought into this province by others from any part of the world after the first day of November next. Virginia gave the slave trade a special prominence and was in reality the leading spirit to force her views on the Continental Congress. The county conventions of that colony first took up the subject. Fairfax County thought that during our present difficulties and distress no slaves ought to be imported and said, we take this opportunity of declaring our most earnest wishes to see an entire stop forever put to such a wicked, cruel, and unnatural trade. Prince George and Nansamond counties resolved that the African trade is injurious to this colony, obstructs the population of it by free men, prevent manufacturers and other useful immigrants from Europe from settling amongst us, and occasions an annual increase of the balance of trade against this colony. The Virginia Colonial Convention, August 1774, also declared, We will neither ourselves import nor purchase any slave or slaves imported by any other person after the first day of November next, either from Africa, the West Indies, or any other place. In South Carolina, at the convention, July 6, 1774, decided opposition to the non-importation scheme was manifested, though how much this was due to the slave trade interest is not certain. Many of the delegates wished at least to limit the power of their representatives, and the Charleston Chamber of Commerce flatly opposed the plan of an association. Finally, however, delegates with full powers were sent to Congress. The arguments leading to this step were not in all cases on the score of patriotism. A Charleston manifesto argued, The planters are greatly in arrears to the merchants. A stoppage of importation would give them all an opportunity to extricate themselves from debt. The merchants would have time to settle their accounts and be ready with the return of liberty to renew trade. The Action of the Continental Congress The First Continental Congress met September 5, 1774, and on September 22nd recommended merchants to send no more orders for foreign goods. On September 27, Mr. Lee made a motion for a non-importation, and it was unanimously resolved to import no goods from Great Britain after December 1, 1774. Afterward, Ireland and the West Indies were also included, and a committee consisting of Lowe of New York, Mifflin of Pennsylvania, Lee of Virginia, and Johnson of Connecticut were appointed to bring in a plan for carrying into effect the non-importation, non-consumption, and non-exportation resolved on. The next move was to instruct this committee to include in the proscribed articles, among other things, molasses, coffee, or pimento from the British plantations or from Dominica, a motion which cut deep into the slave trade circle of commerce and aroused some opposition. Will, can the people bear a total interruption of the West India trade? 
asked Lo of New York. Can they live without rum, sugar, and molasses? Will not this impatience and vexation defeat the measure? The committee finally reported October 12, 1774, and after three days' discussion and amendment, the proposal passed. This document, after a recital of grievances, declared that, in the opinion of the colonists, a non-importation agreement would best secure redress. Goods from Great Britain, Ireland, and East and West Indies, and Dominica were excluded, and it was resolved that we will neither import nor purchase any slave imported after the first day of December next, after which time we will wholly discontinue the slave trade, and will neither be concerned in it ourselves, nor will we hire our vessels, nor sell our commodities or manufactures to those who are concerned in it. Strong and straightforward as this resolution was, time unfortunately proved that it meant very little. Two years later, in this same Congress, a decided opposition was manifested to Brandon the slave trade as inhuman and it was thirteen years before South Carolina stopped the slave trade, or Massachusetts prohibited her citizens from engaging in it. The passing of so strong a resolution must be explained by the motives before given, by the character of the drafting committee, by the desire of America in this crisis to appear well before the world, and by the natural moral enthusiasm aroused by the imminence of a great national struggle. Reception of the Slave Trade Resolution The unanimity with which the colonists received this association is not perhaps as remarkable as the almost entire absence of comment on the radical slave trade clause. A Connecticut town meeting in December 1774 noted, with singular pleasure, the second article of the association, in which it is agreed to import no more Negro slaves. This comment appears to have been almost the only one. There were in various places some evidence of disapproval, but only in the state of Georgia was this widespread and determined, and based mainly on the slave trade clause. This opposition delayed the ratification meeting until January 18, 1775, and then delegates from but five of the twelve parishes appeared, and many of these had strong instructions against the approval of the plan. Before this meeting could act, the governor adjourned it, on the ground that it did not represent the province. Some of the delegates signed an agreement, one article of which promised to stop the importation of slaves March 15, 1775, i.e., four months later than the National Association had directed. This was not, of course, binding on the province, and although a town like Darien might declare our disapprobation and abhorrence of the unnatural practice of slavery in America, yet the powerful influence of Savannah was not likely soon to give matters a favorable turn. The importers were mostly against any interruption, and the consumers were much divided. Thus the efforts of this assembly failed, the resolution being almost unknown, and as a gentleman writes, I hope for the honor of the province ever will remain so. The delegates of the Continental Congress selected by this rump assembly refused to take their seats. Meantime, South Carolina stopped trade with Georgia because it hath not acceded to the Continental Association. And the single Georgia parish of St. John's appealed to the Second Continental Congress to accept it from the general boycott of the colony. This county had already resolved not to purchase any slave imported at Savannah, large numbers of which we understand are there expected, till the sense of Congress shall be made known to us. May 17, 1775. Congress resolved unanimously 
that all exportation to Quebec, Nova Scotia, the island of St. John's, Newfoundland, Georgia, except the parish of St. John's, and to East and West Florida, immediately cease. These measures brought the refractory colony to terms, and the Provisional Congress, July 4, 1775, finally adopted the association and resolved, among other things, that we will neither import or purchase any slave imported from Africa or elsewhere after this day. The non-importation agreement was in the beginning, at least, well enforced by the voluntary action of the loosely federated nation. The slave trade clause seems in most states to have been observed with the others. In South Carolina, a cargo of near 300 slaves was sent out of the colony by the co-signee, as being interdicted by the second article of the association. In Virginia, the Vigilance Committee of Norfolk hold up for your just indignation Mr. John Brown, merchant of this place, who has several times imported slaves from Jamaica, and he is thus publicly censured to the end that all such foes of the rights of British America may be publicly known as the enemies of American liberty, and that every person may henceforth break off all dealings with him. Results of the resolution. The strain of war at last proved too much for this voluntary blockade, and after some hesitancy, Congress April 3, 1776, resolved to allow the importation of articles, not the growth or manufacture, of Great Britain, except tea. They also voted that no slaves be imported into any of the thirteen United Colonies. This marks a noticeable change of attitude from the strong words of two years previous. The former was a definitive promise. This is a temporary resolve, which probably represented public opinion much better than the former. On the whole, the conclusion is inevitably forced on the student of this first national movement against the slave trade, that its influence on the trade was but temporary and insignificant, and that at the end of the experiment the outlook for the final suppression of the trade was little brighter than before. The whole movement served as a sort of social test of the power and importance of the slave trade, which proved to be far more powerful than the platitudes of many of the revolutionists had assumed. The effect of the movement on the slave trade in general was to begin, possibly a little earlier than otherwise would have been the case, that temporary breaking up of the trade which the war naturally caused. There was a time during the late war, says Clarkson, when the slave trade may be considered as having been nearly abolished. The prices of slaves rose correspondingly high, so that smugglers made fortunes. It is stated that in the years 1772 to 1778, slave merchants of Liverpool failed for the sum of 710,000 pounds. All this, of course, might have resulted from the war without the association, but in the long run the association aided in frustrating the very designs which the framers of the first resolve had in mind, for the temporary stoppage in the end created an extraordinary demand for slaves and led to a slave trade after the war nearly as large as that before. The Slave Trade and Public Opinion After the War The Declaration of Independence showed a significant drift of public opinion from the firm stand taken in the Association Resolutions. The clique of political philosophers to which Jefferson belonged never imagined the continued existence of the country with slavery. It is well known that the first draft of the Declaration contained a severe arraignment of Great Britain as the real promoter of slavery and the slave trade in America. 
in it the king was charged with waging cruel war against human nature itself violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither this piratical warfare the opprobrium of infidel powers is the warfare of the christian king of great britain determined to keep open a market where men should be bought and sold he has prostituted his negative for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or to restrain this exacerable commerce and that this assemblage of horrors might want no fact of distinguished die he is now exciting those very people to rise in arms among us and to purchase that liberty of which he has deprived them by murdering the people on whom he also obtruded them thus paying off former crimes committed against the liberties of one people with crimes which he urges them to commit against the lives of another to this radical and not strictly truthful statement even the large influence of the virginia leaders could not gain the assent of the delegates in congress the afatus of 1774 was rapidly subsiding and changing economic conditions had already led many to look forward to a day when the slave trade could successfully be reopened more important than this the nation as a whole was even less inclined now than in 1774 to denounce the slave trade uncompromisingly jefferson himself says that this clause was struck out in complaisance to south carolina and georgia who had never attempted to restrain the importation of slaves and who on the contrary still wished to continue it our northern brethren also i believe said he felt a little tender under those censures for though their people had very few slaves themselves yet they had been pretty considerable carriers of them to others as the war slowly dragged itself to a close it became increasingly evident that a firm moral stand against slavery and the slave trade was not a probability the reaction which naturally follows a period of prolonged and exhausting strife for high political principle now set in the economic forces of the country which had suffered most sought to recover and rearrange themselves and all the selfish motives that impelled a bankrupt nation to seek to gain its daily bread did not long hesitate to demand a reopening of the profitable african slave trade this demand was especially urgent from the fact that the slaves by pillage flight and actual fighting had become so reduced in numbers during the war that an urgent demand for more laborers was felt in the south nevertheless the revival of the trade was naturally a matter of some difficulty as the west india circuit had been cut off leaving no resort except the contraband traffic and the direct african trade the english slave trade after the peace returned to its former state and was by 1784 sending 20,000 slaves annually to the West Indies. Just how large the trade to the continent was at this time there are few means of ascertaining. It is certain that there was a general reopening of the trade in the Carolinas and Georgia and that the New England traders participated in it. This traffic undoubtedly reached considerable proportions and through the direct african trade and the illicit west india trade many thousands of negroes came into the united states during the years seventeen eighty three to seventeen eighty seven meantime there was slowly arising a significant divergence of opinion on the subject probably the whole country still regarded both slavery and the slave trade as temporary 
but the middle states expected to see the abolition of both within a generation, while the South scarcely thought it probable to prohibit even the slave trade in that short time. Such a difference might, in all probability, have been satisfactorily adjusted if both parties had recognized the real gravity of the matter. As it was, both regarded it as a problem of secondary importance to be solved after many other more pressing ones had been disposed of. The anti-slavery man had seen slavery die in their own communities and expected it to die the same way in others, with as little active effort on their own part. The southern planters, born and reared in a slave system, thought that some day the system might change and possibly disappear, but active effort to this end on their part was ever farthest from their thoughts. Here then began that fatal policy towards slavery and the slave trade that characterized the nation for three quarters of a century, the policy of lasser fear, lasser passer. The Action of the Confederation the slave trade was hardly touched upon in the Congress of the Confederation, except in the ordinance respecting the capture of slaves and on the occasion of the Quaker petition against the trade, although during the debate on the Articles of Confederation, the counting of slaves as well as of freemen in the appropriation of taxes was urged as a measure that would check further importation of Negroes. It is our duty, said Wilson of Pennsylvania, to lay every discouragement on the importation of slaves. But this amendment, i.e. to count two slaves as one freeman, would give the just trium liberorum to him who would import slaves. The matter was finally compromised by apportioning requisitions according to the value of land and buildings. After the article went into operation, an ordinance in regard to the recapture of fugitive slaves provided that, if the capture was made on the sea below high water mark, and the negro was not claimed, he should be freed. Matthews of South Carolina demanded the yeas and nays on this proposition, with the result that only the vote of his state was recorded against it. On Tuesday, October 3rd, 1783, a deputation from the yearly meeting of the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware Friends asked leave to present a petition. Leave was granted the following day, but no further minute appears. According to the report of the Friends, the petition was against the slave trade, and, though the Christian restitute of the concern was by the delegates generally acknowledged, yet not being vested with the power of legislation, they declined promoting any public remedy against the gross national inequity of trafficking in the persons of fellow men. The only legislative activity in regard to the trade during the Confederation was taken by the individual states. Before 1778, Connecticut, Vermont, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Virginia had by law stopped the further importation of slaves, and importation had practically ceased in all the New England and Middle States, including Maryland. In consequence of the revival of the slave trade after the war, there was then a lull in state activity until 1786, when North Carolina laid a prohibitive duty, and South Carolina a year later began her series of temporary prohibitions. In 1787 to 1788, the New England states forbade the participation of their citizens in the traffic. It was this wave of legislation against the traffic which did so much to blind the nation as to the stronghold which slavery still had on the country. End of chapter 5《Chapter VI of The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638 to 1870, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the suppression of the african slave trade to the united states of america sixteen thirty eight to eighteen seventy by w e b du bois the federal convention seventeen eighty seven thirty two the first proposition thirty three the general debate thirty four the special committee and the bargain thirty five the appeal to the convention thirty six settlement by the convention thirty seven reception of the clause by the nation thirty eight attitude of the state conventions thirty nine acceptance of the policy thirty two the first proposition slavery occupied no prominent place in the convention called to remedy the glaring defects of the confederation for the obvious reason that few of the delegates thought it expedient to touch a delicate subject which if let alone bade fair to settle itself in a matter satisfactory to all consequently neither slavery nor the slave trade is specifically mentioned in the delegates credentials of any of the states nor in randolph's pinckney's or hamilton's plans nor in patterson's propositions indeed the debate from may fourteenth to june nineteenth when the committee of the whole reported touched the subject only in the matter of the ratio of representation of slaves with this same exception the report of the committee of the whole contained no reference to slavery or the slave trade and the twenty-three resolutions of the convention referred to the committee of detail july twenty third and twenty sixth maintained the same silence the latter committee consisting of rutledge randolph gorham ellsworth and wilson reported a draft of the constitution august sixth seventeen eighty seven the committee had in its deliberations probably made use of a draft of a national constitution made by edmund randolph one clause of this provided that no state shall lay a duty on imports and also one no duty on exports two no prohibition on such inhabitants as the united states think proper to admit three no duties by way of such prohibition it does not appear that any reference to negroes was here intended in the extant copy however notes in edward rutledge's handwriting changed the second clause to no prohibition on such inhabitants or people as the several states think proper to admit in the report august sixth these clauses take the following form article seven section four no tax or duty shall be laid by the legislature on articles exported from any state nor on the migration or importation of such persons as the several states shall think proper to admit nor shall such migration or importation be prohibited thirty three the general debate this of course referred both to immigrants migration and to slaves importation debate on this section began tuesday august twenty second and lasted two days luther martin of maryland precipitated the discussion by a proposition to alter the section so as to allow a prohibition or tax on the importation of slaves the debate immediately became general being carried on principally by rutledge the pinckneys and williamson from the carolinas baldwin of georgia mason madison and randolph of virginia wilson and governor morris of pennsylvania dickinson of delaware and ellsworth sherman jerry king and langdon of new england in this debate the moral arguments were prominent colonel george mason of virginia denounced the traffic in slaves as infernal luther martin of maryland regarded it as inconsistent with the principles of the revolution and dishonorable to the american character every principle of honor and safety declared john dickinson of delaware demands the exclusion of slaves indeed mason solemnly averred that the crime of slavery might yet bring the judgment of god on the nation on the other side rutledge of south carolina bluntly declared that religion and humanity had nothing to do with the question that it was a matter of interest alone jerry of massachusetts wished merely to refrain from giving direct sanction to the trade while others contended themselves with pointing out the inconsistency of condemning the slave trade and defending slavery 
the difficulty of the whole argument from the moral standpoint lay in the fact that it was completely checkmated by the obstinate attitude of south carolina and georgia their delegates baldwin the pinckneys rutledge and others asserted flatly not less than a half dozen times during the debate that these states can never receive the plan if it prohibits the slave trade that if the convention thought that these states would consent to a stoppage of the slave trade the expectation is vain by this stand all argument from the moral standpoint was virtually silenced for the convention evidently agreed with roger sherman of connecticut that it was better to let the southern states import slaves than to part with those states in such a dilemma the convention listened not unwillingly to the non possumous arguments of the state's rights advocates the morality and wisdom of slavery declared ellsworth of connecticut are considerations belonging to the states themselves let every state import what it pleases the confederation has not meddled with the question why should the union it is a dangerous symptom of centralization cried baldwin of georgia the central states wish to be the vortex for everything even matters of a local nature the national government said jerry of massachusetts had nothing to do with slavery in the states it had only to refrain from giving direct sanction to the system others opposed this whole argument declaring with langdon of new hampshire that congress ought to have this power since as dickinson tartly remarked the true question was whether the national happiness would be promoted or impeded by the importation and this question ought to be left to the national government not to the states particularly interested besides these arguments as to the right of the trade and the proper seat of authority over it many arguments of general expediency were introduced from an economic standpoint for instance general c c pinckney of south carolina contended that the importation of slaves would be for the interest of the whole union the more slaves the more produce rutledge of the same state declared if the northern states consult their interest they will not oppose the increase of slaves which will increase the commodities of which they will become the carriers this sentiment found a more or less conscious echo in the words of ellsworth of connecticut what enriches a part enriches the whole it was moreover broadly hinted that the zeal of maryland and virginia against the trade had an economic rather than a humanitarian motive since they had slaves enough and to spare and wished to sell them at a high price to south carolina and georgia who needed more in such case restrictions would unjustly discriminate against the latter states the argument from history was barely touched upon only once was there an allusion to the example of the world in all ages to justify slavery and once came the counter declaration that greece and rome were made unhappy by their slaves on the other hand the military weakness of slavery in the late war led to many arguments on that score luther martin and george mason dwelt on the danger of a servile class in war and insurrection while rutledge hotly replied that he would readily exempt the other states from the obligation to protect the southern against them and ellsworth thought that the very danger would become a motive to kind treatment the desirability of keeping slavery out of the west was once mentioned as an argument against the trade to this all seemed tacitly to agree throughout the debate it is manifest that the convention had no desire really to enter upon a general slavery argument the broader and more theoretic aspects of the question were but lightly touched upon here and there undoubtedly most of the members would have much preferred not to raise the question at all but as it was raised the differences of opinion were too manifest to be ignored and the convention after its first perplexity gradually and perhaps too willingly set itself to work to find some middle ground on which all parties could stand the way to this compromise was pointed out by the south the most radical pro-slavery arguments always ended with the opinion that if the southern states were let alone they will probably of themselves stop importations to be sure general pinckney admitted that 
candidly he did not think south carolina would stop her importations of slaves in any short time nevertheless the convention observed with roger sherman that the abolition of slavery seemed to be going on in the united states and that the good sense of the several states would probably by degrees complete it economic forces were evoked to eke out moral motives when the south had its full quota of slaves like virginia it too would abolish the trade free labor was bound finally to drive out slave labor thus the chorus of laissez-faire increased and compromise seemed at least in sight when connecticut cried let the trade alone and georgia denounced it as an evil some few discordant notes were heard as for instance when wilson of pennsylvania made the uncomforting remark if south carolina and georgia were themselves disposed to get rid of the importation of slaves in a short time as had been suggested they would never refuse to unite because the importation might be prohibited with the spirit of compromise in the air it was not long before the general terms were clear the slavery side was strongly entrenched and had a clear and definite demand the forces of freedom were on the contrary divided by important conflicts of interest and animated by no very strong and decided anti-slavery spirit with settled aims under the circumstances it was easy for the convention to miss the opportunity for a really great compromise and to descend to a scheme that savored unpleasantly of log rolling the student of the situation will always have good cause to believe that a more sturdy and definite anti-slavery stand at this point might have changed history for the better thirty four the special committee and the bargain since the debate had in the first place arisen from a proposition to tax the importation of slaves the yielding of this point by the south was the first move toward compromise to all but the doctrinaires who shrank from taxing men as property the argument that the failure to tax slaves was equivalent to a bounty was conclusive with this point settled randolph voiced the general sentiment when he declared that he was for committing in order that some middle ground might if possible be found finally governor morris discovered the middle ground in his suggestion that the whole subject be committed including the clauses relating to taxes on exports and to a navigation act these things said he may form a bargain among the northern and southern states this was quickly assented to and sections four and five on slave trade and capitation tax were committed by a vote of seven to three and section six on navigation acts by a vote of nine to two all three clauses were referred to the following committee langdon of new hampshire king of massachusetts johnson of connecticut livingston of new jersey clymer of pennsylvania dickinson of delaware martin of maryland madison of virginia williamson of north carolina general pinckney of south carolina and baldwin of georgia the fullest account of the proceedings of this committee is given in luther martin's letter to his constituents and is confirmed in its main particulars by similar reports of other delegates martin writes a committee of one member from each state was chosen by ballot to take this part of the system under their consideration and to endeavor to agree upon some report which should reconcile those states i e south carolina and georgia to this committee also was referred the following proposition which had been reported by the committee of detail viz no navigation act shall be passed without the assent of two-thirds of the members present in each house a proposition which the staple and commercial states were solicitous to retain lest their commerce should be placed too much under the power of the eastern states but which these last states were as anxious to reject this committee of which also i had the honor to be a member met and took under their consideration the subjects committed to them i found the eastern states notwithstanding their aversion to slavery were very willing to indulge the southern states at least with a temporary liberty to prosecute the slave trade provided the southern states would in their turn gratify them 
by laying no restriction on navigation acts and after a very little time the committee by a great majority agreed on a report by which the general government was to be prohibited from preventing the importation of slaves for a limited time and the restrictive clause relative to navigation acts was to be omitted that the bargain was soon made is proven by the fact that the committee reported by the very next day friday august twenty fourth and that on saturday the report was taken up it was as follows strike out so much of the fourth section as was referred to the committees and insert the migration or importation of such persons as the several states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the legislature prior to the year eighteen hundred but a tax or duty may be imposed on any such migration or importation at a rate not exceeding the average of the duties laid on imports the fifth section to remain is in the report the sixth section to be stricken out thirty five the appeal to the convention the ensuing debate which lasted only a part of the day was evidently a sort of appeal to the house on the decisions of the committee it throws light on the points of disagreement general pinckney first proposed to extend the slave trading limit to eighteen o eight and gorham of massachusetts seconded the motion this brought a spirited protest from madison twenty years will produce all the mischief that can be apprehended from the liberty to import slaves so long a term will be more dishonorable to the american character than to say nothing about it in the constitution there was however evidently another bargain here for without farther debate the south and east voted the extension seven to four only new jersey pennsylvania delaware and virginia objecting the ambiguous phraseology of the whole slave trade section as reported did not pass without comment governor morris would have it read the importation of slaves into north carolina south carolina and georgia shall not be prohibited etc this emendation was however too painfully truthful for the doctrinaires and was amid a score of objections withdrawn the taxation clause also was manifestly too vague for practical use and baldwin of georgia wished to amend it by inserting common impost on articles not enumerated in lieu of the average duty this minor point gave rise to considerable argument sherman and madison deprecated any such recognition of property in man as taxing would imply mason and gorham argued that the tax restrained the trade while king langdon and general pinckney contented themselves with the remark that this clause was the price of the first part finally it was unanimously agreed to make the duty not exceeding ten dollars for each person southern interests now being safe some southern members attempted a few days later to annul the bargain by restoring the requirements of a two-thirds vote in navigation acts charles pinckney made the motion in an elaborate speech designed to show the conflicting commercial interests of the states he declared that the power of regulating commerce was a pure concession on the part of the southern states martin and williamson of north carolina butler of south carolina and mason of virginia defended the proposition insisting that it would be a dangerous concession on the part of the south to leave navigation acts to a mere majority vote sherman of connecticut morris of pennsylvania and spate of north carolina declared that the very diversity of interest was a security finally by a vote of seven to four maryland virginia north carolina and georgia being in the minority the convention refused to consider the motion and the recommendation of the committee passed when on september tenth the convention was discussing the amendment clause of the constitution the ever alert rutledge perceiving that the results of the laboriously settled bargain might be endangered declared that he never could agree to give a power by which the articles relating to slaves might be altered by the states not interested in that property as a result the clause finally adopted september fifteenth had the proviso 
provided that no amendment which may be made prior to the year eighteen o eight shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article thirty six settlement by the convention thus the slave trade article of the constitution stood finally as follows article one section nine the migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the congress prior to the year one thousand eight hundred and eight but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation not exceeding ten dollars for each person this settlement of the slavery question brought out distinct differences of moral attitude toward the institution and yet differences far from hopeless to be sure the south apologized for slavery the middle states denounced it and the east could only tolerate it from afar and yet all three sections united in considering it a temporary institution the cornerstone of which was the slave trade no one of them had ever seen a system of slavery without an active slave trade and there were probably few members of the convention who did not believe that the foundations of slavery had been sapped merely by putting the abolition of the slave trade in the hands of congress twenty years hence here lay the danger for when the north called slavery temporary she thought of twenty or thirty years while the temporary period of the south was scarcely less than a century meantime for at least a score of years a policy of strict laissez-faire so far as the general government was concerned was to intervene instead of calling the whole moral energy of the people into action so as gradually to crush this portentous evil the federal convention lulled the nation to sleep by a bargain and left to the vacillating and unripe judgment of the states one of the most threatening of the social and political ills which they were so courageously seeking to remedy thirty seven reception of the clause by the nation when the proposed constitution was before the country the slave trade article came in for no small amount of condemnation and apology in the pamphlets of the day it was much discussed one of the points in mason's letter of objections was that the general legislature is restrained from prohibiting the further importation of slaves for twenty odd years though such importations render the united states weaker more vulnerable and less capable of defense to this iredell replied through the columns of the state gazette of north carolina if all the states had been willing to adopt this regulation i e to prohibit the slave trade i should as an individual most heartily have approved of it because even if the importation of slaves in fact rendered us stronger less vulnerable and more capable of defence i should rejoice in the prohibition of it as putting an end to a trade which has already continued too long for the honour and humanity of those concerned in it but as it was well known that south carolina and georgia thought a further continuance of such importations useful to them and would not perhaps otherwise have agreed to the new constitution those states which had been importing till they were satisfied could not with decency have insisted upon their relinquishing advantages themselves had already enjoyed our situation makes it necessary to bear the evil as it is it will be left to the future legislatures to allow such importations or not if any in violation of their clear conviction of the injustice of this trade persist in pursuing it this is a matter between god and their own consciences the interests of humanity will however have gained something by the prohibition of this inhuman trade though at a distance of twenty odd years sentinel representing the quaker sentiment of pennsylvania attacked the clause in his third letter published in the independent gazetteer or the chronicle of freedom november eighth seventeen eighty seven we are told that the objects of this article are slaves and that it is inserted to secure to the southern states the right of introducing negroes for twenty-one years to come against the declared sense of the other states to put an end to an odious traffic in the human species 
which is especially scandalous and inconsistent in a people who have asserted their own liberty by the sword and which dangerously enfeebles the districts wherein the laborers are bondsmen the words dark and ambiguous such as no plain man of common sense would have used are evidently chosen to conceal from europe that in this enlightened country the practice of slavery has its advocates among men in the highest stations when it is recollected that no poll tax can be imposed on five negroes above what three whites shall be charged when it is considered that the imposts on the consumption of carolina field negroes must be trifling and the excise nothing it is plain that the proportion of contributions which can be expected from the southern states under the new constitution will be unequal and yet they are to be allowed to enfeeble themselves by the further importation of negroes till the year eighteen o eight has not the concurrence of the five southern states in the convention to the new system been purchased too dearly by the rest noah webster's examination seventeen eighty seven addressed itself to such quaker scruples but say the enemies of slavery negroes may be imported for twenty-one years this exception is addressed to the quakers and a very pitiful exception it is the truth is congress cannot prohibit the importation of slaves during that period but the laws against the importation into particular states stand unrepealed an immediate abolition of slavery would bring ruin upon the whites and misery upon the blacks in the southern states the constitution has therefore wisely left each state to pursue its own measures with respect to this article of legislation during the period of twenty-one years the following year the examination of tench cox said the temporary reservation of any particular matter must be deemed an admission that it should be done away this appears to have been well understood in addition to the arguments drawn from liberty justice and religion opinions against this practice i e of slave trading founded in sound policy have no doubt been urged regard was necessarily paid to the peculiar situation of our southern fellow-citizens but they on the other hand have not been insensible of the delicate situation of our national character on this subject from quite different motives southern men defended this section for instance dr david ramsay a south carolina member of the convention wrote in his address it is farther objected that they have stipulated for a right to prohibit the importation of negroes after twenty-one years on this subject observe as they are bound to protect us from domestic violence they think we ought not to increase our exposure to that evil by an unlimited importation of slaves though congress may forbid the importation of negroes after twenty-one years it does not follow that they will on the other hand it is probable that they will not the more rice we make the more business will be for their shipping their interest will therefore coincide with ours besides we have other sources of supply the importation of the ensuing twenty years added to the natural increase of those we already have and the influx from our northern neighbors who are desirous of getting rid of their slaves will afford a sufficient number for cultivating all the lands in this state finally the federalist number forty one written by james madison commented as follows it were doubtless to be wished that the power of prohibiting the importation of slaves had not been postponed until the year eighteen o eight or rather that it had been suffered to have immediate operation but it is not difficult to account either for this restriction on the general government or for the manner in which the whole clause is expressed it ought to be considered as a great point gained in favor of humanity that a period of twenty years may terminate forever within these states a traffic which has so long and so loudly upbraided the barbarism of modern policy that within that period it will receive a considerable discouragement from the federal government and may be totally abolished by a concurrence of the few states which continue the unnatural traffic in the prohibitory example which has been given by so great a majority of the union 
happy would it be for the unfortunate africans if an equal prospect lay before them of being redeemed from the oppressions of their european brethren attempts have been made to pervert this clause into an objection against the constitution by representing it on one side as a criminal toleration of an illicit practice and on another as calculated to prevent voluntary and beneficial emigrations from europe to america i mention these misconstructions not with a view to give them an answer for they deserve none but as specimens of the manner and spirit in which some have thought fit to conduct their opposition to the proposed government thirty eight attitude of the state conventions the records of the proceedings in the various state conventions are exceedingly meagre in nearly all of the few states where records exist there is found some opposition to the slave trade clause the opposition was seldom very pronounced or bitter it rather took the form of regret on the one hand that the convention went so far and on the other hand that it did not go farther probably however the constitution was never in danger of rejection on account of this clause extracts from a few of the speeches pro and con in various states will best illustrate the character of the arguments in reply to some objections expressed in the pennsylvania convention wilson said december third seventeen eighty seven i consider this as laying the foundation for banishing slavery out of this country and though the period is more distant than i could wish yet it will produce the same kind gradual change which was pursued in pennsylvania robert barnwell declared in the south carolina convention january seventeenth seventeen eighty eight that this clause particularly pleased him congress he said has guaranteed this right for that space of time and at its expiration may continue it as long as they please this question then arises what will their interest lead them to do the eastern states as the honorable gentleman says will become the carriers of america it will therefore certainly be their interest to encourage exportation to as great an extent as possible and if the quantum of our products will be diminished by the prohibition of negroes i appeal to the belief of every man whether he thinks those very carriers will themselves dam up the sources from whence their profit is derived to think so is so contradictory to the general conduct of mankind that i am of the opinion that without we ourselves put a stop to them the traffic for negroes will continue for ever in massachusetts january thirtieth seventeen eighty eight general heath said the gentlemen who have spoken have carried the matter rather too far on both sides i apprehend that it is not in our power to do anything for or against those who are in slavery in the southern states two questions naturally arise if we ratify the constitution shall we do anything by our act to hold the blacks in slavery or shall we become partakers of other men's sins i think neither of them each state is sovereign and independent to a certain degree and they have a right and will regulate their own internal affairs as to themselves appears proper iredale said in the north carolina convention july twenty sixth seventeen eighty eight when the entire abolition of slavery takes place it will be an event which must be pleasing to every generous mind and every friend of human nature but as it is this government is nobly distinguished above others by that very provision of the arguments against the clause two made in the massachusetts convention are typical the rev mr neal said january twenty fifth seventeen eighty eight that unless his objection to this clause was removed he could not put his hand to the constitution general thompson exclaimed shall it be said that after we have established our own independence and freedom we make slaves of others mason in the virginia convention june fifteenth seventeen eighty eight said as much as i value a union of all the states i would not admit the southern states into the union unless they agree to the discontinuance of this disgraceful trade yet they have not secured us the property of the slaves we have already 
so that they have done what they ought not to have done and have left undone what they ought to have done joshua atherton who led the opposition in the new hampshire convention said the idea that strikes those who are opposed to this clause so disagreeably and so forcibly is hereby it is conceived if we ratify the constitution that we become consenters to and partakers in the sin and guilt of this abominable traffic at least for a certain period without any positive stipulation that it shall even then be brought to an end in the south carolina convention lowndes january sixteenth seventeen eighty eight attacked the slave trade clause negroes said he were our wealth our only natural resource yet behold how our kind friends in the north were determined soon to tie up our hands and drain us of what we had the eastern states drew their means of subsistence in a great measure from their shipping and on that head they had been particularly careful not to allow any of the burdens why then call this a reciprocal bargain which took all from one party to bestow it on the other in spite of this discussion in the different states only one state rhode island went so far as to propose an amendment directing congress to promote and establish such laws and regulations as may effectually prevent the importation of slaves of every description into the united states thirty nine acceptance of the policy as in the federal convention so in the state conventions it is noticeable that the compromise was accepted by the various states from widely different motives nevertheless these motives were not fixed and unchangeable and there was still discernible a certain underlying agreement in the dislike of slavery one cannot help thinking that if the devastation of the late war had not left an extraordinary demand for slaves in the south if for instance there had been in seventeen eighty seven the same plethora in the slave market as in seventeen seventy four the future history of the country would have been far different as it was the twenty-one years of laissez-faire were confirmed by the states and the nation entered upon the constitutional period with the slave trade legal in three states and with a feeling of quiescence toward it in the rest of the union End of chapter 6 Chapter 7, Part 1 of The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638-1870, to Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America 1638-1870, by W. E. B. Du Bois. Toussaint Louverture, an Anti-Slavery Effort, 1787-1806, Part 1. 40. Influence of the Haitian Revolution. 41. Legislation of the Southern States. 42. Legislation of the Border States. 43. Legislation of the Eastern States. 44 first debate in congress seventeen eighty nine forty five second debate in congress seventeen ninety forty six the declaration of powers seventeen ninety forty seven the act of seventeen ninety four forty influence of the haitian revolution the role which the great negro toussaint called louverture played in the history of the united states has seldom been fully appreciated representing the age of revolution in america he rose to leadership through a bloody terror which contrived a negro problem for the western hemisphere intensified and defined the anti-slavery movement became one of the causes and probably the prime one which led napoleon to sell louisiana for a song and finally through the interworking of all these effects rendered more certain the final prohibition of the slave trade by the united states in eighteen o seven from the time of the reorganization of the pennsylvania abolition society in seventeen eighty seven anti-slavery sentiment became active new york new jersey rhode island delaware maryland and virginia had strong organizations and a national convention was held in seventeen ninety four 
the terrible upheaval in the west indies beginning in seventeen ninety one furnished this rising movement with an irresistible argument a wave of horror and fear swept over the south which even the powerful slave traders of georgia did not dare withstand the middle states saw their worst dreams realized and the mercenary trade interests of the east lost control of the new england conscience forty one legislation of the southern states in a few years the growing sentiment had crystallized into legislation the southern states took immediate measures to close their ports first against west india negroes finally against all slaves georgia who had had legal slavery only from seventeen fifty five and had since passed no restrictive legislation felt compelled in seventeen ninety three to stop the entry of free negroes and in seventeen ninety eight to prohibit under heavy penalties the importation of all slaves this provision was placed in the constitution of the state and although miserably enforced was never repealed south carolina was the first southern state in which the exigencies of a great staple crop rendered the rapid consumption of slaves more profitable than their proper maintenance alternating therefore between a plethora and a dearth of negroes she prohibited the slave trade only for short periods in seventeen eighty eight she had forbidden the trade for five years and in seventeen ninety two being peculiarly exposed to the west indian insurrection she quickly found it inexpedient to allow negroes from africa the west india islands or other place beyond sea to enter for two years this act continued to be extended although with lessening penalties until eighteen o three the home demand in view of the probable stoppage of the trade in eighteen o eight the speculative chances of the new louisiana territory trade and the large already existing illicit traffic combined in that year to cause the passage of an act december seventeenth reopening the african slave trade although still carefully excluding west india negroes this action profoundly stirred the union aroused anti-slavery sentiment led to a concerted movement for a constitutional amendment and failing in this to an irresistible demand for a national prohibitory act at the earliest constitutional moment north carolina had repealed her prohibitory duty act in seventeen ninety but in seventeen ninety four she passed an act to prevent further importation and bringing of slaves etc even the body servants of west india immigrants and naturally all free negroes were eventually prohibited forty two legislation of the border states the border states virginia and maryland strengthened their non-importation laws virginia freeing illegally imported negroes and maryland prohibiting even the interstate trade the middle states took action chiefly in the final abolition of slavery within their borders and the prevention of the fitting out of slaving vessels in their ports delaware declared in her act of seventeen eighty nine that it is inconsistent with that spirit of general liberty which pervades the constitution of this state that vessels should be fitted out or equipped in any of the ports thereof for the purpose of receiving and transporting the natives of africa to places where they are held in slavery and forbade such a practice under penalty of five hundred pounds for each person so engaged the pennsylvania act of seventeen eighty eight had similar provisions with a penalty of one thousand pounds and new jersey followed with an act in seventeen ninety eight forty three legislation of the eastern states in the eastern states where slavery as an institution was already nearly defunct action was aimed toward stopping the notorious participation of citizens in the slave trade outside the state the prime movers were the rhode island quakers having early secured a law against the traffic in their own state they turned their attention to others through their remonstrances connecticut in seventeen eighty eight prohibited participation in the trade by a fine of five hundred pounds on the vessel fifty pounds on each slave and loss of insurance this act was strengthened in seventeen ninety two the year after the haitian revolt massachusetts after many fruitless attempts finally took advantage of an unusually bold case of kidnapping and passed a similar act in seventeen eighty eight 
this says belknap was the utmost which could be done by our legislatures we still have to regret the impossibility of making a law here which shall restrain our citizens from carrying on this trade in foreign bottoms and from committing the crimes which this act prohibits in foreign countries as it is said some of them have done since the enacting of these laws thus it is seen how spurred by the tragedy in the west indies the united states succeeded by state action in prohibiting the slave trade from seventeen ninety eight to eighteen o three in furthering the cause of abolition and in preventing the fitting out of slave trade expeditions in united states ports the country had good cause to congratulate itself the national government hastened to supplement state action as far as possible and the prophecies of the more sanguine revolutionary fathers seemed about to be realized when the ill-considered act of south carolina showed the weakness of the constitutional compromise forty four first debate in congress seventeen eighty nine the attention of the national government was early directed to slavery and the trade by the rise in the first congress of the question of taxing slaves imported during the debate on the duty bill introduced by clymer's committee parker of virginia moved may thirteenth seventeen eighty nine to lay a tax of ten dollars per capita on slaves imported he plainly stated that the tax was designed to check the trade and that he was sorry that the constitution prevented congress from prohibiting the importation altogether the proposal was evidently unwelcome and caused an extended debate smith of south carolina wanted to postpone a matter so big with the most serious consequences to the state he represented roger sherman of connecticut could not reconcile himself to the insertion of human beings as an article of duty among goods wares and merchandise jackson of georgia argued against any restriction and thought such states as virginia ought to let their neighbors get supplied before they imposed such a burden upon the importation tucker of south carolina declared it unfair to bring in such an important subject at a time when debate was almost precluded and denied the right of congress to consider whether the importation of slaves is proper or not mr parker was evidently somewhat abashed by this onslaught of friend and foe but he had ventured to introduce the subject after full deliberation and did not like to withdraw it he desired congress if possible to wipe off the stigma under which america labored this brought jackson of georgia again to his feet he believed in spite of the fashion of the day that the negroes were better off as slaves than as freedmen and that as the tax was partial it would be the most odious tax congress could impose such sentiments were a distinct advance in pro-slavery doctrine and called for a protest from madison of virginia he thought the discussion proper denied the partiality of the tax and declared that according to the spirit of the constitution and his own desire it was to be hoped that by expressing a national disapprobation of this trade we may destroy it and save ourselves from reproaches and our posterity the imbecility ever attendant on a country filled with slaves finally to burke of south carolina who thought the gentlemen were contending for nothing madison sharply rejoined if we contend for nothing the gentlemen who are opposed to us do not contend for a great deal it now became clear that congress had been whirled into a discussion of too delicate and lengthy a nature to allow its further prolongation compromising counsels prevailed and it was agreed that the present proposition should be withdrawn and a separate bill brought in this bill was however at the next session dexterously postponed until the next session of congress forty five second debate in congress seventeen ninety it is doubtful if congress of its own initiative would soon have resurrected the matter had not a new anti-slavery weapon appeared in the shape of urgent petitions from abolition societies the first petition presented february eleventh seventeen ninety was from the same interstate yearly meeting of friends which had formerly petitioned the confederation congress they urged congress to inquire whether 
notwithstanding such seeming impediments it be not in reality within your power to exercise justice and mercy which if adhered to we cannot doubt must produce the abolition of the slave trade etc another quaker petition from new york was also presented and both were about to be referred when smith of south carolina objected and precipitated a sharp debate this debate had a distinctly different tone from that of the preceding one and represents another step in pro-slavery doctrine the keynote of these utterances was struck by stone of maryland who feared that if congress took any measures indicative of an intention to interfere with the kind of property alluded to it would sink it in value very considerably and might be injurious to a great number of the citizens particularly in the southern states he thought the subject was of general concern and that the petitioners had no more right to interfere with it than any other members of the community it was an unfortunate circumstance that it was the disposition of religious sects to imagine they understood the rights of human nature better than all the world besides in vain did men like madison disclaim all thought of unconstitutional interference and express only a desire to see if anything is within the federal authority to restrain such violation of the rights of nations and of mankind as is supposed to be practised in some parts of the united states a storm of disapproval from southern members met such sentiments the rights of the southern states ought not to be threatened said burke of south carolina any extraordinary attention of congress to this petition of her jackson of georgia would put slave property in jeopardy and evince to the people a disposition towards a total emancipation smith and tucker of south carolina declared that the request asked for unconstitutional measures jerry of massachusetts hartley of pennsylvania and lawrence of new york rather mildly defended the petitioners but after considerable debate the matter was laid on the table the very next day however the laid ghost walked again in the shape of another petition from the pennsylvania society for promoting the abolition of slavery signed by its venerable president benjamin franklin this petition asked congress to step to the very verge of the power vested in you for discouraging every species of traffic in the persons of our fellow-men hartley of pennsylvania called up the memorial of the preceding day and it was read a second time and a motion for commitment made plain words now came from tucker of south carolina the petition he said contained an unconstitutional request the commitment would alarm the south these petitions were mischievous attempts to imbue the slaves with false hopes the south would not submit to a general emancipation without civil war the commitment would blow the trumpet of sedition in the southern states echoed his colleague burke the pennsylvania men spoke just as boldly scott declared the petition constitutional and was sorry that the constitution did not interdict this most abominable traffic perhaps in our legislative capacity he said we can go no further than to impose a duty of ten dollars but i do not know how far i might go if i was one of the judges of the united states and those people were to come before me and claim their emancipation but i am sure i would go as far as i could jackson of georgia rejoined in true southern spirit boldly defending slavery in the light of religion and history and asking if it was good policy to bring forward a business at this moment likely to light up the flame of civil discord for the people of the southern states will resist one tyranny as soon as another the other parts of the continent may bear them down by force of arms but they will never suffer themselves to be divested of their property without a struggle the gentleman says if he was a federal judge he does not know to what length he would go in emancipating these people but i believe his judgment would be of short duration in georgia perhaps even the existence of such a judge might be in danger baldwin his new england-born colleague urged moderation by reciting the difficulty with which the constitutional compromise was reached and declaring the moment we go to jostle on that ground i fear we shall feel it tremble under our feet 
lawrence of new york wanted to commit the memorials in order to see how far congress might constitutionally interfere smith of south carolina in a long speech said that his constituents entered the union from political not from moral motives and that we look upon this measure as an attack upon the palladium of the property of our country page of virginia although a slave owner urged commitment and madison again maintained the appropriateness of the request and suggested that regulations might be made in relation to the introduction of them i e slaves into the new states to be formed out of the western territory even conservative jerry of massachusetts declared with regard to the whole trade that the fact that we have a right to regulate this business is as clear as that we have any rights whatever finally by a vote of forty-three to one the memorials were committed the south carolina and georgia delegations bland and coles of virginia stone of maryland and sylvester of new york voting in the negative a committee consisting of foster of new hampshire huntington of connecticut jerry of massachusetts lawrence of new york sinickson of new jersey hartley of pennsylvania and parker of virginia were charged with the matter and reported friday march fifth the absence of southern members on this committee compelled it to make this report a sort of official manifesto on the aims of northern anti-slavery politics as such it was sure to meet with vehement opposition in the house even though conservatively worded such proved to be the fact when the committee reported the onslaught to negative the whole report was prolonged and bitter the debate pro and con lasting several days forty six the declaration of powers seventeen ninety the result is best seen by comparing the original report with the report of the committee of the whole adopted by a vote of twenty nine to twenty five monday march twenty third seventeen ninety report of the select committee that from the nature of the matters contained in these memorials they were induced to examine the powers vested in congress under the present constitution relating to the abolition of slavery and are clearly of opinion first that the general government is expressly restrained from prohibiting the importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit until the year one thousand eight hundred and eight secondly that congress by a fair construction of the constitution are equally restrained from interfering in the emancipation of slaves who already are or who may within the period mentioned be imported into or born within any of the said states thirdly that congress have no authority to interfere in the internal regulations of particular states relative to the instructions of slaves in the principles of morality and religion to their comfortable clothing accommodations and subsistence to the regulation of their marriages and the prevention of the violation of the rights thereof or to the separation of children from their parents to a comfortable provision in cases of sickness age or infirmity or to the seizure transportation or sale of free negroes but have the fullest confidence in the wisdom and humanity of the legislatures of the several states that they will revise their laws from time to time when necessary and promote the objects mentioned in the memorials and every other measure that may tend to the happiness of slaves fourthly that nevertheless congress have authority if they shall think it necessary to lay at any time a tax or duty not exceeding ten dollars for each person of any description the importation of whom shall be by any of the states admitted as aforesaid fifthly that congress may have authority to interdict or so far as it is or may be carried on by citizens of the united states for supplying foreigners to regulate the african trade and to make provision for the humane treatment of slaves in all cases while on their passage to the united states or to foreign ports so far as respects the citizens of the united states sixthly that congress have also authority to prohibit foreigners from fitting out vessels in any port of the united states for transporting persons from africa to any foreign port seventhly 
that the memorialists be informed that in all cases to which the authority of congress extends they will exercise it for the humane objects of the memorialists so far as they can be promoted on the principles of justice humanity and good policy report of the committee of the whole first that the migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit cannot be prohibited by congress prior to the year one thousand eight hundred and eight secondly that congress have no authority to interfere in the emancipation of slaves or in the treatment of them within any of the states it remaining with the several states alone to provide any regulation therein which humanity and true policy may require thirdly the congress have authority to restrain the citizens of the united states from carrying on the african trade for the purpose of supplying foreigners with slaves and of providing by proper regulations for the humane treatment during their passage of slaves imported by the said citizens into the states admitting such importation fourthly that congress have authority to prohibit foreigners from fitting out vessels in any port of the united states for transporting persons from africa to any foreign port forty seven the act of seventeen ninety four this declaration of the powers of the central government over the slave trade bore early fruit in the second congress in the shape of a shower of petitions from abolition societies in massachusetts rhode island connecticut new york pennsylvania maryland and virginia in some of these slavery was denounced as an outrageous violation of one of the most essential rights of human nature and the slave trade as a traffic degrading to the rights of man and repugnant to reason others declared the trade injurious to the true commercial interest of a nation and asked congress that having taken up the matter they do all in their power to limit the trade congress was however determined to avoid as long as possible so unpleasant a matter and save an angry attempt to censure a quaker petitioner nothing was heard of the slave trade until the third congress meantime news came from the seas southeast of carolina and georgia which influenced congress more powerfully than humanitarian arguments had done the wild revolt of despised slaves the rise of a noble black leader and the birth of a new nation of negro freemen frightened the pro-slavery advocates and armed the anti-slavery agitation as a result a quaker petition for a law against the transport traffic in slaves was received without a murmur in seventeen ninety four and on march twenty second the first national act against the slave trade became a law it was designed to prohibit the carrying on the slave trade from the united states to any foreign place or country or the fitting out of slavers in the united states for that country the penalties for violation were forfeiture of the ship a fine of one thousand dollars for each person engaged and of two hundred dollars for each slave transported if the quakers thought this a triumph of anti-slavery sentiment they were quickly undeceived congress might willingly restrain the country from feeding west indian turbulence and yet be furious at a petition like that of seventeen ninety seven calling attention to the oppressed state of our brethren of the african race in this country and to the interstate slave trade considering the present extraordinary state of the west india islands and of europe young john rutledge insisted that sufficient for the day is the evil thereof and that they ought to shut their door against anything which had a tendency to produce the like confusion in this country after excited debate and some investigation by a special committee the petition was ordered in both senate and house to be withdrawn End of chapter seven part one chapter seven part two of the suppression of the african slave trade to the united states of america sixteen thirty eight to eighteen seventy volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. the suppression of the african slave trade to the united states of america sixteen thirty eight to eighteen seventy by w e b du bois 
toussaint louverture an anti-slavery effort seventeen eighty seven to eighteen o seven part two forty eight the act of eighteen hundred forty nine the act of eighteen o three fifty state of the slave trade from seventeen eighty nine to eighteen o three fifty one the south carolina repeal of eighteen o three fifty two the louisiana slave trade eighteen o three to eighteen o five fifty three last attempts at taxation eighteen o five to eighteen o six fifty four keynotes of the period forty eight the act of eighteen hundred in the next congress the sixth another petition threw the house into paroxysms of slavery debate wald of pennsylvania presented the petition of certain free colored men of pennsylvania praying for a revision of the slave trade laws and of the fugitive slave law and for prospective emancipation wald moved the reference of this memorial to a committee already appointed on the revision of the loosely drawn and poorly enforced act of seventeen ninety four rutledge of south carolina immediately arose he opposed the motion saying that these petitions were continually coming in and stirring up discord that it was a good thing the negroes were in slavery and that already too much of this new-fangled french philosophy of liberty and equality had found its way among them others defended the right of petition and declared that none wished congress to exceed its powers brown of rhode island a new figure in congress a man of distinguished services and from a well-known family boldly set forth the commercial philosophy of his state we want money said he we want a navy we ought therefore to use the means to obtain it we ought to go farther than has yet been proposed and repeal the bills in question altogether for why should we see great britain getting all the slave trade to themselves why may not our country be enriched by that lucrative traffic there would not be a slave the more sold but we should derive the benefits from importing from africa as well as that nation Walne, in reply contended that they should look into the slave trade much of which was still carrying on from rhode island boston and pennsylvania hill of north carolina called the house back from this general discussion to the petition in question and while willing to remedy any existing defect in the act of seventeen ninety four hoped that the petition would not be received dana of connecticut declared that the paper contained nothing but a farrago of the french metaphysics of liberty and equality and that it was likely to produce some of the dreadful scenes of st domingo the next day rutledge again warned the house against even discussing the matter as very serious nay dreadful effects must be the inevitable consequence he held up the most lurid pictures of the fatuity of the french convention in listening to the overtures of the three emissaries from st domingo and thus yielding one of the finest islands in the world to scenes which had never been practised since the destruction of carthage but sir he continued we have lived to see these dreadful scenes these horrid effects have succeeded what was conceived once to be trifling most important consequences may be the result although gentlemen little apprehended but we know the situation of things there although they do not and knowing we deprecate it there must have been emissaries amongst us in the southern states they have begun their war upon us an actual organization has commenced we have had them meeting in their club rooms and debating on that subject sir i do believe that persons have been sent from france to feel the pulse of this country to know whether these i e the negroes are the proper engines to make use of these people have been talked to they have been tampered with and this is going on finally after censuring certain parts of this negro petition congress committed the part on the slave trade to the committee already appointed meantime the senate sent down a bill to amend the act of seventeen ninety four and the house took this bill under consideration prolonged debate ensued brown of rhode island again made a most elaborate plea for throwing open the foreign slave trade 
negroes he said bettered their condition by being enslaved and thus it was morally wrong and commercially indefensible to impose a heavy fine and imprisonment for carrying on a trade so advantageous or if the trade must be stopped then equalize the matter and abolish slavery too nichols of virginia thought that surely the gentlemen would not advise the importation of more negroes for while it was a fact to be sure that they would thus improve their condition would it be policy to do so bayard of delaware said that a more dishonorable item of revenue than that derived from the slave trade could not be established rutledge opposed the new bill as defective and impracticable the former act he said was enough the states had stopped the trade and in addition the united states had sought to placate philanthropists by stopping the use of our ships in the trade this was going very far indeed new england first began the trade and why not let them enjoy its profits now as well as the english the trade could not be stopped the bill was eventually recommitted and reported again on the question for its passing a long and warm debate ensued and several attempts to postpone it were made it finally passed however only brown of rhode island dent of maryland rutledge and huger of south carolina and dixon of north carolina voting against it and sixty seven voting for it this act of may tenth eighteen hundred greatly strengthened the act of seventeen ninety four the earlier act had prohibited citizens from equipping slavers for the foreign trade but this went so far as to forbid them having any interest direct or indirect in such voyages or serving on board slave ships in any capacity imprisonment for two years was added to the former fine of two thousand dollars and united states commissioned ships were directed to capture such slavers as prizes the slaves though forfeited by the owner were not to go to the captor and the act omitted to say what disposition should be made of them forty nine the act of eighteen o three the haitian revolt having been among the main causes of two laws soon was the direct instigation to a third the frightened feeling in the south when freedmen from the west indies began to arrive in various ports may well be imagined on january seventeenth eighteen o three the town of wilmington north carolina hastily memorialized congress stating the arrival of certain freed negroes from guadalupe and apprehending much danger to the peace and safety of the people of the southern states of the union from the admission of persons of that description into the united states the house committee which considered this petition hastened to agree that system of policy stated in the said memorial to exist and to be now pursued in the french colonial government of the west indies is fraught with danger to the peace and safety of the united states that the facts stated to have occurred in the prosecution of that system of policy demands the prompt interference of the government of the united states as well legislative as executive the result was a bill providing for the forfeiture of any ship which should bring into the states prohibiting the same any negro mulatto or other person of color the captain of the ship was also to be punished after some opposition the bill became a law february twenty eighth eighteen o three fifty state of the slave trade from seventeen eighty nine to eighteen o three meantime in spite of the prohibitory state laws the african slave trade to the united states continued to flourish it was notorious that new england traders carried on a large traffic members stated on the floor of the house that it was much to be regretted that the severe and pointed statute against the slave trade had been so little regarded in defiance of its forbiddance and its penalties it was well known that citizens and vessels of the united states were still engaged in that traffic in various parts of the nation outfits were made for slave voyages without secrecy shame or apprehension countenanced by their fellow-citizens at home who were as ready to buy as they themselves were to collect and to bring to market 
they approached our southern harbors and inlets and clandestinely disembarked the sooty offspring of the eastern upon the ill-fated soil of the western hemisphere in this way it had been computed that during the last twelve months twenty thousand enslaved negroes had been transported from guinea and by smuggling added to the plantation stock of georgia and south carolina so little respect seems to have been paid to the existing prohibitory statute that it may almost be considered as disregarded by common consent these voyages were generally made under the flag of a foreign nation and often the vessel was sold in a foreign port to escape confiscation south carolina's own congressmen confessed that although the state had prohibited the trade since seventeen eighty eight she was unable to enforce her laws with navigable rivers running into the heart of it said he it was impossible with our means to prevent our eastern brethren who in some parts of the union in defiance of the authority of the general government have been engaged in this trade from introducing them into the country the law was completely evaded and for the last year or two eighteen o two three africans were introduced into the country in numbers little short i believe of what they would have been had the trade been a legal one the same tale undoubtedly might have been told of georgia fifty one the south carolina repeal of eighteen o three this vast and apparently irrepressible illicit traffic was one of three causes which led south carolina december seventeenth eighteen o three to throw aside all pretense and legalize her growing slave trade the other two causes were the growing certainty of total prohibition of the traffic in eighteen o eight and the recent purchase of louisiana by the united states with its vast prospective demand for slave labor such a combination of advantages which meant fortunes to planters and charleston slave merchants could no longer be withheld from them the prohibition was repealed and the united states became again for the first time in at least five years a legal slave mart this action shocked the nation frightening southern states with visions of an influx of untrained barbarians and servile insurrections and arousing and intensifying the anti-slavery feeling of the north which had long since come to think of the trade so far as legal enactment went as a thing of the past scarcely a month after this repeal bard of pennsylvania solemnly addressed congress on the matter for many reasons said he this house must have been justly surprised by a recent measure of one of the southern states the impressions however which that measure gave my mind were deep and painful had i been informed that some formidable foreign power had invaded our country i would not i ought not be more alarmed than on hearing that south carolina had repealed her law prohibiting the importation of slaves our hands are tied and we are obliged to stand confounded while we see the floodgate opened and pouring incalculable miseries into our country he then moved as the utmost legal measure a tax of ten dollars per head on slaves imported debate on this proposition did not occur until february fourteenth when lowndes explained the circumstance of the repeal and a long controversy took place those in favor of the tax argued that the trade was wrong and that the tax would serve as some slight check the tax was not inequitable for if a state did not wish to bear it she had only to prohibit the trade the tax would add to the revenue and be at the same time a moral protest against an unjust and dangerous traffic against this it was argued that if the tax furnished a revenue it would defeat its own object and make prohibition more difficult in eighteen o eight it was inequitable because it was aimed against one state and would fall exclusively on agriculture it would give national sanction to the trade it would look like an attempt in the general government to correct a state for the undisputed exercise of its constitutional powers the revenue would be inconsiderable and the united states had nothing to do with the moral principle 
while a prohibitory tax would be defensible a small tax like this would be useless as a protection and criminal as a revenue measure the whole debate hinged on the expediency of the measure few defending south carolina's action finally a bill was ordered to be brought in which was done on the seventeenth another long debate took place covering substantially the same ground it was several times hinted that if the matter were dropped south carolina might again prohibit the trade this and the vehement opposition at last resulted in the postponement of the bill and it was not heard from again during the session fifty two the louisiana slave trade eighteen o three to eighteen o five about this time the session of louisiana brought before congress the question of the status of slavery and the slave trade in the territories twice or thrice before had the subject called for attention the first time was in the congress of the confederation when by the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven both slavery and the slave trade were excluded from the northwest territory in seventeen ninety congress had accepted the cession of north carolina back lands on the express condition that slavery there be undisturbed nothing had been said as to slavery in the south carolina cession seventeen eighty seven but it was tacitly understood that the provision of the northwest ordinance would not be applied in seventeen ninety eight the bill introduced for the session of mississippi contained a specific declaration that the anti-slavery clause of seventeen eighty seven should not be included the bill passed the senate but caused long and excited debate in the house it was argued on the one hand that the case in mississippi was different from that in the northwest territory because slavery was a legal institution in all the surrounding country and to prohibit the institution was virtually to prohibit the settling of the country on the other hand gallatin declared that if this amendment should not obtain he knew not how slaves could be prevented from being introduced by way of new orleans by persons who are not citizens of the united states it was moved to strike out the accepting clause but the motion received only twelve votes an apparent indication that congress either did not appreciate the great precedent it was establishing or was reprehensibly careless harper of south carolina then succeeded in building up the charleston slave trade interest by a section forbidding the slave traffic from without the limits of the united states thatcher moved to strike out the last clause of this amendment and thus prohibit the interstate trade but he failed to get a second thus the act passed punishing the introduction of slaves from without the country by a fine of three hundred dollars for each slave and freeing the slave in eighteen o four president jefferson communicated papers to congress on the status of slavery and the slave trade in louisiana the spanish had allowed the traffic by edict in seventeen ninety three france had not stopped it and governor claiborne had refrained from interference a bill erecting a territorial government was already pending the northern district of louisiana was placed under the jurisdiction of indiana territory and was made subject to the provisions of the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven various attempts were made to amend the part of the bill referring to the southern territory first so as completely to prohibit the slave trade then to compel the emancipation at a certain age of all those imported next to confine all importation to that from the states and finally to limit it further to slaves imported before south carolina opened her ports the last two amendments prevailed and the final act also extended to the territory the acts of seventeen ninety four and eighteen o three only slaves imported before may first seventeen ninety eight could be introduced and those must be slaves of actual settlers all slaves illegally imported were freed this stringent act was limited to one year the next year in accordance with the urgent petition of the inhabitants a bill was introduced against these restrictions by dexterous wording this bill which became a law march second eighteen o five 
swept away all restrictions upon the slave trade except that relating to foreign ports and left even this provision so ambiguous that later by judicial interpretation of the law the foreign slave trade was allowed at least for a time such a stream of slaves now poured into the new territory that the following year a committee on the matter was appointed by the house the committee reported that they are in possession of the fact that african slaves lately imported into charleston have been thence conveyed into the territory of orleans and in their opinion this practice will be continued to a very great extent while there is no law to prevent it the house ordered a bill checking this to be prepared and such a bill was reported but was soon dropped importations into south carolina during this time reached enormous proportions senator smith of that state declared from official returns that between eighteen o three and eighteen o seven thirty nine thousand seventy five negroes were imported into charleston most of whom went to the territories fifty three last attempts at taxation eighteen o five eighteen o six so alarming did the trade become that north carolina passed a resolution in december eighteen o four proposing that the states give congress power to prohibit the trade massachusetts vermont new hampshire and maryland responded and a joint resolution was introduced in the house proposing as an amendment to the constitution that the congress of the united states shall have power to prevent the further importation of slaves into the united states and the territories thereof nothing came of this effort but meantime the project of taxation was revived a motion to this effect made in february eighteen o five was referred to a committee of the whole but was not discussed early in the first session of the ninth congress the motion of eighteen o five was renewed and although again postponed on the assurance that south carolina was about to stop the trade it finally came up for debate january twentieth eighteen o six then occurred a most stubborn legislative battle which lasted during the whole session several amendments to the motion were first introduced so as to make it apply to all immigrants and again to all persons of color as in the former debate it was proposed to substitute a resolution of censure on south carolina all these amendments were lost a long debate on the expediency of the measure followed on the old grounds early of georgia dwelt especially on the double taxation it would impose on georgia others estimated that a revenue of one hundred thousand dollars might be derived from the tax a sum sufficient to replace the tax on pepper and medicines angry charges and countercharges were made e g that georgia though ashamed openly to avow the trade participated in it as well as south carolina some recriminations ensued between several members on the participation of the traders of some of the new england states in carrying on the slave trade finally january twenty second by a vote of ninety to twenty five a tax bill was ordered to be brought in one was reported on the twenty seventh every sort of opposition was resorted to on the one hand attempts were made to amend it so as to prohibit importation after eighteen o seven and to prevent importation into the territories on the other hand attempts were made to recommit and postpone the measure it finally got a third reading but was recommitted to a select committee and disappeared until february fourteenth being then amended so as to provide for the forfeiture of smuggled cargoes but saying nothing as to the disposition of the slaves it was again relegated to a committee after a vote of sixty nine to forty two against postponement on march fourth it appeared again and a motion to reject it was lost finally in the midst of the war scare and the question of non-importation of british goods the bill was apparently forgotten and the last attempt to tax imported slaves ended like the others in failure fifty four keynote of the period one of the last acts of this period strikes again the keynote which sounded throughout the whole of it 
on february twentieth eighteen o six after considerable opposition a bill to prohibit trade with san domingo passed the senate in the house it was charged by one side that the measure was dictated by france and by the other that it originated in the fear of countenancing negro insurrection the bill however became a law and by continuations remained on the statute books until eighteen o nine even at that distance the nightmare of the haitian insurrection continued to haunt the south and a proposal to reopen trade with the island caused wild john randolph to point out the dreadful evil of a direct trade betwixt the town of charleston and the ports of the island of st domingo of the twenty years from seventeen eighty seven to eighteen o seven it can only be said that they were on the whole a period of disappointment so far as the suppression of the slave trade was concerned fear interest and philanthropy united for a time in an effort which bade fair to suppress the trade then the real weakness of the constitutional compromise appeared and the interests of the few overcame the fears and the humanity of the many End of chapter seven part two chapter eight of the suppression of the african slave trade to the united states of america sixteen thirty eight to eighteen seventy part one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lawrence trask mount vernon ohio interface audio dot com the suppression of the african slave trade to the united states of america sixteen thirty eight to eighteen seventy by w e b du bois chapter eight the period of attempted suppression eighteen o seven to eighteen twenty five fifty five the act of eighteen o seven fifty six the first question how shall illegally imported africans be disposed of fifty seven the second question how shall violations be punished fifty eight the third question how shall the interstate coastwise slave trade be protected fifty six legislative history of the bill sixty enforcement of the act sixty one evidence of the continuance of the trade sixty two apathy of the federal government sixty three typical cases sixty four the supplementary acts eighteen eighteen to eighteen twenty sixty five the enforcement of the supplementary acts eighteen eighteen to eighteen twenty five fifty five the act of eighteen o seven the first great goal of anti-slavery effort in the united states had been since the revolution the suppression of the slave trade by national law it would hardly be too much to say that the haitian revolution in addition to its influence in the years from seventeen ninety one to eighteen o six was one of the main causes that rendered the accomplishment of this aim possible at the earliest constitutional moment to the great influence of the fears of the south was added the failure of the french designs on louisiana of which to saint louverture was the most probable cause the cessation of louisiana in eighteen o three challenged and aroused the north on the slavery question again put the carolina and georgia slave traders in the saddle to the dismay of the border states and brought the whole slave trade question vividly before the public conscience another scarcely less potent influence was naturally the great anti-slavery movement in england which after a mighty struggle of eighteen years was about to gain its first victory in the british act of eighteen o seven president jefferson in his pacificatory message of december second eighteen o six said i congratulate you fellow-citizens on the approach of the period at which you may interpose your authority constitutionally to withdraw the citizens of the united states from all further participation in those violations of human rights which have been so long continued on the unoffended inhabitants of africa 
and which the morality the reputation and the best interests of our country have long been eager to proscribe although no law you may pass may take prohibitory effect till the first day of the year one thousand eight hundred and eight yet the intervening period is not too long to prevent by timely notice expeditions which cannot be completed before that day in pursuance of this recommendation the very next day senator bradley of vermont introduced into the senate a bill after a complicated legislative history became the act of march second eighteen o seven prohibiting the african slave trade three main questions were to be settled by this bill first and most prominent that of the disposal of illegally imported africans second that of the punishment of those concerned in the importation third that of the proper limitation of the interstate traffic by water the character of the debate on these three questions as well as the state of public opinion is illustrated by the fact that forty of the sixty pages of officially reported debates are devoted to the first question less than twenty to the second and only two to the third a sad commentary on the previous enforcement of state and national laws is the readiness with which it was admitted that wholesale violations of the law would take place indeed southern men declared that no strict law against the slave trade could be executed in the south and that it was only by the playing on the motives of personal interest that the trade could be checked the question of punishment indicated the slowly changing moral attitude of the south toward the slave system early boldly said a large majority of people in the southern states do not consider slavery as even an evil the south in fact insisted on regarding man-stealing as a minor offense a misdemeanor rather than a crime finally in the short and sharp debate on the interstate coastwise trade the growing economic side of the slavery question came to the front the vested interests argument was squarely put and the future interstate trade almost consciously provided for from these considerations it is doubtful as to how far it was expected that the act of eighteen o seven would check the slave traffic at any rate so far as the south was concerned there seemed to be an evident desire to limit the trade but little thought that this statute would definitely suppress it fifty six the first question how shall illegally imported africans be disposed of the dozen or more propositions on the question of the disposal of illegally imported africans may be divided into two chief heads representing two radically opposed parties one that illegally imported africans be free although they might be indentured for a term of years or removed from the country two that such africans be sold as slaves the arguments on these two propositions which were many and far-reaching may be roughly divided into three classes political constitutional and moral the political argument reduced to its lowest terms ran thus those wishing to free the negroes illegally imported declared that to enslave them would be to perpetrate the very evil which the law was designed to stop by the same law they said we condemn the man-stealer and become the receivers of his stolen goods we punish the criminal and then step into his place and complete the crime they said that the objection to free negroes was no valid excuse for if the southern people really feared this class they would consent to the imposing of such penalties on illicit traffic as would stop the importation of a single slave moreover forfeiture and sale of the negroes implied a property right for them which did not exist waiving this technical point and allowing them to be forfeited to the government then the government should either immediately set them free or at the most indenture them for a term of years otherwise the law would be an encouragement to violators it certainly will be said they if the importer can find means to evade the penalty of the act for there he has all the advantage of a market enhanced by our ineffectual attempt to prohibit 
they claim that even the indenturing of the ignorant barbarian for life was better than slavery and sloan declared that the northern states would receive the freed negroes willingly rather than having them enslaved the argument of those who insisted that the negroes should be sold was tersely put by macon in adopting our measures on this subject we must pass such a law as can be executed early expanded this it is a principle in legislation as correct as any which has ever prevailed that to give effect to laws you must not make them repugnant to the passions and wishes of the people among whom they are to operate how then in this instance stands the fact do not gentlemen from every quarter of the union prove on the discussion of every question that has ever arisen in the house having the most remote bearing on the given freedom to the africans in the bosom of our country that it has excited the deepest sensibility in the breasts of those where slavery exists and why is this so it is because those who from experience know the extent of the evil believe that the most formidable aspect in which it can present itself is by making these people free among them yes sir though slavery is an evil regretted by every man in the country to have among us in any considerable quantity persons of this description is an evil far greater than slavery itself does any gentleman want proof of this i answer that all proof is useless no fact can be more notorious with this belief on the minds of the people where slavery exists and where the importation will take place if at all we are about to turn loose in a state of freedom all persons brought in after the passage of this law i ask gentlemen to reflect and say whether such a law opposed to the ideas the passions the views and the affections of the people of the southern states can be executed i tell them no it is impossible why because no man will inform why because to inform will be to lead to an evil which will be deemed greater than the offense of which information is given because it will be opposed to the principle of self-preservation and to the love of family no no man will be disposed to jeopard his life and the lives of his countrymen and if no one dare inform the whole authority of the government cannot carry the law into effect the whole people will rise up against it why because to enforce it would be to turn loose in the bosom of the country firebrands that would consume them this was the more tragic form of the argument it also had a mercenary side which was presented with equal emphasis it was repeatedly said that the only way to enforce the law was to play off individual interests against each other the profit from the sale of illegally imported negroes was declared to be the only sufficient inducement to give information of their importation give up the idea of forfeiture and i shall challenge the gentlemen to invent fines penalties or punishments of any sort sufficient to restrain the slave trade if such negroes be freed i tell you that slaves will continue to be imported as heretofore you cannot get hold of the ships employed in this traffic besides slaves will be brought into georgia from east florida they will be brought into the mississippi territory from the bay of mobile you cannot inflict any other penalty or devise any other adequate means of prevention than a forfeiture of the africans in whose possession they may be found after importation then too when foreigners smuggled in negroes who then could be operated on but the purchasers there was the rub it was their interest alone which by being operated on would produce a check snap their purse strings break open their strong box deprive them of their slaves and by destroying the temptation to buy you put an end to the trade nothing short of a forfeiture of the slave would afford an effectual remedy again it was argued that it was impossible to prevent imported negroes from becoming slaves or what was just as bad from being sold as vagabonds or indentured for life even our own laws it was said recognize the title of the african slave factor in the transported negroes 
and if the importer have no title why do we legislate why not let the african immigrant alone get on as he may if he should be returned to africa his home could not be found and he would in all probability be sold into slavery again the constitutional argument was not urged as seriously as the foregoing but it had a considerable place on the one hand it was urged that if the negroes were forfeited they were forfeited to the united states government which could dispose of them as it saw fit on the other hand it was said that the united states as owner was subject to state laws and could not free the negroes contrary to such laws some allege that the freeing of such negroes struck at the title to all slave property others thought that as property in slaves was not recognized in the constitution it could not be in a statute the question also arose as to the source of the power of congress over the slave trade southern men derived it from the clause on the commerce and declared that it exceeded the power of congress to declare negroes imported into a slave state free against the laws of that state that congress could not determine what should or should not be property in a state northern men replied that according to this principle forfeiture and sale in massachusetts would be illegal that the power of congress over the trade was derived from the restraining clause as a non-existent power could not be restrained and that the united states could act under her general powers as executor of the law of nations the moral argument as to the disposal of illegally imported negroes was interlarded with all the others on the one side it began with the rights of man and descended to a stickling for the decent appearance of a statute book on the other side it began with the uplifting of the heathen and descended to a denial of the applicability of moral principles to the question said holland of north carolina it is admitted that the condition of the slaves in the southern state is much superior to that of those in africa who then will say that the trade is immoral but in fact morality has nothing to do with this traffic for as joseph clay declared it must appear to every man of common sense that the question could be considered in a commercial point of view only the other side declared that by the laws of god and man these captured negroes are entitled to their freedom as clearly and absolutely as we are nevertheless some were willing to leave them to the tender mercies of the slave states so long as the statute book was disgraced by no explicit recognition of slavery such arguments brought some sharp sarcasm on those who seemed anxious to legislate for the honor and glory of the statute book some desired to know what honor you will derive from a law that will be broken every day of your lives they would rather boldly sell the negroes and turn the proceeds over to charity the final settlement of the question was as follows section four and neither the importer nor any person or persons claiming from or under him shall hold any right or title whatsoever to any negro mulatto or person of color nor the service of labor thereof who may be imported or brought within the united states or territories thereof in violation of this law but the same shall remain subject to any regulations not contravening the provisions of this act which the legislatures of the several states or territories at any time hereafter may make for disposing of any such negro mulatto or person of color fifty seven the second question how shall violations be punished the next point in importance was that of the punishment of offenders the half dozen specific propositions reduced themselves to two one a violation should be considered a crime or felony and be punished by death two a violation should be considered a misdemeanor and punished by fine and imprisonment advocates of the severer punishment dwelt on the enormity of the offense it was one of the highest crimes man could commit and a captain of a ship engaged in this traffic was guilty of murder 
the law of God punished the crime with death, and any one would rather be hanged than be enslaved. It was a peculiarly deliberate crime, in which the offender did not act in sudden passion, but had ample time for reflection. Then, too, crimes of much less magnitude are punished with death. Shall we punish the stealer of fifty dollars with death, and the man-stealer with imprisonment only? Piracy, forgery, and the fraudulent sinking of vessels are punishable with death, yet these crimes only against property, whereas the importation of slaves, a crime committed against the liberty of man, and inferior only to murder or treason, is accounted nothing but a misdemeanor. Here, indeed, lies the remedy for the evil of freeing illegally imported Negroes, in making the penalty so severe that none will be brought in. If the South is sincere, they will unite to a man to execute the law. To free such Negroes is dangerous, to enslave them wrong, to return them impracticable, to indenture them difficult. Therefore, by a death penalty, keep them from being imported. Here the East had a chance to throw back the taunts of the South, by urging the South to unite with them in hanging the New England slave traders, assuring the South that so far from charging their Southern brethren with cruelty or severity in hanging them, they would acknowledge the favor with gratitude. Finally, if the Southerners would refuse to execute so severe a law they did not consider the offense great, they would probably refuse to execute any law at all for the same reason. The opposition answered that the death penalty was more than proportionate to the crime, and therefore immoral. I cannot believe, said Stanton of Rhode Island, that a man ought to be hung for only stealing a negro. It was argued that the trade was, after all, but a transfer from one master to another, that slavery was worse than the slave trade and the South did not consider slavery a crime. How could it then punish the trade so severely, and not reflect on the institution? Severity, it was said, was also inexpedient. Severity often increases crime. If the punishment is too great, people will sympathize with offenders, and will not inform against them. Said Mr. Mosley, when the penalty is excessive or disproportioned to the offense, it will naturally create a repugnance to the law, and render its execution odious. John Randolph argued against even fine and imprisonment, on the ground that such an excessive penalty could not, in such case, be constitutionally imposed by a government possessed of the limited powers of the government of the United States. The bill as passed punished infractions as follows. For equipping a slaver, a fine of twenty thousand dollars and forfeiture of the ship. For transporting Negroes, a fine of five thousand dollars and forfeiture of the ship and Negroes. For transporting and selling Negroes, a fine of one thousand to ten thousand dollars. Imprisonment from five to ten years, and forfeiture of the ship and Negroes. For knowingly buying illegally imported Negroes, a fine of $800 for each Negro, and forfeiture. How shall the interstate coastwise slave trade be protected? The first proposition was to prohibit the coastwise slave trade altogether, but an amendment reported to the House allowed it in any vessel or species of craft whatever. It is probable that the first proposition would have prevailed, had it not been for the vehement opposition of Randolph and Early. They probably foresaw the value which Virginia would derive from this trade in the future, and consequently Randolph violently declared that if the amendment did not prevail, the southern people would set the law at defiance. He would begin the example. He maintained by the first proposition the proprietor of sacred and chartered rights is prevented the constitutional use of his property. The conference committee finally arranged a compromise, forbidding the coastwise trade for purposes of sale in vessels under forty tons. This did not suit Early, who declared that the law with this provision would not prevent the introduction of a single slave. Randolph, too, would rather lose the bill. He had rather lose all the bills of the session. 
he had rather lose every bill passed since the establishment of the government than agree to the provision contained in this slave bill he predicted the severance of the slave and free states if disunion should ever come congress was however weary with the dragging of the bill and it passed both houses with the compromise provision randolph was so dissatisfied that he had a committee appointed the next day and introduced an amendatory bill both this bill and another similar one introduced at the next session failed of consideration fifty nine legislative history of the bill on december twelfth eighteen o five senator stephen r bradley of vermont gave notice of a bill to prohibit the introduction of slaves after eighteen o eight by a vote of eighteen to nine leave was given and the bill read a first time on the seventeenth on the eighteenth however it was postponed until the first monday in december eighteen o six the presidential message mentioning the matter senator bradley december third eighteen o six gave notice of a similar bill which was brought in on the eighth and on the ninth referred to a committee consisting of bradley stone giles gaillard and baldwin this bill passed after some consideration january twenty seventh it provided among other things that violations of the act should be felony punishable with death and forbade the interstate coast trade meantime in the house mr bidwell of massachusetts had proposed february fourth eighteen o six as an amendment to a bill taxing slaves imported that importation after december thirty first eighteen o seven be prohibited on pain of fine and imprisonment and forfeiture of ship this was rejected by a vote of eighty six to seventeen on december third eighteen o six the house in appointing committees on the message ordered that mr early mr thomas m randolph mr john campbell mr keenan mr cook mr kelly and mr van rensselaer be appointed a committee on the slave trade this committee reported a bill on the fifteenth which was considered but finally december eighteenth recommitted it was reported in an amended form on the nineteenth and amended in committee of the whole so as to make violation a misdemeanor punishable by fine and imprisonment instead of a felony punishable by death a struggle over the disposal of the cargo then ensued a motion by bidwell to accept the cargo from forfeiture was lost seventy seven to thirty nine another motion by bidwell may be considered the crucial vote on the whole bill it was an amendment to the forfeiture clause and read provided that no person shall be sold as a slave by virtue of this act this resulted in a tie vote sixty to sixty but the casting vote of the speaker macon of north carolina defeated it new england voted solidly in favor of it the middle states stood four four and two against it and the six southern states stood solid against it on january eighth the bill went again to a select committee of seventeen by a vote of seventy six to forty six the bill was reported back amended january twentieth and on the twenty eighth the senate bill was also presented to the house on the ninth tenth and eleventh of february both bills were considered in committee of the whole and the senate bill finally replaced the house bill after several amendments had been made the bill was then passed by a vote of one thirteen to five the senate agreed to the amendments including that substituting fine and imprisonment for the death penalty but asked for a conference on the provision which left the interstate coast trade free the six conferees succeeded in bringing the houses to agree by limiting the trade to vessels over forty tons and requiring registry of the slaves the following diagram shows in graphic form the legislative history of the act bradley gives notice december twelfth eighteen o five leave given bill read december seventeenth eighteen o five postponed one year december eighteenth eighteen o five eighteen o six february fourth bidwell's amendment notice december third committee on slave trade 
Bill introduced, December 8th. Committed, December 9th. Reported, December 15th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 23rd, 29th, and 31st. 1807, January 5th, 7th, 8th, read third time, recommitted. Reported, January 15th, 16th, 20th, reported, amended. Third reading, January 26th. Passed the 27th. The 28th Senate bill reported. February 9th, 10th, 11th Senate bill amended. February 12th, February 13th reported from House and passed. Reported to House the 17th, reported back. February 18th, House insists, asks conference. House asks conference, 2 to 5, conference report adopted. Conference report adopted, 2 to 6, bill enrolled to 8, March 2nd, signed by the President. To February 5th, conference report adopted. February 6th, conference report adopted. Bill enrolled February 8th, March 2nd, signed by the President. The bill received the approval of President Jefferson, March 2nd, 1807, and became thus the act to prohibit the importation of slaves into any port or place within the jurisdiction of the United States, from and after the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1808. The debates in the Senate were not reported. Those in the House were prolonged and bitter, and hinged especially on the disposal of the slaves, the punishment of offenders, and the coast trade. Men were continually changing their votes, and the bill seesawed backward and forward, in committee and out, until the House was thoroughly worn out. On the whole, the strong anti-slavery men, like Bidwell and Sloan, were outgeneraled by the Southerners, like Early and Williams, and considering the immense moral backing of the anti-slavery party, from the Revolutionary Fathers down, the Bill of 1807 can hardly be regarded as a great anti-slavery victory. 60. Enforcement of the Act the period so confidently looked forward to by the Constitutional Fathers had at last arrived. The slave trade was prohibited, and much oratory and poetry were expended in celebration of the event. In the face of this, let us see how the Act of 1807 was enforced, and what it really accomplished. It is noticeable, in the first place, that there was no special set of machinery provided for the enforcement of this Act. The work fell first to the Secretary of the Treasury, as head of the Customs Collection. Then, through the activity of cruisers, the Secretary of the Navy gradually came to have oversight, and eventually the whole matter was lodged with him, although the Departments of State and War were more or less active on different occasions. Later, at the advent of the Lincoln government, the Department of the Interior was charged with the enforcement of the slave trade laws. It would indeed be surprising if, amid so much uncertainty and shifting of responsibility, the law were not poorly enforced. Poor enforcement, moreover, in the years 1808 to 1820, meant far more than at almost any other period. For these years were, all over the European world, a time of stirring economic change, and the set which forces might then take would in a later period be unchangeable without a cataclysm. Perhaps from 1808 to 1814, in the midst of agitation and war, there was some excuse for carelessness. From 1814 on, however, no such palliation existed, and the law was probably enforced as the people who made it wished it enforced. Most of the southern states rather tardily passed the necessary supplementary acts disposing of illegally imported Africans. A few appear not to have passed any. Some of these laws, like the Alabama-Mississippi Territory Act of 1815, directed such Negroes to be sold by the proper officer of the court to the highest bidder at public auction for ready money. One half the proceeds went to the informer or to the collector of customs, the other half to the public treasury. Other acts, like that of North Carolina in 1816, directed the Negroes to be sold and disposed of for the use of the state. 
one-fifth of the proceeds went to the informer. The Georgia Act of 1817 directed that the slaves be either sold or given to the Colonization Society for transportation, providing the society reimburse the state for all expense incurred, and pay for the transportation. In this manner machinery of somewhat clumsy build and varying pattern was provided for the carrying out of the National Act. 61. Evidence of the Continuance of the Trade Undoubtedly the Act of 1807 came very near being a dead letter. The testimony supporting this view is voluminous. It consists of presidential messages, reports of cabinet officers, letters of collection and revenue, letters of district attorneys, reports of committees of Congress, reports of naval commanders, statements made on the floor of Congress, the testimony of eyewitnesses, and the complaints of home and foreign anti-slavery societies. When I was young, writes Mr. Fowler of Connecticut, the slave trade was still carried on by Connecticut shipmasters and merchant adventurers for the supply of southern ports. This trade was carried on by the consent of the southern states, under the provisions of the Federal Constitution, until 1808, and after that time, clandestinely. There was a good deal of conversation on the subject in private circles. Other states were said to be even more involved than Connecticut. The African Society of London estimated that down to 1816, fifteen of the sixteen thousand slaves annually taken from Africa were shipped by Americans. Notwithstanding the Prohibitory Act of America, which was passed in 1807, ships bearing the American flag continued to trade for slaves until 1809, when, in consequence of a decision in the English Prize Appeal Courts, which rendered American slave ships liable to capture and condemnation, that flag suddenly disappeared from the coast. Its place was almost instantaneously supplied by the Spanish flag, which, with one or two exceptions, was now seen for the first time on the African coast, engaged in covering the slave trade. This sudden substitution of the Spanish for the American flag seemed to confirm what was established in a variety of instances by more direct testimony, that the slave trade, which now, for the first time, assumed a Spanish dress, was in reality only the trade of other nations in disguise. So notorious did the participation of Americans in the traffic become that President Madison informed Congress in his message, December 5, 1810, that it appears that American citizens are instrumental in carrying on a traffic in enslaved Africans, equally in violation of the laws of humanity, and in defiance of those of their own country. The same just and benevolent motives which produce the interdiction and force against this criminal conduct will doubtless be felt by Congress in devising further means of suppressing the evil. The Secretary of the Navy wrote the same year to Charleston, South Carolina. I hear, not without great concern, that the law prohibiting the importation of slaves has been violated in frequent instances near St. Mary's. Testimony as to violations of the law and suggestions for improving it also came in from district attorneys. The method of introducing Negroes was simple. A slave smuggler says, after resting a few days at St. Augustine, I agreed to accompany Diego on a land trip through the United States, where a caffle of Negroes was to precede us, for whose disposal the shrewd Portuguese had already made arrangements with my uncle's consignees. I soon learned how readily and at what profits the Florida Negroes were sold into the neighboring American states. The caffle, under charge of Negro drivers, was to strike up the Escambia River and thence cross the boundary into Georgia, where some of our wild Africans were mixed with various squads of native blacks and driven inland till sold off, singly or by couples, on the road. At this period, 1812, the United States had declared the African slave trade illegal and passed stringent laws to prevent the importation of Negroes. Yet the Spanish possessions were thriving on this inland exchange of Negroes and mulattoes. 
florida was a sort of nursery for slave breeders and many american citizens grew rich by trafficking in guinea negroes and smuggling them continually in small parties through the southern united states at the time i mentioned the business was a lively one owing to the war then going on between the states and england and the unsettled condition of affairs on the border the spanish flag continued to cover american slave traders the rapid rise of privateering during the war was not caused solely by patriotic motives for many armed ships fitted out in the united states obtained a thin spanish disguise at havana and transported thousands of slaves to brazil and the west indies sometimes all disguise was thrown aside and the american flag appeared on the slave coast as in the cases of the paz the rebecca the rosa formerly the privateer commodore perry the dorset of baltimore and the saucy jack governor mccarthy of sierra leone wrote in eighteen seventeen the slave trade is carried on most vigorously by the spaniards portuguese americans and french i have had it affirmed from several quarters and do believe it to be a fact that there is a greater number of vessels employed in that traffic than at any former period end of chapter eight recording by lawrence trask mount vernon ohio interface audio dot com chapter eight the period of attempted suppression part two eighteen o seven to eighteen twenty five 62 apathy of the federal government the united states cruisers succeeded now and then in capturing a slaver like the eugene which was taken when within four miles of the new orleans bar president madison again in 1816 urged congress to act on account of the violations and evasions which it is suggested are chargeable on unworthy citizens who mingle in the slave trade under foreign flags and with foreign ports and by collusive importations of slaves into the united states through adjoining ports and territories the executive was continually in receipt of annual evidence of this illicit trade and of the helplessness of officers of the law in eighteen seventeen it was reported to the secretary of the navy that most of the goods carried to Galveston were brought into the United States, the more valuable, and the slaves are smuggled in through the numerous inlets to the westward, where the people are but too much disposed to render them every possible assistance. Several hundred slaves are now at Galveston, and persons have gone from New Orleans to purchase them. Every exertion will be made to intercept them, but I have little hopes of success similar letters from naval officers and collectors showed that a system of slave piracy had arisen since the war and that at galveston there was an establishment of organized brigands who did not go to the trouble of sailing to africa for their slaves but simply captured slavers and sold their cargoes into the united states this galveston nest had in eighteen seventeen eleven armed vessels to prosecute the work and the most shameful violations of the slave act as well as our revenue laws continue to be practiced cargoes of as many as three hundred slaves were arriving in texas all this took place under Ari, the buccaneer governor and when he removed to amelia island in eighteen seventeen with the mcgregor raid the illicit traffic in slaves which had been going on there for years took an impulse that brought it even to the somewhat deaf ears of Collector Bullock. He reported May 22, 1817. I have just received information from a source on which I can implicitly rely that it has already become the practice to introduce into the state of Georgia, across the St. Mary's River, from Amelia Island, East Florida, Africans, who have been carried into the port of Fernandina subsequent to the capture of it by the patriot army now in possession of it were the legislature to pass an act giving compensation in some manner to informers it would have a tendency in a great degree to prevent the practice as the thing now is no citizen will take the trouble of searching for and detecting the slaves 
I further understand that the evil will not be confined altogether to Africans, but will be extended to the worst class of West India slaves. Undoubtedly, the injury done by these pirates to the regular slave-trading interests was largely instrumental in exterminating them. Late in 1817, United States troops seized Amelia Island, and President Monroe felicitated Congress and the country upon escaping the annoyance and injury of this illicit trade. The trade, however, seems to have continued, as is shown by such letters as the following, written three and a half months later. Port of Darien, March 14, 1818 It is a painful duty, sir, to express to you that I am in possession of undoubted information, that African and West India Negroes are almost daily illicitly introduced into Georgia, for sale or settlement, or passing through it to the territories of the United States, for similar purposes. These facts are notorious, and it is not unusual to see such Negroes in the streets of St. Mary's, and such too recently captured by our vessels of war, and ordered to Savannah, were illegally bartered by hundreds in that city. For this bartering, or bonding, as it is called, but in reality selling, actually took place before any decision had been passed by the court respecting them. I cannot but again express to you, sir, that these irregularities and mocking of the laws by men who understand them, and who, it was presumed, would have respected them, are such that it requires the immediate interposition of Congress to effect a suppression of this traffic for as things are should a faithful officer of the government apprehend such negroes to avoid the penalties imposed by the laws the proprietors disclaim them and some agent of the executive demands a delivery of the same to him who may employ them as he pleases or effect a sale by way of a bond for the restoration of the negroes when legally called on so to do which bond it is understood is to be forfeited as the amount of the bond is so much less than the value of the property. There are many Negroes recently introduced into this state and the Alabama Territory, which can be apprehended. The undertaking would be great, but to be sensible that we shall possess your approbation and that we are carrying the views and wishes of the government into execution is all we wish, and it shall be done independent of every personal consideration." This approbation failed to come to the zealous collector, and on the 5th of July he wrote that, not being favored with the reply, he has been obliged to deliver over to the governor's agents 91 illegally imported Negroes. Reports from other districts corroborate this testimony. The collector at Mobile writes of strange proceedings on the part of the courts. General D. B. Mitchell, ex-governor of Georgia and United States Indian agent, after an investigation in 1821 by Attorney General Wirt, was found guilty of having prostituted his power, as agent for Indian affairs at the Creek Agency, to the purpose of aiding and assisting in a conscious breach of the Act of Congress of 1807, in prohibition of the slave trade, and this from mercenary motives. The indefatigable Collector Chu of New Orleans wrote to Washington that, to put a stop to that traffic, a naval force suitable to those waters is indispensable, and that vast numbers of slaves will be introduced to an alarming extent, unless prompt and effectual measures are adopted by the general government. Other collectors continually reported infractions, complaining that they could get no assistance from the citizens or plaintively asking the services of one small cutter. Meantime, what was the response of the government to such representations, and what efforts were made to enforce the act? A few unsystematic and spasmodic attempts are recorded. In 1811 some special instructions were sent out, and the President was authorized to seize Amelia Island. Then came the war, and as late as November 15, 1818, in spite of the complaints of collectors, we find no revenue cutter on the Gulf Coast. During the years 1817 and 1818, some cruisers went there irregularly, but they were too large to be effective, and the partial suppression of the Amelia Island pirates 
was all that was accomplished. On the whole, the efforts of the government lacked plan, energy, and often sincerity. Some captures of slavers were made, but as the collector at Mobile wrote, and in certain cases, this was owing rather to accident than any well-timed arrangement. He adds, from the Chandelier Islands to the Perdido River, including the coast and numerous other islands, we have only a small boat, with four men and an inspector, to oppose to the whole confederacy of smugglers and pirates. To cap the climax, the government officials were so negligent that Secretary Crawford, in 1820, confessed to Congress that it appears from an examination of the records of this office that no particular instructions have ever been given by the Secretary of the Treasury under the original or supplementary acts prohibiting the introduction of slaves into the United States. Besides this inactivity, the government was criminally negligent in not prosecuting and punishing offenders when captured. Urgent appeals for instruction from prosecuting attorneys were too often received in official silence. Complaints as to the violation of law by state officers went unheeded. Informers were unprotected and sometimes driven from home. Indeed, the most severe comment on the whole period is the report January 7, 1819, of the Register of the Treasury, who, after the wholesale and open violation of the Act of 1807, reported in response to a request from the House that it doth not appear from an examination of the records of this office, and particularly of the accounts, to the date of their last settlement, of the collectors of the customs and of the several marshals of the United States, that any forfeitures had been incurred under the said act. 63. Typical Cases At this date, January 7, 1819, however, certain cases were stated to be pending, a history of which will fitly conclude this discussion. In 1818, three American schooners sailed from the United States to Havana. On June 2nd, they started back with cargoes aggregating 107 slaves. The schooner Constitution was captured by one of Andrew Jackson's officers under the guns of Fort Barrancas. The Louisa and Marino were captured by Lieutenant McKeever of the United States Navy. The three vessels were duly proceeded against at Mobile, and the case began slowly to drag along. The slaves, instead of being put under the care of the zealous marshal of the district, were placed in the hands of three bondsmen, friends of the judge. The marshal notified the government of this irregularity, but apparently received no answer. In 1822 the three vessels were condemned as forfeited, but the court reserved for future order the distribution of the slaves. Nothing whatever, either then or later, was done to the slave traders themselves. The owners of the ships promptly appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States, and that tribunal in 1824 condemned the three vessels and the slaves on two of them. These slaves, considerably reduced in number from various causes, were sold at auction for the benefit of the state, in spite of the Act of 1819. Meantime, before the decision of the Supreme Court, the judge of the Supreme Court of West Florida had awarded to certain alleged Spanish claimants of the slaves indemnity for nearly the whole number seized, at the price of $650 per head, and the Secretary of the Treasury had actually paid the claim. In 1826, Lieutenant McKeever urgently petitions Congress for his prize money of $4,415.15, which he has not yet received. The Constitution was for some explicable reason released from bond, and the whole case fades in a very thick cloud of official mist. In 1831, Congress sought to inquire into the final disposition of the slaves. The information given was never printed, but as late as 1836, a certain Calvin Mickle petitions Congress for reimbursement for the slaves sold, for their hire, for their natural increase, for expenses incurred, and for damages. 64. The Supplementary Acts, 1818-1820 
to remedy the obvious defects of the act of 1807 two courses were possible one to minimize the crime of transportation and by encouraging informers to concentrate efforts against the buying of smuggled slaves the other to make the crime of transportation so great that no slaves would be imported the act of eighteen eighteen tried the first method that of eighteen nineteen the second the latter was obviously the more upright and logical and the only method deserving thought even in eighteen o seven but the act of eighteen eighteen was the natural descendant of that series of compromises which began in the constitutional convention and which instead of postponing the settlement of critical questions to more favorable times rather aggravated and complicated them the immediate cause of the act of eighteen eighteen was the amelia island scandal committees in both houses reported bills but that of the senate finally passed there does not appear to have been very much debate the sale of africans for the benefit of the informer and of the united states was strongly urged as the only means of executing the laws against the slave trade as experience had fully demonstrated since the origin of the prohibition this proposition was naturally opposed as inconsistent with the principles of our government and calculated to throw as wide open the door to the importation of slaves as it was before the existing prohibition the act which became a law april twentieth eighteen eighteen was a poorly constructed compromise which virtually acknowledged the failure of efforts to control the trade and sought to remedy defects by pitting cupidity against cupidity informer against thief one half of all forfeitures and fines were to go to the informer and penalties for violation were changed as follows for equipping a slaver instead of a fine of twenty thousand dollars a fine of one thousand dollars to five thousand dollars and imprisonment from three to seven years for transporting negroes instead of a fine of five thousand dollars and forfeiture of ship and negroes a fine of one thousand dollars to five thousand dollars and imprisonment for three to seven years for actual importation instead of a fine of one thousand dollars to ten thousand dollars and imprisonment from five to ten years a fine of one thousand dollars to ten thousand dollars and imprisonment from three to seven years for knowingly buying illegally imported negroes instead of a fine of eight hundred dollars for each negro and forfeiture a fine of one thousand dollars for each negro the burden of proof was laid on the defendant to the extent that he must prove that the slave in question had been imported at least five years before the prosecution the slaves were still left to the disposal of the states the statute of course was a failure from the start and at the very next session congress took steps to revise it a bill was reported in the house january thirteenth eighteen nineteen but it was not discussed till march it finally passed after much debate the senate dropped its own bill and after striking out the provision for the death penalty passed the bill as it came from the house the house acquiesced and the bill became a law march third eighteen nineteen in the midst of the Missouri trouble this act directed the president to use armed cruisers on the coasts of the United States and Africa to suppress the slave trade one half the proceeds of the condemned ship were to go to the captors as bounty provided the Africans were safely lodged with the United States Marshal and the crew with the civil authorities these provisions were seriously marred by a proviso which Butler of Louisiana had inserted with a due regard for the interests of the state which he represented viz that a captured slaver must always be returned to the port whence she sailed this of course secured decided advantages to southern slave traders the most radical provision of the act was that which directed the president to make such regulations and arrangements as he may deem expedient for the safekeeping support and removal beyond the limits of the united states of all such negroes mulattoes or persons of color as may be so delivered and brought within their jurisdiction
and to appoint an agent in Africa to receive such Negroes. Finally, an appropriation of $100,000 was made to enforce the act. This act was in some measure due to the new colonization movement, and the return of Africans recaptured was a distinct recognition of its efforts and the real foundation of Liberia. To render this straightforward act effective, it was necessary to add but one measure, and that was a penalty commensurate with the crime of slave stealing. This was accomplished by the act of May 15, 1820, a law which may be regarded as the last of the Missouri Compromise measures. The act originated from the various bills on piracy which were introduced early in the 16th Congress. The House bill, in spite of opposition, was amended so as to include slave trading under piracy, and passed. The Senate agreed without a division. This law provided that direct participation in the slave trade should be piracy, punishable with death. Statutes at Large Volume 3, page 533-4, to 4, March 3, 1819, $100,000 Volume 3, page 764, March 3, 1823, $50,000. Volume 3, page 141, March 14, 1826, $32,000. Page 141, March 14, 1826, $32,000. Page 208, March 2, 1827, $36,710. $20,000. Page 302, May 24, 1828, $30,000. Page 354, March 2, 1829, $16,000. Page 462, March 2, 1831, $16,000. Page 615, February 20, 1833, five thousand dollars page sixty seven january twenty fourth eighteen thirty three five thousand dollars volume four page one hundred and fifty seven to eight march third eighteen thirty seven eleven thousand four hundred and thirteen dollars and fifty seven cents page five oh one august fourth eighteen forty two ten thousand five hundred and forty three dollars and forty two cents Page 615, March 3, 1843, $5,000. Volume 8, page 96, August 10, 1846, $25,000. Page 90, March 18, 1856, $8,000. Page 227, March 3, 1857, $8,000. Page 404, March 3, 1859, $75,000. Volume 11, page 21, May 26, 1860, $40,000. Page 132, February 19, 1861, $900,000. Page 219, March 2, 1861, $900,000. Page 639, February 4, 1863, $17,000. Page 424, January 24, 1865, $17,000. Page 226, July 25, 1866, $17,000. Page 415, February 28, 1867, seventeen thousand dollars page fifty eight march thirtieth eighteen sixty eight twelve thousand five hundred dollars page three hundred and twenty one march third eighteen sixty nine twelve thousand five hundred dollars total for fifty years two million three hundred and eighty six thousand six hundred and sixty six dollars and ninety nine cents minus surpluses reappropriated, approximate, $48,666.99, for a total of 2338000 
Cost of Squadron, 1843 to 1858, 384,500 per year. House Executive Document 31, Congress 1, Session 9, Number 73. Returning Slaves on Wildfire, Statutes at Large, 12.41. Approximate Cost of Squadron, 1858 to 66, probably not less than 500,000 per year. Approximate money cost of suppressing the slave trade, 12,355,500. C.F. Kendall's Report, Senate Document 21, Congress 2, Session 1, Number 1, pages 211 to 218, American State Papers, Naval 3, Number 429E, also reports of the Secretaries of the Navy from 1819 to 1860. 65. Enforcement of the Supplementary Acts, 1818-1825. A somewhat more sincere and determined effort to enforce the slave trade laws now followed, and yet it is a significant fact that not until Lincoln's administration did a slave trader suffer death for violating the laws of the United States. The participation of Americans in the trade continued, declining somewhat between 1825 and 1830, and then reviving until it reached its highest activity between 1840 and 1860. The development of a vast internal slave trade and the consequent rise in the South of vested interest strongly opposed to slave smuggling led to a falling off in the illicit introduction of Negroes after 1825 until the 50s, Nevertheless, smuggling never entirely ceased, and large numbers were thus added to the plantations of the Gulf states. Monroe had various constitutional scruples as to the execution of the Act of 1819, but as Congress took no action, he at last put a fair interpretation on his powers, and appointed Samuel Bacon as an agent in Africa to form a settlement for recaptured Africans. Gradually, the agency thus formed became merged with that of the Colonization Society on Cape Mejorado, and from this union, Liberia was finally evolved. Meantime, during the years 1818 to 1820, the activity of the slave traders was prodigious. General James Talmadge declared in the House, February 15, 1819, Our laws are already highly penal against their introduction. And yet it is a well-known fact that about 14,000 slaves have been brought into our country this last year. In the same year, Middleton of South Carolina and Wright of Virginia estimated illicit introduction at 13,000 and 15,000, respectively. Judge Story, in charging a jury, took occasion to say, We have put too many proofs from unquestionable sources that it, the slave trade, is still carried on with the implacable rapacity of former times. Avarice has grown more subtle in its evasions, and watches and seizes its prey with an appetite quickened rather than suppressed by its guilty vigils. American citizens are steeped to their very mouths. I can hardly use too bold a figure in this stream of iniquity. The following year, 1820, brought some significant statements from various members of Congress. Said Smith of South Carolina, Pharaoh was, for his temerity, drowned in the Red Sea in pursuing them, the Israelites, contrary to God's express will. But our northern friends have not been afraid even of that in their zeal to furnish the southern states with Africans. They are better seamen than Pharaoh and calculate by what means to elude the vigilance of heaven, which they seem to disregard, if they can but elude the violated laws of their country. As late as May he saw little hope of suppressing the traffic. Sargent of Pennsylvania declared, It is notorious that in spite of the utmost vigilance that can be employed, African Negroes are clandestinely brought in and sold as slaves. Plumer of New Hampshire stated that of the unhappy beings, thus in violation of all laws transported to our shores and thrown by force into the mass of our black population, scarcely one in a hundred is ever detected by the officers of the general government, 
in a part of the country where, if we are to believe the statement of Governor Rabin, an officer who would perform his duty by attempting to enforce the law against the slave trade, is by many considered as an officious meddler and treated with derision and contempt. I have been told by a gentleman who has attended particularly to this subject that 10,000 slaves were in one year smuggled into the United States, and that even for the last year we must count the number not by hundreds, but by thousands. In 1821, a committee of Congress characterized prevailing methods as those of the grossest fraud that could be practiced to deceive the officers of government. Another committee in 1822, after a careful examination of the subject, declared that they find it impossible to measure with precision the effect produced upon the American branch of the slave trade by the laws above mentioned and the seizures under them. They are unable to state whether those American merchants, the American capital and seamen which heretofore aided in this traffic, have abandoned it altogether or have sought shelter under the flags of other nations. They then state the suspicious circumstance that, with the disappearance of the American flag from the traffic, the trade, notwithstanding, increases annually under the flags of other nations. They complain of the spasmodic efforts of the executive. They say that the first United States cruiser arrived on the African coast in March 1820 and remained a few weeks and since then four others had in two years made five visits in all. But since the middle of last November, the commencement of the healthy season on that coast, no vessel has been, nor, as your committee is informed, is under orders for that service. The United States African agent, Ayers, reported in 1823, I was informed by an American officer who had been on the coast in 1820 that he had boarded twenty American vessels in one morning, lying in the port of Galanas, and fitted for the reception of slaves. It is a lamentable fact that most of the harbors between the Senegal and the Line were visited by an equal number of American vessels, and for the sole purpose of carrying away slaves. Although for some years the coast has been occasionally visited by our cruisers, their short stay and seldom appearance had made but slight impression on those traders, rendered hardy by the repetition of crime, and avaricious by excessive gain. They were enabled by a regular system to gain intelligence of any cruiser being on the coast. Even such spasmodic efforts bore abundant fruit, and indicated what vigorous measures might have accomplished. Between May 1818 and November 1821, Nearly six hundred Africans were recaptured, and eleven American slavers taken. Such measures gradually changed the character of the trade, and opened the international phase of the question. American slavers cleared for foreign ports, there took a foreign flag and papers, and then sailed boldly past American cruisers, although their real character was often well known. More stringent clearance laws and consular instructions might have greatly reduced this practice, but nothing was ever done, and gradually the laws became in large measure powerless to deal with the bulk of the illicit trade. In 1820, September 16th, a British officer, in his official report, declares that, in spite of United States laws, American vessels, American subjects, and American capital are unquestionably engaged in the trade, though under other colors and in disguise. The United States ship Cyan at one time reported ten captures within a few days, adding, although they are evidently owned by Americans, they are so completely covered by Spanish papers that it is impossible to condemn them. The governor of Sierra Leone reported the rivers Nunez and Pongas full of renegade European and American slave traders. The trade was said to be carried on to an extent that almost staggers belief. Down to 1824 or 1825, reports from all quarters proved this activity in slave trading. The execution of the laws within the country exhibits grave defects and even criminal negligence. 
Attorney General Wirt finds it necessary to assure collectors in 1819 that it is against public policy to dispense with the prosecutions for violation of the law to prohibit the slave trade. One district attorney writes, it appears to be almost impossible to enforce the laws of the United States against offenders after the Negroes have been landed in the state. Again, it is asserted that when vessels engaged in the slave trade have been detained by the American cruisers and sent into the slaveholding states, there appears at once a difficulty in securing the freedom to these captives, which the laws of the United States have decreed for them. In some cases, one man would smuggle in the Africans and hide them in the woods. Then his partner would rob him, and so all trace be lost. Perhaps 350 Africans were officially reported as brought in contrary to law from 1818 to 1820. The absurdity of this figure is apparent. A circular letter to the marshals in 1821 brought reports of only a few well-known cases, like that of General Ramirez. The marshal of Louisiana had no information. There appears to be little positive evidence of a large illicit importation into the country for a decade after 1825. It is hardly possible, however, considering the activity in the trade, that slaves were not largely imported. Indeed, when we note how the laws were continually broken in other respects, absence of evidence of petty smuggling becomes presumptive evidence that collusive or tacit understanding of officers and citizens allowed the trade to some extent. Finally, it must be noted that during all this time, scarcely a man suffered for participating in the trade, beyond the loss of the Africans and more rarely of his ship. Red-handed slavers caught in the act and convicted were too often, like Lacoste of South Carolina, the subjects of executive clemency. In certain cases there were those who even had the effrontery to ask Congress to cancel their own laws. For instance, in 1819, a Venezuelan privateer, secretly fitted out and manned by Americans in Baltimore, succeeded in capturing several American, Portuguese, and Spanish slavers, and appropriating the slaves. Being finally wrecked herself, she transferred her crew and slaves to one of her prizes, the Antelope, which was eventually captured by a United States cruiser and the 280 Africans sent to Georgia. After much litigation, the United States Supreme Court ordered those captured from Spaniards to be surrendered, and the others to be returned to Africa. By some mysterious process, only 139 Africans now remained, 100 of whom were sent to Africa. The Spanish claimants of the remaining 39 sold them to a certain Mr. Wilde, who gave bond to transport them out of the country. Finally, in December 1827, there came an innocent petition to Congress to cancel this bond. A bill to that effect passed and was approved May 2, 1828, and in consequence these Africans remained as slaves in Georgia. On the whole, it is plain that although in the period from 1807 to 1820 Congress laid down broad lines of legislation sufficient, save in some details, to suppress the African slave trade to America, yet the execution of these laws was criminally lax. Moreover, by the facility with which slavers could disguise their identity, it was possible for them to escape even a vigorous enforcement of our laws. This situation could properly be met only by energetic and sincere international cooperation. The next chapter will review efforts directed toward this end. End of Chapter 8 Part 2 Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio InterfaceAudio.com Chapter 9 of the Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638 to 1870, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Water Baron. Chapter 9. The International Status of the Slave Trade. 1783-1862. The Rise of the Movement Against the Slave Trade. 1788 to 1807. At the beginning of the 19th century, England held 800,000 slaves in her colonies, France 250,000, Denmark 27,000, Spain and Portugal 600,000, Holland 50,000, Sweden 600. There were also about 2 million slaves in Brazil and about 900,000 in the United States. This was the powerful basis of the demand for the slave trade, and against the economic forces which these four and a half millions of enforced laborers represented, the battle for freedom had to be fought. Denmark first responded to the denunciatory cries of the 18th century against slavery and the slave trade. In 1792, by royal order, this traffic was prohibited in the Danish possessions after 1802. The principles of the French Revolution logically called for the extinction of the slave system by France. This was, however, accomplished more precipitately than the convention anticipated, and in a whirl of enthusiasm engendered by the appearance of the Dominican de deputies, slavery and the slave trade were abolished in all French colonies February 4, 1794. This abolition was short-lived for at the command of the first consul, slavery and the slave trade was restored in an X, 1799. The trade was finally abolished by Napoleon during the Hundred Days by a decree, March 29, 1815, which briefly declared, Deter de la publication du present decret, la traite de Norris est aboliti. The Treaty of Paris eventually confirmed this law. In England, the united efforts of Sharp, Clarkston, and Wilberforce early began to arouse public opinion by means of agitation and pamphlet literature. May 21st, 1788, Sir William Dolben moved a bill regulating the trade, which passed in July and was the last English measure countenancing the traffic. The report of the Privy Council on the subject in 1789 precipitated the long struggle. On motion of Pitt, in 1788, the House had resolved to take up at the next session the question of the abolition of the trade. It was, accordingly, called up by Wilberforce, and a remarkable parliamentary battle ensued, which lasted continuously until 1805. The Grenville Fox Ministry now espoused the cause. This ministry first prohibited the trade with such colonies as England had acquired by conquest during the Napoleonic Wars. Then, in 1806, they prohibited the foreign slave trade, and finally, March 25, 1807, enacted the total abolition of the traffic. Concerted Action of the Powers, 1783-1814 During the peace negotiations between the United States and Great Britain in 1783, it was proposed by Jay, in June, that there be a proviso inserted as follows provided that the subjects of his Britannic Majesty shall not have any right or claim under the Convention to carry or import into the said states any slaves from any part of the world, it being the intention of the said states entirely to prohibit the importation thereof. Fox promptly replied, If that be their policy, it never can be competent to us to dispute with them their own regulations. No mention of this was, however, made in the final treaty, probably because it was thought unnecessary. In the proposed treaty of 1806, signed at London, December 31st, Article 24 provided that the high contracting parties engage to communicate to each other, without delay, all such laws as have been or shall be hereafter enacted by their respective legislators as also all measures which shall have been taken for the abolition or limitation of the African slave trade, and that they further agree to use their best endeavors to procure the cooperation of other powers for the final and complete abolition of a trade 
so repugnant to the principles of justice and humanity. This marks the beginning of a long series of treaties between England and other powers looking towards the prohibition of the traffic by international agreement. During the years 1810 to 1814, she signed treaties relating to the subject with Portugal, Denmark, and Sweden. May 30th, 1814, an additional article to the Treaty of Paris between France and Great Britain engaged these powers to endeavor to induce the approaching Congress at Vienna to decree the abolition of the slave trade, so that the said trade shall cease universally as it shall cease definitively. Under any circumstances, on the part of the French government, in the course of five years, and that during the said period no slave merchant shall import or sell slaves, except in the colonies of the state of which he is a subject. In addition to this, the next day a circular letter was dispatched by Kasselrog to Austria, Russia, and Prussia, expressing the hope that the powers of Europe, when restoring peace to Europe, with one common interest, will crown this great work by interposing their benign offices in favor of those regions of the globe which yet continue to be desolated by this unnatural and inhuman traffic. Meantime, additional treaties were secured. In 1814, by royal decree, Netherlands agreed to abolish the trade. Spain was induced by her necessities to restrain her trade to her own colonies and to endeavor to prevent the fraudulent use of her flag by foreigners. And in 1815, Portugal agreed to abolish the slave trade north of the equator. Action of the Powers from 1814 to 1820 At the Congress of Vienna, which assembled late in 1814, Castlereagh was infagatable in his endeavors to secure the abolition of the trade. France and Spain, however, refused to yield further than they had already done, and the other powers hesitated to go to the lengths he recommended. Nevertheless, he secured the institution of annual conferences on the matter, and a declaration by the Congress strongly condemning the trade and declaring that, quote, the public voice in all civilized countries was raised to demand its suppression as soon as possible, end quote and that, while the definitive period of termination would be left to subsequent negotiation, the sovereigns would not consider their work done until the trade was entirely suppressed. In the Treaty of Ghent between Great Britain and the United States, ratified February 17, 1815, Article 10, proposed by Great Britain, declared that, whereas the traffic in slaves is irreconcilable with the principles of humanity and justice, the two countries agreed to use their best endeavors in abolishing the trade. The final overthrow of Napoleon was marked by a second declaration of the powers who, desiring to give effect to the measures on which they were deliberated at the Congress of Vienna, relative to the complete and universal abolition of the slave trade, and having, each in their respective dominions, prohibited without restriction their colonies and subjects from taking any part whatever in this traffic, engaged to renew conjointly their efforts, with the view of securing final success to those principles which they proclaimed in the declaration of the 4th of February, 1815, without loss of time, through their ministers at the courts of London and of Paris, the most effectual measures for the entire and definitive abolition of a commerce so odious and so strongly condemned by the laws of religion and of nature. Treaties further restricting the trade continued to be made by Great Britain, Spain abolished the trade north of the equator in 1817, and promised the entire abolition in 1820. Spain, Portugal, and Holland also granted a mutual limited right of search to England and joined in establishing mixed courts. The effort, however, to secure a general declaration of the powers urging, if not compelling, the abolition of the trade in 1820, as well as the attempt to secure a qualified international right of visit, failed, although both propositions were strongly urged by England at the Conference of 1818. The struggle for an international right of search, 1820 through 1840. Whatever England's motives were, 
it is certain that only a limited international right of visit on the high seas could suppress or greatly limit the slave trade. Her diplomacy was therefore henceforth directed to this end. On the other hand, the maritime supremacy of England, so successfully asserted during the Napoleonic Wars, would, in case a right of search were granted, virtually make England the policeman of the seas, and if nations like the United States had already, under present conditions, had just cause to complain of violations by England of their rights on the seas, might not any extension of rights by international agreement be dangerous? It was such considerations for that many years brought the powers to a deadlock in their efforts to suppress the slave trade. At first, it looked as if England might attempt, by judicial decisions in her own courts, to seize even foreign slavers. After the war, however, her courts disavowed such action, and the right was sought for by treaty stipulation. Castlereg took early opportunity to approach the United States on the matter, suggesting to Minister Rush, June 20th, 1818, a mutual but strictly limited right of search. Rush was ordered to give him assurances of the solicitude of the United States to suppress the traffic, but to state that the concessions asked for appeared of a character not applicable to our institutions. Negotiations were then transferred to Washington, and the new British minister, Mr. Stratford Canning, approached Adams with full instructions in December 1820. Meantime, it had become clear to many in the United States that the individual efforts of the states could never suppress or even limit the trade without sympathetic cooperation. In 1817, the Committee of the House had urged the opening of negotiations looking toward international cooperation, and a Senate motion to the same effect had caused long debate. In 1820 and 1821, two House committee reports, one of which recommended the granting of a right of search, were adopted by the House but failed in the Senate. Adams, notwithstanding this, saw constitutional objections to the plan proposed by Canning and wrote to him, December 30th, a compact giving the power to the naval offices of one nation to search the merchant vessels of another for offenders and offenses against the laws of the latter, backed by a further power to seize and carry into a foreign port, and there subject to the decision of a tribunal composed of at least one-half foreigners irresponsible to the supreme corrective tribunal of this union, and not amenable to the control of impeachment for official misdemeanors, was an investment of power over the person's property and reputation of the citizens of this country, not only unwarranted by any delegation of sovereign power to the national government, but so adverse to the elementary principles and indispensable securities of individual rights, that not even the most unqualified approbation of the ends could justify the transgression. He then suggested cooperation of the fleets on the coast of Africa, a proposal which was promptly accepted. The slave trade was again a subject of international consideration at the Congress of Verona in 1822. Austria, France, Great Britain, Russia, and Prussia were represented. The English delegates declared that, although only Portugal and Brazil allowed the trade, yet the traffic was at that moment carried on to a greater extent than ever before. They said that in seven months of the year 1821, no less than 21,000 slaves were abducted and 352 vessels entered African ports north of the equator. It is obvious, said they, that this crime is committed in contravention to the laws of every country of Europe and of America, excepting only of one, and it requires something more than the ordinary operation of law to prevent it. England therefore recommended, one, that each country denounce the trade as piracy, with a view of founding upon the aggregate of such separate declarations a general law to be incorporated in the law of nations. 2. A withdrawing of the flags of the powers from persons not native of these states, who engage in the traffic under the flags of these states. 3. A refusal to admit to their domains the procedure of the colonies of states allowing the trade, a measure which would apply to Portugal and Brazil alone.
These proposals were not accepted. Austria would agree to the first two only. France refused to denounce the trade as piracy, and Prussia was non-committal. The utmost that could be gained was another denunciation of the trade couched in general terms. Negotiations of 1823 through 1825. England did not, however, lose hope of gaining some concession from the United States. Another House committee had, in 1822, reported that the only method of suppressing the trade was by granting a right of search. The House agreed, February 28, 1823, to request the President to enter into negotiations with the maritime powers of Europe to denounce the slave trade as piracy, an amendment that, we agree to be a qualified right of search, was, however, lost. Meantime, the English minister was continually pressing the matter upon Adams, who proposed, in turn, to denounce the trade as piracy. Canning agreed to this, but only on condition that it be piracy under the law of nations and not merely by statute law. Such an agreement, he said, would involve a right of search for its enforcement. He proposed strictly to limit and define this right to allow captured ships to be tried in their own courts, and not to commit the United States in any way to the question of the belligerent right of search. Adams finally sent a draft of a proposal treaty to England, agreed to recognize the slave traffic as piracy under the law of nations, namely, that although sizable by the officers and authorities of every nation, they should be triable only by the tribunals of the country of the slave trading vessel. Rush presented this project to the government in January 1824. England agreed to all the points insisted on by the United States, viz. that she should denounce the trade as piracy, that slavers should be tried in their own court country, and that the captor should be laid under the most effective responsibility for his conduct, and that the vessels under the convoy of a ship of war of their own country would be exempt from search. In addition, England demanded that the citizens of either country captured under the flag of a third power should be sent home for trial, and that the citizens of either country chartering vessels of a third country should come under these stipulations. This convention was laid before the Senate April 30th, 1824. It was not acted upon until May 21st, when it was so amended as to make it terminable at six months' notice. The same day, President Monroe, apprehending from the delay in the decision that some difficulty exists, sent a special message to the Senate, giving at length the reasons for signing the treaty, and saying that, should this convention be adopted, there is every reason to believe that it will be the commencement of a system destined to accomplish the entire abolition of the slave trade. It was, however, a time of great political pot-boiling, and consequently an unfortunate occasion to ask senators to settle any great question. A sympathetic attack, led by Johnson of Louisiana, was made all the vital provisions of the treaty. The waters of America were exempted from its application, and those of the West Indies barely escaped exposition. The provision which, perhaps, aimed the deadliest blow at American slave trade interests was likewise struck out, namely the application of the right of search to citizens chartering the vessels of a third nation. The convention thus mutilated was not signed by England, who demanded at least concession the application of the right of search to American waters. Meantime, the United States had invited nearly all nations to denounce the trade as piracy, and the President, the Secretary of the Navy, and the House Committee had urgently favored the granting of the right of search. The bad faith of Congress, however, in the matter of the Columbian Treaty, broke off for a time further negotiations with England. The Attitude of the United States and the State of the Slave Trade In 1824, the right of search was established between England and Sweden, and in 1826, Brazil promised to abolish the trade in three years. In 1831, the cause was greatly advanced by signing of treaty between Great Britain and France, granting mutually a geographically limited right of search. This led, in the next few years, to similar treaties with Denmark, Sardinia, the Hans towns, and Naples. Such measures put the trade more and more in the hands of Americans, and it greatly began to increase. Mercer sought repeatedly in the House to have negotiations reopened with England, but without success. 
Indeed, the chances of success were now for many years imperiled by the recurrence of deliberate searches of American vessels by the British. In the majority of cases, the vessels proved to be slavers, and some of them fraudulently flew the American flag. Nevertheless, their molestation by British cruisers created much feeling and hindered all steps toward an understanding. The United States was loath to have her criminal negligence in enforcing her own laws thus exposed by foreigners. Other international questions connected with the trade also strained the relations of the two countries. Three different vessels engaged in the domestic slave trade, driven by stress of weather, or, in the Creole case, captured by Negroes on board, landed slaves in British possessions, England freed them, and refused to pay, as for such they were landed after emancipation had been proclaimed in the West Indies. The case of the slaver La Amistad also raised difficulties with Spain. This Spanish vessel, after the Negroes on board had mutinied and killed their owners, was seized by a United States vessel and brought into port for adjudication. The court, however, freed the Negroes on the ground that under Spanish law they were not legally slaves, and although the Senate repeatedly tried to identify the owners, the project did not succeed. Such proceedings well illustrate the new tendency of the pro-slavery party to neglect the enforcement of the slave trade laws in a frantic defense of the remotest ramparts of slave property. Consequently, when under the Treaty of 1831, France and England joined in urging the accession of the United States to it, the British minister was at least compelled to inform Palmerston, December 1833, that the executive at Washington appears to shrink from bringing forward, in any shape, a question upon which depends the completion of their former object, the other and universal abolition of the slave trade, from an apprehension of alarming the southern states. Great Britain now offered to sign the proposed Treaty of 1824 as amended, but even this Forsyth refused and stated that the United States had determined not to become a party of any convention on the subject of the slave trade. Estimates as to the extent of the slave trade agree that the traffic to North and South America in 1820 was considerable, certainly not as much less than the 40,000 slaves annually. From that time to about 1825, it declined somewhat, but afterward increased enormously, so that by 1837, the American importation was estimated as high as 200,000 Negroes annually. The total abolition of the African trade by American countries then brought the traffic down to perhaps 30,000 in 1842. A large and rapid increase of illicit traffic followed, so that by 1847 the importation amounted to nearly 100,000 annually. One province of Brazil is said to have received 173,000 in the years 1846 to 1849. In the decade 1850 to 1860, this activity in slave trading continued and reached very large proportions. The traffic thus carried on floated under the flags of France, Spain, and Portugal until about 1830. From 1830 to 1840, it began gradually to assume the United States flag. By 1845, a large part of the trade was under the Stars and Stripes. By 1850, fully one half the trade. And in the decade, 1850 to 1860, nearly all the traffic found this flag its best protection. The Quintuple Treaty, 1839 to 1842. In 1839, Pope Gregory XVI stigmatized the slave trade as utterly unworthy of the Christian name, and at the same time, although prescribed by the laws of every civilized state, the trade was flourishing with pristine vigor. Great advantage was given the traffic by the fact that the United States, for two decades after the abortive attempt of 1824, refused to cooperate with the rest of the civilized world, and allowed her flag to shelter and protect the slave trade. If a fully equipped slaver sailed from New York, Havana, Rio de Janeiro, or Liverpool, she had only to hoist the stars and stripes in order to proceed unmolested on her piratical voyage, for there was seldom a United States cruiser to be met with, and there were, on the other hand, diplomats at Washington so jealous of the honor of the flag that they would prostrate it to crime rather than allow an English or French cruiser in any way to interfere. Without doubt, the contention of the United States 
as to English pretensions to a right of visit were technically correct. Nevertheless, it was clear that if the slave trade was to be suppressed, each nation must either zealously keep her flag from fraudulent use, or, as a labor-saving device, debute to others this duty for limited places and under special circumstances. A failure of any one nation to do one of these two things meant that the efforts of all other nations were to be fruitless. The United States had invited the world to join her in denouncing the slave trade as piracy. Yet, when such a pirate was waylaid by an English vessel, the United States complained or demanded reparation. The only answer which this country for years returned to the long-continued exposures of American slave traders and the fraudulent use of the American flag was a recital of cases where Great Britain had gone beyond her legal powers in an attempt to suppress the slave trade. In the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary, Secretary of State Forsyth declared in 1840 that the duty of the United States in the matter of the slave trade has been faithfully performed and if the traffic still exists as a disgrace to humanity, it is to be imputed to nations with whom Her Majesty's government has formed and maintained the most intimate connections, and to those governments Great Britain has paid for the right of active intervention in order to its complete expiation. So zealous was Stevenson, our minister to England, in denying the right of search, that he boldly informed Palmerston in 1841 that there is no shadow of pretense for excusing much less justifying the exercise of any such right, that it is wholly immaterial whether the vessels be equipped for or actually engaged in slave traffic or not, and consequently the right of search or detain even slave vessels must be confined to the ships or vessels of those nations with whom it has treaties on the subject. Palmerson courteously replied that he could not think that the United States seriously intended to make its flag a refuge for slave traders, and Aberdeen pertinently declared, Now it can scarcely be maintained by Mr. Stevenson that Great Britain should be bound to permit her own subjects, with British vessels and British capital, to carry on before the eyes of British officers this detestable traffic in human beings, which the law has declared to be piracy, merely because they had the audacity to commit an additional offense by fraudulently usurping the American flag. Thus the dispute, even after the advent of Webster, went on for a time, involving itself in metaphysical subtleties and apparently leading to no nearer to an understanding. In 1838, a fourth conference of the powers for the consideration of the slave trade took place in London. It was attended by representatives of England, France, Russia, Prussia, and Austria. England laid the project of a treaty before them, of which all but France assented. This so-called quintuple treaty signed December 20th, 1841, denounced the slave trade as piracy, and so declared that the high contracting parties agreed by common consent that those of ships of war which shall be provided with special warrants and orders may search every merchant vessel belonging to any of the high contracting parties which shall, on reasonable grounds, be suspected of being engaged in the traffic of slaves. All captured slavers were to be sent for their own countries for trial. While the ratification of the treaty was pending, the United States Minister to France, Louis Cass, addressed an official note to Gazot at the French Foreign Office, protesting against the institution of an international right of search, and rather grandiloquently warning the powers against the use of force to accomplish their ends. This extraordinary epistle, issued on the minister's own responsibility, brought a reply denying the creation of any new principle of international law, thereby the vessels of even those powers which have not participated in the arrangement should be subjected to the right of search, was ever intended, and affirming that no such extraordinary interpretation would be deduced from the convention. Moreover, M. Guiza hoped that the United States, by agreeing to this treaty, would aid, by its most sincere endeavors, the definitive abolition of the trade. Cass's theatrical protest was, consciously or unconsciously, the manifesto of what the growing class in the United States, who wanted no further measures to be taken for the suppression of the slave trade, toward that, as toward the institution of slavery, this party favored a policy of strict laissez-faire. Final Concerted Measures, 1842-1862 through 1862. The Treaty of Washington in 1842 
made the first effective compromise in the matter and broke the unpleasant deadlock by substituting joint cruising by English and American squadrons the proposed grant of a right of search. In submitting this treaty, Tyler said, the treaty which I now submit to you proposes no alteration, mitigation, or modification of the rules of law of nations. It provides simply that each of the two governments shall maintain on the coast of Africa a sufficient squadron to enforce separately and respectively the laws, rights, and obligations of the two countries for the suppression of the slave trade. This provision was a part of the treaty to settle the boundary disputes with England. In the Senate, Benton moved to strike out this article but the attempt was defeated by a vote of 32 to 12, and the treaty was ratified. This stipulation of the Treaty of 1842 was never properly carried out by the United States for any length of time. Consequently, the same difficulties as to search and visit by English vessels continued to recur. Cases like the following were frequent. The Illinois of Gloucester, Massachusetts, while lying in Waida, Africa, was boarded by a British officer but having American papers was unmolested. Three days later, she hoisted Spanish colors and sailed away with a cargo of slaves. Next morning, she fell in with another British vessel and hoisted American colors. The British ship had then no right to molest her, but the captain of the slaver feared that she would and therefore ran his vessel aground, slaves and all. The senior English officer reported that had Lieutenant Cumberland brought to and boarded the Illinois, notwithstanding the American colors which she hoisted, the American master of the Illinois would have complained to his government of the detention of his vessel. Again, a vessel which had been boarded by British officers and found with American flag and papers was, a little later, captured under the Spanish flag with 430 slaves. She had, in this interim, complained to the United States government of the boarding. Meanwhile, England continued to urge the granting of a right of search claiming that the stand of the United States really amounted to the wholesale protection of pirates under her flag. The United States answered by alleging that even the Treaty of 1842 had been misconstructed by England, whereupon there was much warm debate in Congress, and several attempts were made to abrogate the slave trade article of the treaty. The pro-slavery party had become more and more suspicious of England's motives. If they had seen her abolition of the slave trade, blossom into abolition of the system itself, and they seized every opportunity to prevent cooperation with her. At the same time, European interest in the question showed some signs of weakening, and no decided action was taken. In 1845, France charged her right of search stipulations in 1833 to one for joint cruising, while the Germanic Federation, Portugal, and Chile announced their trade as piracy. In 1844, Texas granted the right of search to England, and in 1845, Belgium signed the Quintuple Treaty. Discussion between England and the United States was revived when Cass held the Senate portfolio, and strange to say, the author of Cass's protest went further than any of his predecessors in acknowledging the justice of England's demands. Said he in 1859, if the United States maintained that by carrying their flag at her masthead, any vessel became hereby entitled to the immunity which belongs to American vessels, they might well be reproached with assuming a position that would go far towards shielding crimes upon the ocean from punishment. But they advanced no such pretension, while they concede that if, in the honest examination of a vessel sailing under American colors, but accompanied by strongly marked suspicious circumstances, a mistake is made, and she is found to be entitled to the flag she bears, but no injury is committed, and the conduct of the boarding party is irreproachable, no government would be likely to make a case, thus exceptional in its character, a subject of serious reclamation. While admitting this, and expressing a desire to cooperate in the suppression of the slave trade, Cass nevertheless steadily refused all further overtures toward a mutual right of search. The increase of the slave traffic was so great in the decade of 1850 to 1860 that Lord John Russell proposed to the governments of the United States, France, Spain, Portugal, and Brazil that they instruct their ministers to meet at London in May or June 1860 to consider measures for the final abolition of the trade. He stated, 
It is ascertained by repeated instances that the practice is for vessels to sail under the American flag. If the flag is rightly assumed and the papers correct, no British cruiser can touch them. If no slaves are on board, even though the equipment, the fittings, the water casks, and other circumstances prove that the ship is on the slave trade venture, no American cruiser can touch them. Continued representations of this kind were made to the paralyzed United States government. Indeed, the slave trade of the world seemed now to float securely under her flag. Nevertheless, Cass refused even to participate in the proposed conference, and later refused to accede to a proposal for joint cruising off the coast of Cuba. Great Britain offered to relieve the United States of any embarrassment by receiving all captured Africans into the West Indies. But President Buchanan could not contemplate any such arrangement, and obstinately refused to increase the suppressing squadron. On the outbreak of the Civil War, the Lincoln administration, through Secretary Stewart, immediately expressed a willingness to do all in its power to suppress the slave trade. Accordingly, June 7, 1862, a treaty was signed with Great Britain granting a mutual limited right of search and establishing mixed courts for the trial of offenders at the Cape of Good Hope, Sierra Leone, and New York. The efforts of a half-century of diplomacy were finally crowned. Stewart wrote to Adams, had such a treaty been made in 1808, there would now have been no sedition here. End of chapter 9. Recording by Water Baron. Chapter 10 of the Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638 to 1870, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638 to 1870, by W. E. B. Du Bois. The Rise of the Cotton Kingdom, 1820 to 1850. 74. The Economic Revolution. 75. The Attitude of the South. 76. The Attitude of the North and Congress. 77. Imperfect Application of the Laws. 78. Responsibility of the Government. 79. Activity of the Slave Trade. 74. The Economic Revolution. The history of slavery and the slave trade after 1820 must be read in the light of the Industrial Revolution, through which the civilized world passed in the first half of the 19th century. Between the years 1775 and 1825 occurred economic events and changes of the highest importance and widest influence. Though all branches of industry felt the impulse of this new industrial life, yet if we consider single industries, cotton manufacture has, during the 19th century, made the most magnificent and gigantic advances. This fact is easily explained by the remarkable series of inventions that revolutionized this industry between 1738 and 1830, including Arkwright's, Watts, Compton's, and Cartwright's epoch-making contrivances. The effect which these inventions had on the manufacture of cotton goods is best illustrated by the fact that, in England, the chief cotton market of the world, the consumption of raw cotton rose steadily from 13,000 bales in 1781 to 572,000 in 1820 to 871,000 in 1830 and to 3,366,000 in 1860 very early therefore came the query whence the supply of raw cotton was to come tentative experiments on the rich broad fields of the southern united states together with the indispensable invention of whitney's cotton gin soon answered this question a new economic future was opened up to this land and immediately the whole south began to extend its cotton culture and more and more to throw its whole energy into this one staple here it was that the fatal mistake of compromising with slavery in the beginning and of the period of laissez-faire pursued thereafter became painfully manifest 
for instead now of a healthy normal economic development along proper industrial lines we have the abnormal and fatal rise of a slave labor large farming system which before it was realized had so intertwined itself with and braced itself upon the economic forces of an industrial age that a vast and terrible civil war was necessary to displace it the tendencies to a patriarchal serfdom recognizable in the age of washington and jefferson began slowly but surely to disappear and in the second quarter of the century southern slavery was irresistibly changing from a family institution to an industrial system the development of southern slavery has heretofore been viewed so exclusively from the ethical and social standpoint that we are apt to forget its close and indissoluble connection with the world's cotton market beginning with eighteen twenty a little after the close of the napoleonic wars when the industry of cotton manufacture had begun its modern development and the south had definitely assumed her position as chief producer of raw cotton we find the average price of cotton per pound eight and a half pence from this time until eighteen forty five the price steadily fell until in the latter year it reached four pence the only exception to this fall was in the years eighteen thirty two to eighteen thirty nine when among other things a strong increase in the english demand together with an attempt of the young slave power to corner the market sent the price up as high as eleven pence the demand for cotton goods soon outran a crop which mccullough had pronounced prodigious and after eighteen forty five the price started on a steady rise which except for the checks suffered during the continental revolutions and the crimean war continued until eighteen sixty the steady increase in the production of cotton explains the fall in price down to eighteen forty five in eighteen twenty two the crop was a half million bales in eighteen thirty one a million in eighteen thirty eight a million and a half and in eighteen forty to eighteen forty three two million by this time the world's consumption of cotton goods began to increase so rapidly that in spite of the increase in southern crops the price kept rising three million bales were gathered in eighteen fifty two three and a half million in eighteen fifty six and the remarkable crop of five million bales in eighteen sixty here we have data to explain largely the economic development of the south by eighteen twenty two the large plantation slave system had gained footing in eighteen thirty eight eighteen thirty nine it was able to show its power in the cotton corner by the end of the next decade it had not only gained a solid economic foundation but it had built a closed oligarchy with a political policy the changes in price during the next few years drove out of competition many survivors of the small farming free labor system and put the slave regime in position to dictate the policy of the nation the zenith of the system and the first inevitable signs of decay came in the years eighteen fifty to eighteen sixty when the rising price of cotton threw the whole economic energy of the south into its cultivation leading to a terrible consumption of soil and slaves to a great increase in the size of plantations and to increasing power and effrontery on the part of the slave barons finally when a rising moral crusade conjoined with threatened economic disaster the oligarchy encouraged by the state of the cotton market risked all on a political coup d'etat which failed in the war of eighteen sixty one to eighteen sixty five seventy five the attitude of the south the attitude of the south toward the slave trade changed pari passu with this development of the cotton trade from eighteen o eight to eighteen twenty the south half wished to get rid of a troublesome and abnormal institution and yet saw no way to do so the fear of insurrection and of the further spread of the disagreeable system led her to consent to the partial prohibition of the trade by severe national enactments nevertheless she had in the matter no settled policy she refused to support vigorously the execution of the law she had helped to make and at the same time she acknowledged the theoretical necessity of these laws 
after eighteen twenty however there came a gradual change the south found herself supplied with a body of slave laborers whose number had been augmented by large illicit importations with an abundance of rich land and with all other natural facilities for raising a crop which was in large demand and peculiarly adapted to slave labor the increasing crop caused a new demand for slaves and an interstate slave traffic arose between the border and the gulf states which turned the former into slave breeding districts and bound them to the slave states by ties of strong economic interest as the cotton crop continued to increase this source of supply became inadequate especially as the theory of land and slave consumption broke down former ethical and prudential bounds it was for example found cheaper to work a slave to death in a few years and buy a new one than to care for him in sickness and old age so too it was easier to despoil rich new land in a few years of intensive culture and move on to the southwest than to fertilize and conserve the soil consequently there early came a demand for land and slaves greater than the country could supply the demand for land showed itself in the annexation of texas the conquest of mexico and the movement toward the acquisition of cuba the demand for slaves was manifested in the illicit traffic that noticeably increased around eighteen thirty five and reached large proportions by eighteen sixty it was also seen in a disposition to attack the government for stigmatizing the trade as criminal then in a disinclination to take any measures which would have rendered our repressive laws effective and finally in such articulate declarations by prominent men as this experience having settled the point that this trade cannot be abolished by the use of force and that blockading squadrons serve only to make it more profitable and more cruel i am surprised that the attempt is persisted in unless as it serves as a cloak to some other purposes it would be far better than it now is for the african if the trade was free from all restrictions and left to the mitigation and decay which time and competition would surely bring about seventy six the attitude of the north and congress with the north as yet unawakened to the great changes taking place in the south and with the attitude of the south thus in process of development little or no constructive legislation could be expected on the subject of the slave trade as the divergence in sentiment became more and more pronounced there were various attempts at legislation all of which proved abortive the pro-slavery party attempted as early as eighteen twenty six and again in eighteen twenty eight to abolish the african agency and leave the africans practically at the mercy of the states one or two attempts were made to relax the few provisions which restrained the coastwise trade and after the treaty of eighteen forty two benton proposed to stop appropriations for the african squadron until england defined her position on the right of search question the anti-slavery men presented several bills to amend and strengthen previous laws they sought for instance in vain to regulate the texan trade through which numbers of slaves indirectly reached the united states presidents and councils earnestly recommended legislation to restrict the clearances of vessels bound on slave trading voyages and to hinder the facility with which slavers obtained fraudulent papers only one such bill succeeded in passing the senate and that was dropped in the house the only legislation of this period was confined to a few appropriation bills only one of these acts that of eighteen twenty three appropriating fifty thousand dollars was designed materially to aid in the suppression of the trade all the others relating to expenses incurred after violations after eighteen twenty three the appropriations dwindled being made at intervals of one two and three years down to eighteen thirty four when the amount was five thousand dollars no further appropriations were made until eighteen forty two when a few thousands above an unexpended surplus were appropriated in eighteen forty three five thousand dollars were given and finally in eighteen forty six twenty five thousand dollars were secured but this was the last sum obtainable until eighteen fifty six 
nearly all of these meagre appropriations went toward reimbursing southern plantation owners for the care and support of illegally imported africans and the rest to the maintenance of the african agency suspiciously large sums were paid for the first purpose considering the fact that such africans were always worked hard by those to whom they were farmed out and often disappeared while in their hands in the accounts we nevertheless find many items like that of twenty thousand two hundred and eighty six dollars ninety eight cents for the maintenance of negroes imported on the ramirez in eighteen twenty seven five thousand four hundred forty two dollars twenty two cents for the bounty subsistence clothing medicine etc of fifteen africans in eighteen thirty five three thousand six hundred thirteen dollars for the support of thirty-eight slaves for two months including a bill of one thousand thirty eight dollars for medical attendance the african agency suffered many vicissitudes the first agent bacon who set out early in eighteen twenty was authorized by president monroe to form an establishment on the island of sherbro or elsewhere on the coast of africa and to build barracks for three hundred persons he was however warned not to connect your agency with the views or plans of the colonization society with which under the law the government of the united states has no concern bacon soon died and was followed during the next four years by wynne and ayres they succeeded in establishing a government agency on cape miserado in conjunction with that of the colonization society the agent of that society yehudi ashman became after eighteen twenty two the virtual head of the colony he fortified and enlarged it and laid the foundations of an independent community the succeeding government agents came to be merely official representatives of the united states and the distribution of free rations for liberated africans ceased in eighteen twenty seven between eighteen nineteen and eighteen thirty two hundred and fifty two recaptured africans were sent to the agency and two hundred sixty four thousand seven hundred ten dollars were expended the property of the government at the agency was valued at eighteen thousand eight hundred ninety five dollars from eighteen thirty to eighteen forty nearly twenty thousand more were expended chiefly for the agent's salaries about eighteen forty the appointment of an agent ceased and the colony became gradually self-supporting and independent it was proclaimed as the republic of liberia in eighteen forty seven seventy seven imperfect application of the laws in reviewing efforts toward the suppression of the slave trade from eighteen twenty to eighteen fifty it must be remembered that nearly every cabinet had a strong if not a predominating southern element and that consequently the efforts of the executive were powerfully influenced by the changing attitude of the south naturally under such circumstances the government displayed little activity and no enthusiasm in the work in eighteen twenty four a single vessel of the gulf squadron was occasionally sent to the african coast to return by the route usually followed by the slavers no wonder that none of these or any other of our public ships have found vessels engaged in the slave trade under the flag of the united states although it is known that the trade still exists to a most lamentable extent indeed all that an american slaver need do was run up a spanish or a portuguese flag to be absolutely secure from all attack or inquiry on the part of the united states vessels even this desultory method of suppression was not regular in eighteen twenty six no vessel has been dispatched to the coast of africa for several months and from that time until eighteen thirty nine this country probably had no slave trade police upon the seas except in the gulf of mexico in eighteen thirty nine increasing violations led to the sending of two fast sailing vessels to the african coast and these were kept there more or less regularly but even after the signing of the treaty of eighteen forty two the secretary of the navy reports on the coast of africa we have no squadron the small appropriation of the present year was believed to be scarcely sufficient 
between eighteen forty three and eighteen fifty the coast squadron varied from two to six vessels with from three to ninety eight guns but the force habitually and actively engaged in cruising on the ground frequented by slavers has probably been less by one-fourth if we consider the size of the ships employed and their withdrawal for purposes of recreation and health and the movement of the reliefs whose arrival does not correspond exactly with the departure of the vessels whose term of service has expired the reports of the navy show that in only four of the eight years mentioned was the fleet at the time of report at the stipulated size of eighty guns and at times it was much below this even as late as eighteen forty eight when only two vessels are reported on duty along the african coast as the commanders themselves acknowledged the squadron was too small and the cruising ground too large to make joint cruising effective the same story comes from the brazil station nothing effectual can be done toward stopping the slave trade as our squadron is at present organized wrote the council at rio janeiro in eighteen forty seven when it is considered that the brazil station extends from north of the equator to cape horn on this continent and includes a great part of africa south of the equator on both sides of the cape of good hope it must be admitted that one frigate and one brig is a very insufficient force to protect american commerce and repress the participation in the slave trade by our own vessels in the gulf of mexico cruisers were stationed most of the time although even here there were at times urgent representations that the scarcity or the absence of such vessels gave the illicit trade great license owing to this general negligence of the government and also to its anxiety on the subject of the theoretic right of search many officials were kept in a state of chronic deception in regard to the trade the enthusiasm of commanders was dampened by the lack of latitude allowed and by the repeated insistence in their orders on the non-existence of a right of search when one commander realizing that he could not cover the trading track with his fleet requested english commanders to detain suspicious american vessels until one of his vessels came up the government annulled the agreement as soon as it reached their ears rebuked him and the matter was alluded to in congress long after with horror according to the orders of cruisers only slavers with slaves actually on board could be seized consequently fully equipped slavers would sail past the american fleet deliberately make all preparations for shipping a cargo then when the english were not near sell the ship to a spaniard hoist the american flag and again sail gaily past the american fleet with a cargo of slaves an english commander reported the officers of the united states navy are extremely active and zealous in the cause and no fault can be attributed to them but it is greatly to be lamented that this blemish should in so great a degree nullify our endeavors seventy eight responsibility of the government not only did the government thus negatively favor the slave trade but also many conscious positive acts must be attributed to a spirit hostile to the proper enforcement of the slave trade laws in cases of doubt when the law needed executive interpretation the decision was usually in favor of the looser construction of the law the trade from new orleans to mobile was for instance declared not to be coastwise trade and consequently to the joy of cuban smugglers was left utterly free and unrestricted after the conquest of mexico even vessels bound to california by way of cape horn were allowed to clear coastwise thus giving our flag to the slave pirates of the whole world attorney general nelson declared that the selling to a slave trader of an american vessel to be delivered on the coast of africa was not aiding or abetting the slave trade so easy was it for slavers to sail that corruption among officials was hinted at there is certainly a want of proper vigilance at havana wrote commander perry in eighteen forty four and perhaps at the ports of the united states and again in the same year i cannot but think that the custom-house authorities in the united states are not sufficiently rigid in looking after vessels of suspicious character 
in the courts it was still next to impossible to secure the punishment of the most notorious slave trader in eighteen forty seven a council writes the slave power in this city i e rio janeiro is extremely great and a council doing his duty needs to be supported kindly and effectually at home in the case of the fame where the vessel was diverted from the business intended by her owners and employed in the slave trade both of which offences are punishable with death if i rightly read the laws i sent home the two mates charged with these offences for trial the first mate to norfolk the second mate to philadelphia what was done with the first mate i know not in the case of the man sent to philadelphia mr commissioner kane states that a clear prima facie case is made out and then holds him to bail in the sum of one thousand dollars which would be paid by any slave trader in rio on the presentation of a draft in all there is little encouragement for exertion again the perry in eighteen fifty captured a slaver which was about to ship eighteen hundred slaves the captain admitted his guilt and was condemned in the united states district court at new york nevertheless he was admitted to bail of five thousand dollars this being afterward reduced to three thousand dollars he forfeited it and escaped the mate was sentenced to two years in the penitentiary also several slavers sent home to the united states by the british with clear evidence of guilt escaped condemnation through technicalities seventy nine activity of the slave trade eighteen twenty to eighteen fifty the enhanced price of slaves throughout the american slave market brought about by the new industrial development and the laws against the slave trade was the irresistible temptation that drew american capital and enterprise into that traffic in the united states in spite of the large interstate traffic the average price of slaves rose from about three hundred twenty five dollars in eighteen forty to three hundred sixty dollars in eighteen fifty and to five hundred dollars in eighteen sixty brazil and cuba offered similar inducements to smugglers and the american flag was ready to protect such pirates as a result the american slave trade finally came to be carried on principally by united states capital in united states ships officered by united states citizens and under the united states flag executive reports repeatedly acknowledge this fact in eighteen thirty nine a careful revision of these laws is recommended by the president in order that the integrity and honor of our flag may be carefully preserved in june eighteen forty one the president declares there is reason to believe that the traffic is on the increase and advocates vigorous efforts his message in december of the same year acknowledges that the american flag is grossly abused by the abandoned and profligate of other nations is but too probable the special message of eighteen forty five explains at length that it would seem that a regular policy of evading the laws is carried on american vessels with the knowledge of the owners are chartered by notorious slave dealers in brazil aided by english capitalists with this intent the message of eighteen forty nine earnestly invites the attention of congress to an amendment of our existing laws relating to the african slave trade with a view to the effectual suppression of that barbarous traffic it is not to be denied continues the message that this trade is still in part carried on by means of vessels built in the united states and owned or navigated by some of our citizens governor buchanan of liberia reported in eighteen thirty nine the chief obstacle to the success of the very active measures pursued by the british government for the suppression of the slave trade on the coast is the american flag never was the proud banner of freedom so extensively used by those pirates upon liberty and humanity as at this season one well-known american slaver was boarded fifteen times and twice taken into port but always escaped by means of her papers even american officers report that the english are doing all they can but that the american flag protects the trade the evidence which literally poured in from our councils and ministers at brazil adds to the story of the guilt of the united states 
it was proven that the participation of united states citizens in the trade was large and systematic one of the most notorious slave merchants of brazil said i am worried by the americans who insist upon my hiring their vessels for slave trade minister prophet stated in eighteen forty four that the slave trade is almost entirely carried out under our flag in american-built vessels so too in cuba the british commissioners affirm that american citizens were openly engaged in the traffic vessels arrive undisguised at havana from the united states and cleared for africa as slavers after an alleged sale the american consul trist was proven to have consciously or unconsciously aided this trade by the issuance of blank clearance papers the presence of american capital in these enterprises and the contrivance of the authorities were proven in many cases and known in scores in eighteen thirty seven the english government informed the united states that from the papers of a captured slaver it appeared that the notorious slave-trading firm blanco and carballo of havana who owned the vessel had correspondence in the united states at baltimore messrs peter harmony and company in new york robert berry esq the slaver martha of new york captured by the perry contained among her papers curious revelations of the guilt of persons in america who were little suspected the slaver prova which was allowed to lie in the harbor of charleston south carolina and refit was afterwards captured with two hundred and twenty-five slaves on board the real reason that prevented so many belligerent congressmen from pressing certain search claims against england lay in the fact that the unjustifiable detentions had unfortunately revealed so much american guilt that it was deemed wiser to let the matter end in talk for instance in eighteen fifty congress demanded information as to illegal searches and president fillmore's report showed the uncomfortable fact that of the ten american ships wrongly detained by english men of war nine were proven red-handed slavers the council of havana reported in eighteen thirty six that whole cargoes of slaves fresh from africa were being daily shipped to texas in american vessels that one thousand had been sent within a few months that the rate was increasing and that many of these slaves can scarcely fail to find their way into the united states moreover the council acknowledged that ships frequently cleared for the united states in ballast taking on a cargo at some secret point when with these facts we consider the law facilitating recovery of slaves from texas the repeated refusals to regulate the texan trade and the shelving of a proposed congressional investigation into these matters conjecture becomes a practical certainty it was estimated in eighteen thirty eight that fifteen thousand africans were annually taken to texas and there are even grounds for suspicion that there are other places where slaves are introduced between eighteen forty seven and eighteen fifty three the slave smuggler drake had a slave depot in the gulf where sometimes as many as sixteen hundred negroes were on hand and the owners were continually importing and shipping the joint stock company writes this smuggler was a very extensive one and connected with leading american and spanish mercantile houses our island was visited almost weekly by agents from cuba new york baltimore philadelphia boston and new orleans the seasoned and instructed slaves were taken to texas or florida overland and to cuba in sailing boats as no squad contained more than half a dozen no difficulty was found in posting them to the united states without discovery and generally without suspicion the bay island plantation sent ventures weekly to the florida keys slaves were taken into the great american swamps and there kept till wanted for the market hundreds were sold as captured runaways from the florida wilderness we had agents in every slave state and our coasters were built in maine and came out with lumber i could tell curious stories of this business of smuggling bozal negroes into the united states it is growing more profitable every year and if you should hang all the yankee merchants engaged in it hundreds would fill their places 
inherent probability and concurrent testimony confirm the substantial truth of such confessions for instance one traveller discovers on a southern plantation negroes who can speak no english the careful reports of the quakers apprehend that many slaves are also introduced into the united states governor matthew of the bahama islands reports that in more than one instance bahama vessels with colored crews have been purposely wrecked on the coast of florida and the crews forcibly sold this was brought to the notice of the united states authorities but the district attorney of florida could furnish no information such was the state of the slave trade in eighteen fifty on the threshold of the critical decade which by a herculean effort was destined finally to suppress it End of chapter 10. Chapter 11, Part 1 of the Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638 to 1870, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Dot org. Recording by Randall Meredith. The Final Crisis, 1850 to 1870. 80. The Movement Against the Slave Trade Laws. It was not altogether a mistaken judgment that led the Constitutional Fathers to consider the slave trade as the backbone of slavery. An economic system based on slave labor will find, sooner or later, that the demand for the cheapest slave labor cannot long be withstood. Once degrade the laborer so that he cannot assert his own rights, and there is but one limit below which his price cannot be reduced. That limit is not his physical well-being, for it may be, and in the Gulf states it was, cheaper to work him rapidly to death. The limit is simply the cost of procuring him and keeping him alive a profitable length of time. Only the moral sense of a community can keep helpless labor from sinking to this level. And when a community has once been debauched by slavery, its moral sense offers little resistance to economic demand. This was the case in the West Indies and Brazil. And although better moral stamina held the crisis back longer in the United States, Yet even here the ethical standard of the South was not able to maintain itself against the demands of the cotton industry. When, after 1850, the price of slaves had risen to a monopoly height, the leaders of the plantation system, brought to the edge of bankruptcy by the crude and reckless farming necessary under a slave regime, and baffled, at least temporarily, in their quest of new rich land to exploit, began instinctively to feel that the only salvation of American slavery lay in the reopening of the African slave trade. It took but a spark to put this instinctive feeling into words, and words led to deeds. The movement first took definite form in the ever-radical state of South Carolina. In 1854, a grand jury in the Williamsburg district declared, as our unanimous opinion, that the federal law abolishing the African slave trade is a public grievance. We hold this trade has been and would be, if reestablished, a blessing to the American people and a benefit to the African himself. This attracted only local attention, but when, in 1856, the governor of the state, in his annual message, calmly argued at length for a reopening of the trade and boldly declared that, if we cannot supply the demand for slave labor, then we must expect to be supplied with a species of labor we do not want. Such words struck even southern ears like a thunderclap in a calm day. And yet it needed but a few years to show that South Carolina had merely been the first to put into words the inarticulate thought of a large minority, if not a majority, of the inhabitants of the Gulf states. 81. Commercial Conventions of 1855 to 1856. The growth of the movement is best followed in the action of the Southern Commercial Convention, 
an annual gathering which seems to have been fairly representative of a considerable part of Southern opinion. In the convention that met at New Orleans in 1855, McGimsey of Louisiana introduced a resolution instructing the Southern congressmen to secure the repeal of the slave trade laws. This resolution went to the Committee on Resolutions, and it was not reported. In 1856, in the convention at Savannah, W.B. Golden of Georgia moved that the members of Congress be requested to bestir themselves energetically to have repealed all laws which forbade the slave trade. By a vote of 67 to 18, the convention refused to debate the motion, but appointed a committee to present at the next convention the facts relating to a reopening of the trade. In regard to this action, a pamphlet of the day said, There were introduced into the convention two leading measures, viz. the laying of a state tariff on northern goods and the reopening of the slave trade, the one to advance our commercial interest, the other our agricultural interest, and which, when taken together, as they were doubtless intended to be, and although they have each been attacked by presses of doubtful service to the South, are characterized in the private judgment of politicians as one of the completest Southern remedies ever submitted to popular action. The proposition to revive, or more properly to reopen, the slave trade is as yet but imperfectly understood in its intentions and probable results by the people of the South, and but little appreciated by them. It has been received in all parts of the country with an undefined sort of repugnance, a sort of squeamishness, which is incident to all such violations of moral prejudices, and invariably wears off on familiarity with the subject. The South will commence by enduring and end by embracing the project. The matter being now fully before the public through these motions, Governor Adams' message, and the newspaper and pamphlet discussions, the Radical Party pushed the project with all energy. 82. Commercial Conventions of 1857 to 1858 The first piece of regular business that came before the Commercial Convention at Knoxville, Tennessee, August 10, 1857, was a proposal to recommend the abrogation of the Eighth Article of the Treaty of Washington on the slave trade. An amendment offered by Sneed of Tennessee, declaring it inexpedient and against settled policy to reopen the trade, was voted down. Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Virginia refusing to agree to it. The original motion then passed, and the Radicals, satisfied with their success in the first skirmish, again secured the appointment of a committee to report at the next meeting on the subject of reopening the slave trade. This next meeting assembled May 10, 1858, in a Gulf state, Alabama, in the city of Montgomery. Spratt of South Carolina, the slave trade champion, presented an elaborate majority report from the committee and recommended the following resolutions. 1. Resolved that slavery is right and that being right there can be no wrong in the natural means to its formation. 2. Resolved that it is expedient and proper that the foreign slave trade should be reopened and that this convention will lend its influence to any legitimate measure to that end. Number 3. Resolved that a committee consisting of one from each slave state, be appointed to consider of the means, consistent with the duty and obligations of these states, for reopening the foreign slave trade, and that they report their plan to the next meeting of this convention. Yancey, from the same committee, presented a minority report, which though it demanded the repeal of the national prohibitory laws, did not advocate the reopening of the trade by the states. Much debate ensued. Pryor of Virginia declared the majority report a proposition to dissolve the Union. Yancey declared that he was for disunion now. He defended the principle of the slave trade and said, If it is right to buy slaves in Virginia and carry them to New Orleans, why is it not right to buy them in Cuba, 
Brazil, or Africa and carry them here. The opposing speeches made little attempt to meet this uncomfortable logic, but nevertheless, opposition enough was developed to lay the report on the table until the next convention, with orders that it be printed, in the meantime, as a radical campaign document. Finally, the convention passed a resolution that it is inexpedient for any state or its citizens to attempt to reopen the African slave trade while that state is one of the United States of America. 83. Commercial Convention of 1859 The Convention of 1859 met at Vicksburg, Mississippi, May 9th through 19th, and the slave trade party came ready for a fray. On the second day, Spratt called up his resolutions, and the next day the Committee on Resolutions recommended that, in the opinion of this convention, all laws, state or federal, prohibiting the African slave trade ought to be repealed. Two minority reports accompanied this resolution. One proposed to postpone action on account of the futility of the attempt at that time. The other report recommended that, since repeal of the national laws was improbable, nullification by the states impracticable, and action by the Supreme Court unlikely, therefore the state should bring in the Africans as apprentices, a system the legality of which is incontrovertible. The only difficult question, it was said, is the future status of the apprentices after the expiration of their term of servitude debate on these propositions began in the afternoon. A brilliant speech on the resumption of the importation of slaves, says Foote of Mississippi, was listened to with breathless attention and applauded vociferously. Those of us who rose in opposition were looked upon by the excited assemblage present as traitors to the best interests of the South, and only worthy of expulsion from the body. The excitement at last grew so high that personal violence was menaced, and some dozen or more of the conservative members of the convention withdrew from the hall in which it was holding its sittings. It was clear, adds DeBow, that the people of Vicksburg looked upon the convention with some distrust. When at last a ballot was taken, the first resolution passed by a vote of 40 to 19. Finally, the eighth article of the Treaty of Washington was again condemned, and it was also suggested in the newspaper, which was the official organ of the meeting, that the convention raise a fund to be dispensed in premiums for the best sermons in favor of reopening the African slave trade. 84. Public Opinion in the South this record of the commercial conventions probably gives a true reflection of the development of extreme opinion on the question of reopening the slave trade. First, it is noticeable that on this point there was a distinct divergence of opinion and interest between the Gulf and the border states, and it was this more than any moral repugnance that checked the radicals. The whole movement represented the economic revolt of the slave-consuming cotton belt against their base of labor supply. This revolt was only prevented from gaining its ultimate end by the fact that the Gulf states could not get on without the active political cooperation of the border states. Thus, although such hotheads as Spratt were not able, even as late as 1859, to carry a substantial majority of the South with them in an attempt to reopen the trade at all hazards, yet the agitation did succeed in sweeping away nearly all theoretical opposition to the trade, and left the majority of Southern people in an attitude which regarded the reopening of the African slave trade as merely a question of expediency. This growth of Southern opinion is clearly to be followed in the newspapers and pamphlets of the day in Congress, and in many significant movements. The Charleston Standard, in a series of articles, strongly advocated the reopening of the trade. The Richmond Examiner, though opposing the scheme as a Virginia paper should, was brought to acknowledge that the laws which condemn the slave trade imply an aspersion upon the character of the South. In March 1859, the National Era said, 
There can be no doubt that the idea of reviving the African slave trade is gaining ground in the South. Some two months ago, we could quote strong articles from ultra-Southern journals against the traffic. But of late we have been sorry to observe in the same journals an ominous silence upon the subject, while the advocates of free trade in Negroes are earnest and active. The Savannah Republican, which at first declared the movement to be of no serious intent, conceded in 1859 that it was gaining favor and that nine-tenths of the Democratic Congressional Convention favored it, and that even those who did not advocate a revival demanded the abolition of the laws. A correspondent from South Carolina writes, December 18, 1859, the nefarious project of opening the slave trade has been started here in that prurient temper of the times which manifests itself in disunion schemes. My state is strangely and terribly infected with all this sort of thing. One feeling that gives a countenance to the opening of the slave trade is that it will be a sort of spite to the North and defiance of their opinions. The New Orleans Delta declared that those who voted for the slave trade in Congress were men whose names will be honored hereafter for the unflinching manner in which they stood up for principle, for truth, and consistency, as well as the vital interests of the South. 85. The Question in Congress Early in December 1856, the subject reached Congress, and although the agitation was then new, 57 Southern congressmen refused to declare a reopening of the slave trade, shocking to the moral sentiment of the enlightened portion of mankind, and eight refused to call the reopening even unwise and inexpedient. Three years later, January 31, 1859, it was impossible in a House of 199 members to get a two-thirds vote in order even to consider Kilgore's resolutions which declared that no legislation can be too thorough in its measures, nor can any penalty known to the catalog of modern punishment for crime be too severe against a traffic so inhuman and unchristian. Congressmen and other prominent men hastened with the rising tide. Dowdell of Alabama declared the repressive acts highly offensive. J.B. Clay of Kentucky was opposed to all these laws, Seward of Georgia declared them wrong and a violation of the Constitution. Barksdale of Mississippi agreed with this sentiment. Crawford of Georgia threatened a reopening of the trade. Miles of South Carolina was for sweeping away all restrictions. Keat of South Carolina wished to withdraw the African squadron and to cease to brand slave trading as piracy. Brown of Mississippi would repeal the law instantly. Alexander Stevens, in his farewell address to his constituents, said, Slave states cannot be made without Africans. My object is to bring clearly to your mind the great truth that without an increase in African slaves from abroad, you may not expect or look for many more slave states. Jefferson Davis strongly denied any coincidence of opinion with those who prate of the inhumanity and sinfulness of the trade. The interest of Mississippi, said he, not of the African, dictates my conclusion. He opposed the immediate reopening of the trade in Mississippi for fear of a paralyzing influx of Negroes, but carefully added, This conclusion, in relation to Mississippi, is based upon my view of her present condition, not upon any general theory. It is not supposed to be applicable to Texas, to New Mexico, or to any future acquisitions to be made south of the Rio Grande. John Forsyth, who for seven years conducted the slave trade diplomacy of the nation, declared about 1860, but one stronghold of its slavery's enemies remains to be carried, to complete its triumph and assure its welfare. That is the existing prohibition of the African slave trade. Pollard in his Black Diamonds, urged the importation of Africans as laborers. This, I grant you, said he, would be practically the reopening of the African slave trade. 
but you will find that it very often becomes necessary to evade the letter of the law in some of the greatest measures of social happiness and patriotism. 86. Southern Policy in 1860 The matter did not rest with mere words. During the session of the Vicksburg Convention, an African Labor Supply Association was formed, under the presidency of J.D.B. DeBow, editor of DeBow's Review and ex-superintendent of the 7th Census. The object of the association was to promote the supply of African labor. In 1857, the committee of the South Carolina legislature to whom the governor's slave trade message was referred made an elaborate report which declares in italics, the South at large does need a reopening of the African slave trade. Pettigrew, the only member who disagreed to this report, failed of re-election. The report contained an extensive argument to prove the kingship of cotton, the perfidy of English philanthropy, and the lack of slaves in the South, which, it was said, would show a deficit of 600,000 slaves by 1878. In Georgia, about this time, an attempt to expunge the slave trade prohibition in the state constitution lacked but one vote of passing. From these slower and more legal movements came others less justifiable. The long argument on the apprentice system finally brought a request to the collector of the port at Charleston, South Carolina, from E. Lafitte and Company, for a clearance to Africa for the purpose of importing African emigrants. The collector appealed to the Secretary of the Treasury, Howell Cobb of Georgia, who flatly refused to take the bait and replied that if the emigrants were brought in as slaves, it would be contrary to United States law, if as freemen, it would be contrary to their own state law. In Louisiana, a still more radical movement was attempted, and a bill passed the House of Representatives authorizing a company to import 2,500 Africans, indentured for 15 years at least. The bill lacked but two votes of passing the Senate. It was said that the Georgian of Savannah contained a notice of an agricultural society which unanimously resolved to offer a premium of $25 for the best specimen of a live African imported into the United States within the last 12 months. It would not be true to say that there was in the South in 1860 substantial unanimity on the subject of reopening the slave trade. Nevertheless, there certainly was a large and influential minority, including perhaps a majority of citizens of the Gulf states, who favored the project and, in defiance of laws and morals, aided and abetted its actual realization. Various movements, it must be remembered, gained much of their strength from the fact that their success meant a partial nullification of the slave trade laws. The admission of Texas added probably 75,000 recently imported slaves to the southern stock. The movement against Cuba, which culminated in the Austin Manifesto of Buchanan, Mason, and Soule, had its chief impetus in the thousands of slaves whom Americans had poured into the island. Finally, the series of filibustering expeditions against Cuba, Mexico, and Central America were but the wilder and more irresponsible attempts to secure both slave territory and slaves. 87. Increase of the Slave Trade from 1850 to 1860 The long and open agitation for the reopening of the slave trade, together with the fact that the South had been more or less familiar with violations of the laws since 1808, led to such a remarkable increase of illicit traffic and actual importations in the decade 1850 to 1860 that the movement may almost be termed a reopening of the slave trade. In the foreign slave trade, our own officers continue to report how shamefully our flag has been used, and British officers write that at least one half of the successful part of the slave trade is carried on under the American flag, and this because the number of American cruisers on the station is so small in proportion to the immense extent of the slave-dealing coast. The fitting out of slavers became a flourishing business in the United States and centered at New York City. Few of our readers, writes a periodical of the day, 
are aware of the extent to which this infernal traffic is carried on by vessels clearing from New York and in close alliance with our legitimate trade, and that downtown merchants of wealth and respectability are extensively engaged in buying and selling African Negroes, and have been, with comparatively little interruption, for an indefinite number of years. Another periodical says, the number of persons engaged in the slave trade and the amount of capital embarked in it exceed our powers of calculation. The city of New York has been, until of late 1862, the principal port of the world for this infamous commerce, although the cities of Portland and Boston are only second to her in that distinction. Slave dealers added largely to the wealth of our commercial metropolis. They contributed liberally to the treasures of political organizations, and their bank accounts were largely depleted to carry elections in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut. During 18 months of the years 1859 to 1860, 85 slavers are reported to have been fitted out in New York Harbor, and these alone transported from 30,000 to 60,000 slaves annually. The United States Deputy Marshal of that district declared in 1856 that the business of fitting out slavers was never prosecuted with greater energy than at present. The occasional interposition of legal authorities exercises no apparent influence for its suppression. It is seldom that one or more vessels cannot be designated at the wharves, respecting which there is evidence that she is either in or has been concerned in the traffic. On the coast of Africa, it is well known fact that most of the slave ships which visit the river are sent from New York and New Orleans. The absence of United States warships at the Brazilian station enabled American smugglers to run in cargoes, in spite of the prohibitory law. One cargo of 500 slaves was landed in 1852, and the Correo Mercantil regrets that it was the flag of the United States which covered this act of piracy, sustained by citizens of that great nation. When the Brazil trade declined, the illicit Cuban trade greatly increased, and the British consul reported, almost all the slave expeditions for some time past have been fitted out in the United States, chiefly at New York. End of Chapter 11, Part 1「Eleven, Part Two of the Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638 to 1870, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Randall Meredith. 88. Notorious Infractions of the Laws. This decade is especially noteworthy for the great increase of illegal importations into the South. These became bold, frequent, and notorious. Systematic introduction, on a considerable scale, probably commenced in the 40s, although with great secrecy. To have boldly ventured into New Orleans, with Negroes freshly imported from Africa, would not only have brought down upon the head of the importer the vengeance of our very philanthropic Uncle Sam, but also the anathemas of the whole sect of philanthropists and negrophilists everywhere. To import them for years, however, into quiet places, evading with impunity the penalty of the law, and the ranting of the thin-skinned sympathizers with Africa, was gradually to popularize the traffic by creating a demand for laborers, and thus to pave the way for the gradual revival of the slave trade. To this end, a few men, bold and energetic, determined ten or twelve years ago, 1848 or 1850, to commence the business of importing Negroes, slowly at first, but surely. And for this purpose they selected a few secluded places on the coast of Florida, Georgia, and Texas for the purpose of concealing their stock until it could be sold out. Without specifying other places, let me draw your attention to a deep and abrupt pocket or indentation in the coast of Texas, about 30 miles from Brazos, Santiago. Into this pocket a slaver could run at any hour of the night, 
because there was no hindrance at the entrance, and here she could discharge her cargo of movables upon the projecting bluff, and again proceed to sea inside of three hours. The livestock thus landed could be marched a short distance across the main island, over a porous soil which refuses to retain the recent footprints, until they were again placed in boats, and were concealed upon some of the innumerable little islands which thicken on the waters of the laguna in the rear. These islands, being covered with a thick growth of bushes and grass, offer an inscrutable hiding place for the black diamonds. These methods became, however, toward 1860, too slow for the radicals, and the trade grew more defiant and open. The yacht Wanderer, arrested on suspicion in New York and released, landed in Georgia six months later 420 slaves, who were never recovered. The Augusta Despatch says, Citizens of our city are probably interested in the enterprise. It is hinted that this is the third cargo landed by the same company during the last six months. Two parties of Africans were brought into Mobile with impunity. One bark, strongly suspected of having landed a cargo of slaves, was seized on the Florida coast. Another vessel was reported to be landing slaves near Mobile. A letter from Jacksonville, Florida, stated that a bark had left there for Africa to ship a cargo for Florida and Georgia. Stephen A. Douglas said that there was not the shadow of doubt that the slave trade had been carried on quite extensively for a long time back, and that there had been more slaves imported into the southern states during the last year than had ever been imported before in any one year, even when the slave trade was legal. It was his confident belief that over 15,000 slaves had been brought into this country during the past year, 1859. He had seen with his own eyes 300 of those recently imported miserable beings in a slave pen in Vicksburg, Mississippi, and also large numbers at Memphis, Tennessee. It was currently reported that depots for these slaves existed in over 20 large cities and towns in the South, and an interested person boasted to a senator about 1860 that 12 vessels would discharge their living freight upon our shores within 90 days from the 1st of June last, and that between 60 and 70 cargoes had been successfully introduced in the last 18 months. The New York Tribune doubted the statement, but John C. Underwood, formerly of Virginia, wrote to the paper saying that he was satisfied that the correspondent was correct. I have, he said, had ample evidences of the fact that reopening the African slave trade is a thing already accomplished, and the traffic is brisk and rapidly increasing. In fact, the most vital question of the day is not the opening of this trade, but its suppression. The arrival of cargoes of Negroes, fresh from Africa, in our southern ports, is an event of frequent occurrence. Negroes, newly landed, were openly advertised for sale in the public press, and bids for additional importations made. In reply to one of these, the mobile Mercury facetiously remarks, some Negroes who never learned to talk English went up the railroad the other day. Congressman declared on the floor of the House, the slave trade may therefore be regarded as practically reestablished, and petitions like that from the American Missionary Society recited the fact that this piratical and illegal trade, this inhuman invasion of the rights of men, this outrage on civilization and Christianity, this violation of the laws of God and man, is openly countenanced and encouraged by a portion of the citizens of some of the states of this Union. From such evidence, it seems clear that the slave trade laws, in spite of the efforts of the government, in spite even of much opposition to these extra-legal methods in the South itself, were grossly violated, if not nearly nullified, in the latter part of the decade 1850 to 1860. 89. Apathy of the Federal Government During the decade, there was some attempt at reactionary legislation, chiefly directed at the Treaty of Washington. June 13, 1854, Slidell, from the Committee on Foreign Relations, made an elaborate report to the Senate, advocating the abrogation of the Eighth Article of that treaty on the ground that it was costly, fatal to the health of the sailors, and useless, as the trade had actually increased under its operation. Both this and a similar attempt in the House failed, 
as did also an attempt to substitute life imprisonment for the death penalty. Most of the actual legislation naturally took the form of appropriations. In 1853, there was an attempt to appropriate $20,000. This failed, and the appropriation of $8,000 in 1856 was the first for 10 years. The following year brought a similar appropriation, and in 1859 and 1860, $75,000 and $40,000 respectively were appropriated. Of attempted legislation to strengthen the laws, there was plenty. Propositions to regulate the issue of sea letters and the use of our flag, to prevent the coolie trade or the bringing in of apprentices or African laborers, to stop the coastwise trade, to assent to a right of search, and to amend the Constitution by forever prohibiting the slave trade. The efforts of the executive during this period were criminally lax and negligent. The general government did not exert itself in good faith to carry out either its treaty stipulations or the legislation of Congress in regard to the matter. If a vessel was captured, her owners were permitted to bond her, and thus continue her in the trade. And if any man was convicted of this form of piracy, the executive always interposed between him and the penalty of his crime. The laws providing for the seizure of vessels engaged in the traffic were so constructed as to render the duty unremunerative, and marshals now find their fees for such services to be actually less than their necessary expenses. No one who bears this fact in mind will be surprised at the great indifference of these officers to the continuing of the slave trade. In fact, he will be ready to learn that the laws of Congress upon the subject had become a dead letter and that the suspicion was well grounded that certain officers of the federal government had actually connived at their violation. From 1845 to 1854, in spite of the well-known activity of the trade, but five cases obtained cognizance of the New York district. Of these, Captains Mansfield and Driscoll forfeited their bonds of $5,000 each, and escaped, in the case of the notorious Cano, Nothing had been done as late as 1856, although he was arrested in 1847. Captain Jefferson turned state's evidence, and in the case of Captain Matthew, a null prosequi was entered. Between 1854 and 1856, 32 persons were indicted in New York, of whom only 13 had at the latter date been tried, and only one of these convicted. These dismissals were seldom on account of insufficient evidence. In the notorious case of the Wanderer, she was arrested on suspicion, released, and soon after she landed a cargo of slaves in Georgia. Some who attempted to seize the Negroes were arrested for larceny, and in spite of the efforts of Congress, the captain was never punished. The yacht was afterwards started on another voyage, and being brought back to Boston was sold to her former owner for about one-third her value. The bark Emily was seized on suspicion and released, and finally caught red-handed on the coast of Africa. She was sent to New York for trial, but disappeared under a certain slave captain, Townsend, who had, previous to this, in the face of the most convincing evidence, been acquitted at Key West. The squadron commanders of this time were by no means as efficient as their predecessors, and spent much of their time, apparently, in discussing the right of search. Instead of a number of small, light vessels, which by the reports of experts were repeatedly shown to be the only efficient craft, the government, until 1859, persisted in sending out three or four great frigates. Even these did not attend faithfully to their duties. A letter from on board one of them shows that, out of a 15 months alleged service, only 22 days were spent on the usual cruising ground for slavers and 13 of these at anchor. 11 months were spent at Madeira and Cape Verde Islands, 300 miles from the coast and 3,000 miles from the slave market. British commanders report the apathy of American officers and the extreme caution of their instructions, which allowed many slavers to escape. The officials at Washington often remained in blissful and perhaps willing ignorance of the state of the trade. While Americans were smuggling slaves by the thousands into Brazil, and by the hundreds into the United States, Secretary Graham was recommending the abrogation of the Eighth Article of the Treaty of Washington. 
So too, when the Cuban slave trade was reaching unprecedented activity, and while slavers were being fitted out in every port on the Atlantic seaboard, Secretary Kennedy naively reports, The time has come, perhaps, when it may be properly commended to the notice of Congress to inquire into the necessity of further continuing the regular employment of a squadron on the African coast. Again, in 1855, the government has advices that the slave trade south of the equator is entirely broken up. In 1856, the reports are favorable. In 1857, a British commander writes, No vessel has been here for one year, certainly. I think for nearly three years there have been no American cruisers on these waters, where a valuable and extensive American commerce is carried on. I cannot, therefore, but think that this continued absence of foreign cruisers looks as if they were intentionally withdrawn, and as if the government did not care to take measures to prevent the American flag being used to cover slave trade transactions. Nevertheless, in the same year, according to Secretary Tusi, the force on the coast of Africa has fully accomplished its main object. Finally, in the same month in which the Wanderer and her mates were openly landing cargoes in the south, President Buchanan, who seems to have been utterly devoid of a sense of humor, was urging the annexation of Cuba to the United States as the only method of suppressing the slave trade. About 1859, the frequent and notorious violations of our laws aroused even the Buchanan government. A larger appropriation was obtained, swift light steamers were employed, and though we may well doubt whether, after such a carnival, illegal importations entirely ceased, as the President informed Congress, yet some sincere efforts at suppression were certainly begun. From 1850 to 1859, we have few notices of captured slavers, but in 1860 the increased appropriation of the 35th Congress resulted in the capture of 12 vessels with 3,119 Africans. The Act of June 16, 1860, enabled the President to contract with the Colonization Society for the return of recaptured Africans, and by a long-needed arrangement, cruisers were to proceed direct to Africa with such cargoes, instead of first landing them in this country. 90. Attitude of the Southern Confederacy The attempt, initiated by the Constitutional Fathers, to separate the problem of slavery from that of the slave trade had, after a trial of half a century, signally failed and for well-defined economic reasons. The nation had at least come to the parting of the ways, one of which led to a free labor system, the other to a slave system fed by the slave trade. Both sections of the country naturally hesitated at the crossroads. The North clung to the delusion that a territorially limited system of slavery without a slave trade was still possible in the South. The South hesitated to fight for her logical object, slavery and free trade in Negroes, and, in her moral and economic dilemma, sought to make autonomy and the Constitution her object. The real line of contention was, however, fixed by years of development, and was unalterable by the present whims or wishes of the contestants, no matter how important or interesting these might be. The triumph of the North meant free labor. The triumph of the South meant slavery and the slave trade. It is doubtful if many of the Southern leaders ever deceived themselves by thinking that Southern slavery, as it then was, could long be maintained without a general or a partial reopening of the slave trade. Many had openly declared this a few years before, and there was no reason for a change of opinion. Nevertheless, at the outbreak of actual war and secession, there were powerful and decisive reasons for relegating the question temporarily to the rear. In the first place, only by this means could the adherence of important border states be secured, without the aid of which secession was folly. Secondly, while it did no harm to laud the independence of the South and the kingship of Cotton in stump speeches and conventions, yet when it came to actual hostilities, the South sorely needed the aid of Europe, and this a nation fighting for slavery in the slave trade stood poor chance of getting. Consequently, after attacking the slave trade laws for a decade, and their execution for a quarter century, we find the Southern leaders inserting, in both provisional and the permanent constitutions of the Confederate States, the following article. 
The importation of Negroes of the African race from any foreign country other than the slaveholding states or territories of the United States of America is hereby forbidden, and Congress is required to pass such laws as shall effectually prevent the same. Congress shall also have power to prohibit the introduction of slaves from any state not a member of or territory not belonging to this Confederacy. The attitude of the Confederate government toward this article is best illustrated by its circular of instructions to its foreign ministers. It has been suggested to this government from a source of unquestioned authenticity that, after the recognition of our independence by the European powers, an expectation is generally entertained by them that in our treaties of amity and commerce, a clause will be introduced making stipulations against the African slave trade. It is even thought that the neutral powers may be inclined to insist upon the insertion of such a clause as a sine qua non. You are well aware of how firmly fixed in our Constitution is the policy of this Confederacy against the opening of that trade. But we are informed that false and insidious suggestions have been made by the agents of the United States at European courts of our intention to change our Constitution as soon as peace is restored and of authorizing the importation of slaves from Africa. If, therefore, you should find, in your intercourse with the cabinet to which you are accredited, that any such impressions are entertained, you will use every proper effort to remove them, and if an attempt is made to introduce into any treaty which you may be charged with negotiating stipulations on the subject just mentioned, you will assume, in behalf of your government, the position which, under the direction of the President, I now proceed to develop. The Constitution of the Confederate States is an agreement made between independent states. By its terms, all the powers of government are separated into classes as follows, viz. First, such powers as the states delegate to the general government. Second, such powers as the states agree to refrain from exercising, although they do not delegate them to the general government. Third, such powers as the states, without delegating them to the general government, thought proper to exercise by direct agreement between themselves contained in the Constitution. Fourth, all remaining powers of sovereignty, which not being delegated to the Confederate states by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people thereof especially in relation to the importation of African Negroes, was it deemed important by the states that no power to permit it should exist in the Confederate government. It will thus be seen that no power is delegated to the Confederate government over this subject, but that it is included in the third class above referred to of powers exercised directly by the states. This government unequivocally and absolutely denies its possession of any power whatever over the subject and cannot entertain any proposition in relation to it. The policy of the Confederacy is as fixed and immutable on this subject as the imperfection of human nature permits human resolve to be. No additional agreements, treaties, or stipulations can commit these states to the prohibition of this African slave trade with more binding efficacy than those they have themselves devised. A just and generous confidence in their good faith on this subject exhibited by friendly powers will be far more efficacious than persistent efforts to induce this government to assume the exercise of powers which it does not possess. We trust, therefore, that no unnecessary discussions on this matter will be introduced into your negotiations. If, unfortunately, this reliance should prove ill-founded, you will decline continuing negotiations on your side and transfer them to us at home. This attitude of the conservative leaders of the South, if it meant anything, meant that individual state action could, when it pleased, reopen the slave trade. The radicals were, of course, not satisfied with any veiling of the ulterior purpose of the new slave republic, and attacked the constitutional provision violently. If, said one, the clause be carried into the permanent government, our whole movement is defeated. It will abolitionize the border slave states. It will brand our institutions. Slavery cannot share a government with democracy. It cannot bear a brand upon it, thence another revolution. Having achieved one revolution to escape democracy at the north, it must still achieve another to escape it at the south. That it will ultimately triumph, none can doubt. 91. 
attitude of the United States. In the North, with all the hesitation in many matters, there existed unanimity in regard to the slave trade, and the new Lincoln government ushered in the new policy of uncompromising suppression by hanging the first American slave trader who ever suffered the extreme penalty of the law. One of the earliest acts of President Lincoln was a step which had been necessary since 1808, but had never been taken, viz. the unification of the whole work of suppression into the hands of one responsible department. By an order dated May 2, 1861, Caleb B. Smith, Secretary of the Interior, was charged with the execution of the slave trade laws, and he immediately began energetic work. Early in 1861, as soon as the withdrawal of the Southern members untied the hands of Congress, two appropriations of $900,000 each were made to suppress the slave trade. The first appropriations commensurate with the vastness of the task. These were followed by four appropriations of $17,000 each in the years 1863 to 1867, and two of $12,500 each in 1868 and 1869. The first work of the new secretary was to obtain a corps of efficient assistance. To this end, he assembled all the marshals of the loyal seaboard states at New York and gave them instruction and opportunity to inspect actual slavers. Congress also, for the first time, offered them proper compensation. The next six months showed the effect of this policy in the fact that five vessels were seized and condemned, and four slave traders were convicted and suffered the penalty of their crimes. This is probably the largest number of convictions ever obtained, and certainly the only ones for many years. Meantime, the government opened negotiations with Great Britain, and the Treaty of 1862 was signed June 7th and carried out by Act of Congress July 11th. Specially commissioned war vessels of either government were by this agreement authorized to search merchant vessels on the high seas and specified coasts, and if they were found to be slavers, or, on account of their construction or equipment, were suspected to be such, they were to be sent for condemnation to one of the mixed courts established at New York, Sierra Leone, and the Cape of Good Hope. These courts, consisting of one judge and one arbitrator on the part of each government, were to judge the facts without appeal, and upon condemnation by them, the culprits were to be punished according to the laws of their respective countries. The area in which this right of search could be exercised was somewhat enlarged by an additional article to the treaty, signed in 1863. In 1870, the mixed courts were abolished, but the main part of the treaty was left in force. The Act of July 17, 1862, enabled the President to contract with foreign governments of the apprenticing of recaptured Africans in the West Indies, and in 1864, the coastwise slave trade was forever prohibited. By these measures, the trade was soon checked, and before the end of the war, entirely suppressed. The vigilance of the government, however, was not checked, and as late as 1866, a squadron of ten ships with 113 guns patrolled the slave coast. Finally, the 13th Amendment legally confirmed what the war had already accomplished, and slavery and the slave trade fell at one blow. End of Chapter 11, Part 2 Chapter 12 of The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638 to 1870, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Randall Meredith. The Essentials in the Struggle. 92. How the Question Arose. We have followed a chapter of history which is of peculiar interest to the sociologist. Here was a rich new land, the wealth of which was to be had in return for ordinary manual labor. Had the country been conceived of as existing primarily for the benefit of its actual inhabitants, it might have waited for natural increase or immigration to supply the needed hands. But both Europe and the earlier colonists themselves regarded this land as existing chiefly for the benefit of Europe, and as designed to be exploited as rapidly and ruthlessly as possible, 
of the boundless wealth of its resources. This was the primary excuse for the rise of the African slave trade to America. Every experiment of such a kind, however, where the moral standard of a people is lowered for the sake of a material advantage, is dangerous in just such proportion as that advantage is great. In this case it was great. For at least a century, in the West Indies and the southern United States, agriculture flourished, trade increased, and English manufacturers were nourished in just such proportion as Americans stole Negroes and worked them to death. This advantage, to be sure, became much smaller in later times, and at one critical period was, at least in the southern states, almost nil. But energetic efforts were wanting, and, before the nation was aware, slavery had seized a new and well-nigh immovable footing in the Cotton Kingdom. The colonists averred with perfect truth that they did not commence this fatal traffic, but that it was imposed upon them from without. Nevertheless, all too soon did they lay aside scruples against it and hasten to share its material benefits. Even those who braved the rough Atlantic, for the highest moral motives, fell early victims to the allurements of this system. Thus, throughout colonial history, in spite of many honest attempts to stop the further pursuit of the slave trade, we notice back of nearly all such attempts a certain moral apathy, an indisposition to attack the evil with the sharp weapons which its nature demanded. Consequently, there developed steadily, irresistibly, a vast social problem, which required two centuries and a half for a nation of trained European stock and boasted moral fiber to solve. 93. The Moral Movement For the solution of this problem there were, roughly speaking, three classes of efforts made during this time. Moral, political, and economic. That is to say, efforts which sought directly to raise the moral standard of the nation, efforts which sought to stop the trade by legal enactment, efforts which sought to neutralize the economic advantages of the slave trade. There is always a certain glamour about the idea of a nation rising up to crush an evil simply because it is wrong. Unfortunately, this can seldom be realized in real life, for the very existence of the evil usually argues a moral weakness in the very place where extraordinary moral strength is called for. This was the case in the early history of the colonies, and experience proved that an appeal to moral rectitude was unheard in Carolina when rice had become a great crop, and in Massachusetts when the rum slave traffic was paying a profit of 100%, that the various abolition societies and anti-slavery movements did heroic work in rousing the national conscience is certainly true. Unfortunately, however, these movements were weakest at the most critical times. When, in 1774 and 1804, the material advantages of the slave trade and the institution of slavery were least, it seemed possible that moral suasion might accomplish the abolition of both. A fatal spirit of temporizing, however, seized the nation at these points. And although the slave trade was, largely for political reasons, forbidden, slavery was left untouched. Beyond this point, as years rolled by, it was found well-nigh impossible to rouse the moral sense of the nation. Even in the matter of enforcing its own laws and cooperating with the civilized world, a lethargy seized the country, and it did not awake until slavery was about to destroy it. Even then, after a long and earnest crusade, the national sense of right did not rise to the entire abolition of slavery. It was only a peculiar and almost fortuitous commingling of moral, political, and economic motives that eventually crushed African slavery and its hand made the slave trade in America. 94. The Political Movement The political efforts to limit the slave trade were the outcome partly of moral reprobation of the trade, partly of motives of expediency. This legislation was never such as wise and powerful rulers may make for a nation, with the ulterior purpose of calling in the respect which the nation has for law to aid in raising its standard of right. 
The colonial and national laws on the slave trade merely registered, from time to time, the average public opinion concerning this traffic, and are therefore to be regarded as negative signs rather than as positive efforts. These signs were, from one point of view, evidences of moral awakening. They indicated slow, steady development of the idea that to steal even Negroes was wrong. From another point of view, these laws showed the fear of servile insurrection and the desire to ward off danger from the state. Again, they often indicated a desire to appear well before the civilized world and to rid the land of the free of the paradox of slavery. Representing such motives, the laws varied all the way from mere regulating acts to absolute prohibitions. On the whole, these acts were poorly conceived, loosely drawn, and wretchedly enforced. The systematic violation of the provisions of many of them led to a widespread belief that enforcement was, in the nature of the case, impossible, and thus, instead of marking ground already won, they were too often sources of distinct moral deterioration. Certainly the carnival of lawlessness that succeeded the Act of 1807, and that which preceded final suppression in 1861, were glaring examples of the failure of the efforts to suppress the slave trade by mere law. 95. The Economic Movement Economic measures against the trade were those which, from the beginning, had the best chance of success, but which were least tried. They included tariff measures, efforts to encourage the immigration of free laborers and the emigration of the slaves, measures for changing the character of southern industry, and finally, plans to restore the economic balance which slavery destroyed by raising the condition of the slave to that of complete freedom and responsibility. Like the political efforts, these rested in part on a moral basis, and as legal enactments, they were also themselves often political measures. They differed, however, from purely moral and political efforts in having as a main motive the economic gain which a substitution of free for slave labor promised. The simplest form of such efforts was the revenue duty on slaves that existed in all the colonies. This developed into the prohibitive tariff and into measures encouraging immigration or industrial improvements. The colonization movement was another form of these efforts. It was inadequately conceived and not altogether sincere, but it had a sound, although in this case impracticable, economic basis. The one great measure which finally stopped the slave trade forever was, naturally, the abolition of slavery, i.e., the giving to the Negro the right to sell his labor at a price consistent with his own welfare. The abolition of slavery itself, while due in part to direct moral appeal and political sagacity, was largely the result of the economic collapse of the large farming slave system. 96. The Lesson for Americans It may be doubted if ever before such political mistakes as the slavery compromises of the Constitutional Convention had such serious results, and yet, by a succession of unexpected accidents, still left a nation in position to work out its destiny. No American can study the connection of slavery with United States history and not devoutly pray that his country may never have a similar social problem to solve, until it shows more capacity for such work than it has shown in the past. It is neither profitable nor in accordance with scientific truth to consider that whatever the Constitutional Fathers did was right, or that slavery was a plague sent from God and fated to be eliminated in due time. We must face the fact that this problem arose principally from the cupidity and carelessness of our ancestors. It was the plain duty of the colonies to crush the trade and the system in its infancy. They preferred to enrich themselves on its profits. It was the plain duty of a revolution based upon liberty to take steps toward the abolition of slavery. It preferred promises to straightforward action. It was the plain duty of the Constitutional Convention, in founding a new nation, to compromise with the threatening social evil only in case its settlement would thereby be postponed to a more favorable time. This was not the case in the slavery and the slave trade compromises. 
There never was a time in the history of America when the system had a slighter economic, political, and moral justification than in 1787. And yet with this real, existent, growing evil before their eyes, a bargain largely of dollars and cents was allowed to open the highway that led straight to the Civil War. Moreover, it was due to no wisdom and foresight on the part of the fathers that fortuitous circumstances made the result of that war what it was, nor was it due to exceptional philanthropy on the part of their descendants that that result included the abolition of slavery. With the faith of the nation broken at the very outset, the system of slavery untouched, and twenty years' respite given to the slave trade to feed and foster it, there began, with 1787, that system of bargaining, truckling, and compromising with a moral, political, and economic monstrosity, which makes the history of our dealing with slavery in the first half of the 19th century so discreditable to a great people. Each generation sought to shift its load upon the next, and the burden rolled on, until a generation came which was both too weak and too strong to bear it longer. One cannot, to be sure, demand of whole nations exceptional moral foresight and heroism, but a certain hard common sense in facing the complicated phenomena of political life must be expected in every progressive people. In some respects we as a nation seem to lack this. We have the somewhat inquit idea that we are not destined to be harassed with great social questions, and that even if we are, and fail to answer them, the fault is with the question and not with us. Consequently, we often congratulate ourselves more on getting rid of a problem than on solving it. Such an attitude is dangerous. We have and shall have, as other peoples have had, critical, momentous, and pressing questions to answer. The riddle of the Sphinx may be postponed. It may be evasively answered now. Sometime it must be fully answered. It behooves the United States, therefore, in the interest both of scientific truth and of future social reform, carefully to study such chapters of her history as that of the suppression of the slave trade. The most obvious question which this study suggests is, how far in a state can a recognized moral wrong safely be compromised? And although this chapter of history can give us no definite